but what I'm kind of curious about is you don't, the way that you talk, so I'm a little bit confused because on the one hand, you seem quite open-minded. So even it, not debating, but you know, at the very beginning, you're like, therapy doesn't work for anyone. And then like later on, you're able to see, okay, I can understand how it could be useful for some people, but I still think prayer is more effective, which is completely fair, right? But that, there's, you're not actually very rigid with your thinking. Either a lot of declarative statements, a lot of, I would say, inflammatory statements, a lot of like lack of like uh, empathy. Yes. Which I think upsets a lot of people, right? Because you don't really, you're, what you believe is like universally true is what I am really getting a lot of from you. Mm -hmm. So what I'm kind of mm -hmm. curious about is uh, you seem open-minded, but do you like listen to other people? I do quite a bit. I think yeah. I've listened to people more than most. No, I mean, I had an interview series in New York called The Woman to Podcast where I just would uh, set up a table in the subway station and talk to people and just look at them and listen. So, so what I'm curious about is when someone shares something that is contrary to your worldview, what does your mind do with it? Probably um, immediately fight against it. Okay. Or, or no, not not even just that, but also no. I I allow myself to to see if it's true. I, I think about it. Yeah. So that that's also what's kind of confusing for me is like I, I I think I can see you thinking about it, and and part of the reason that I was uh, interested in speaking with you is because I've I've seen a little bit of your stuff and you actually seem to think about stuff. Like I don't get the sense that I mean I think you're quite inflammatory, but I don't think you're you're quite as rigid. Is, is, is you don't seem very rigid to me. You actually think about stuff. But what I would really encourage you to do when someone says something that you think about, don't just critically analyze it. Try your hardest to understand how that could be true for this person. That's a, another idea that I just disagree with philosophically. I don't think that there's your truth or my truth as much as people like to give it. I think that there is one universal truth and that's what i that's what i've always been trying to get to is what is the truth because everybody yeah. has this belief that there is my truth my truth and i, I think that's where people I, lead astray I, I don't think that i'm not talking about my truth or your truth i know it sounds weird because that's what i'm sort of asking you to do but i i'd actually say that i know it's kind of bizarre but to get to the one truth i think this is a really good way to do it so it's not your their truth or your truth it, you don't know that your truth is closer to the truth than their truth so if you really want to understand what the truth is you have to try to approach it from all the different angles. So obviously, you guys know I have a history with Sneeko. I don't like how he treats women. And I don't think he's treating himself very kindly. But still, I'm rooting for my boy. Because he reminds me a lot of a lot. Uh, uh, he reminds me of a lot of men or boys I know in their 20s who are struggling and looking for answers. And I think they're looking for answers in the wrong places. But that's also a part of being open minded and being curious is that you look for answers even in the wrong places hoping along the way you come to somebody with the right answers. And I think Dr. K is an amazing person to possibly influence Sneeko. And so I'm very excited to watch Dr. K and Sneeko talk. I think Dr. K's work is great. I'm a big fan. I think a big part of being open-minded is being curious. Now the fear is that you don't want to open your mind so much your brain falls out. But you know, it happens from time to time. Yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. This is a uh, re-uploaded video on some random channel. It's called Influencers Buzz Drama. So I'll link it in the chat. Okay, that's fine. That's good, that's good, sounds good. Um, how are you? Good, dude, how are you? I'm like, uh... Dr. K's a little low on this one. I will say. Um, are, we, are we streaming? Yeah, I'm live right now on Rumble. Oh, okay, cool. Um, cool. Are you streaming? Nope. Okay. I think you're banned on all the platforms that I stream on. Yeah, that, that, that does happen. That does happen. So you're a, you're a therapist? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm a psychiatrist. You're a psychiatrist. Okay. Um, I don't believe in therapy, and I think it's a scam, and I don't think it's necessary, and I don't think that even if there is anything wrong with my brain that this is going to be helpful whatsoever, um, I believe that men should just get over it and push forward. I think a better use of your time instead of talking about your feelings is working hard and building something. It, that's a better use of your time than anything that, even if this was productive, my time would have been better spent making some money and getting stronger and getting better. But I okay. want to be convinced that it's useful because a lot of people are talking about therapy and people have uh, accused me of being mentally ill quite a bit. They've called me mentally ill since I was, in, uh, since I was a child. Uh, I get that a lot from the internet saying Sneeko needs to go to therapy. It's because Sneeko has like uh, ADHD and stuff. I can't tell. This window is so small. I can't tell what's a better place to put it. Maybe there. I don't know. Therapy. So maybe you can change that perception. Okay. So let me just make a couple things clear. So I am a psychiatrist, but I'm not your psychiatrist. 
Okay. Is that clear? So I'm not That's doing clear. therapy with you, right? right? You're not my patient. Okay. I'm not going to be diagnosing you or treating you for anything. Okay. We're having a conversation, and if you, okay. I didn't know what you, we were talking about, but oh, if we can, you talk, we can talk, talk about, about anything. I'm just, I'm just like prefacing with that. Yeah, that's totally fine. So, so, and I love how Sneeko comes out of the door really fast, and he like comes in very quickly, right? And it's very interesting because I think he does that like an edgy teenager. He's an. That's why I'm saying, guys, he's an edgy teenager to me. Only edgy teenagers start off conversations with grownups with like the most sensational part of their ideas, right? It's hard for me to treat Sneeko like a complete adult because he's obviously trying to get a like a route like he's trying to a, like he's trying to get a root. What is it? A rouse? A ruse? He's trying to get you upset, right? He's trying to trigger you basically. So one of the reasons why I'm very open to Sneeko just being like a young person on a journey is because like grown adults don't act like this. Sorry. Like, have you ever seen Dr. K do this? Like people don't adults don't. I've never even done this. Lav does it, right? Sneeko does it. And that's why they're children. That's why they're literally children. Did you watch the panel I just did with Lav? She's like Sneeko. They're like children. They just say sensational stuff to get attention because they need validation and they're attention starved. So they need the right kind of validation to make them realize like you need humility in your life. This like adolescent, this adolescent begging for attention, it's inappropriate. I mean, is that what you want to talk about? No, I want to talk, no, about, whatever, whatever. I want to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Can I cry? Sure. Okay. Well, I don't know how this works. What are we like? What are we supposed to do? Uh, that's a great question. So, well, I mean, so was there something something in particular that you were thinking about when we last connected? So I don't know if we reached out to you or you, you reached out to us or what exactly happened. But what was there something in particular that you had in mind? Um, OK, well, what do you specialize in? I've seen you talk to some of my friends. You talked to Aiden for a couple hours and you were able to dissect and figure some stuff out. And I, I don't know. I think this could be an interesting conversation. I, I don't really, I don't I really know. I, I completely really know. agree. I think this is going to be a very interesting conversation. OK. I think it's. I they are also adults. I want to say in my bubble, being grown does not mean you're grown. Right? Like my parents are grown ups. They are legit grown ups. I am not a grown up the way my parents are grown ups. My parents are adults. My parents are grown people, right? Like my grandparents, God bless their souls, were grown parents, like grown people, right? So when I say someone's an adult, right? Like, Yes, they're an illegal adult by the U.S. government, but that doesn't mean you're grown. And even if you're 60, it doesn't mean you're grown, right? You have to, in my mind, achieve a certain amount of respectability and something to be grown. So I don't know about your bubbles, but I need you to know that's how I'm judging Sneeko, right? Like the same way that I would be suspicious of a 50-year-old who wants to fuck an 18-year-old because even though she's an adult or he's an adult, that's still pretty sussy, right? Because even though they're adults they're not grown right so again what is grown you know i i would uh so let me tell you so you asked how does this work so i think there are a couple things to consider okay um we already talked about you know it's not my place to do a diagnostic assessment of you and say that you are or aren't mentally ill <sighs> that being said um sometimes i talk to people and people will have questions about particular things Sometimes those are related to mental health. And I'm happy to answer questions about particular things or try to help people understand parts of themselves, which a lot of times people think is the same as therapy. That's not the same as therapy. It's something that understanding yourself is a part of therapy, but not all paths of self-understanding are therapy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I really enjoyed hearing your take on how therapy is not real and how people should just tough well, it out. It, it, and it's like real, that. but it's, it's a giant waste of time. Like, I, I yeah, don't so think I, there's some people that have trauma. In, that? In P, some people have trauma in PTSD. I think like veterans or stuff like that. Or if you have the really like death and I can see how it can be effective. But I think most people that go to therapy uh, just like to hear themselves yap in real time. I think that they like their own problems. They like feeling like a main character. And it's just. Sneeko is like the epitome of wanting to feel like a main character. I think people are in competition with being the main characters. I think growing up, there was this um, narrative in my bubble that you were better and cooler if you didn't want attention 
But by being that person, you became a person who sought attention. Does that make sense? So the irony was, oh my God, all these people playing victim, they just want attention. But as you are saying that, you are now playing the victim, saying like, oh, they got all the attention, but I want attention without saying I want attention. Sneeko is an attention-seeking child, right? It's, it's like, but the irony of this is that it's like a lack of self-awareness or it's a grift because that's the problem. That's why I don't know if that lady we reviewed earlier is grifting. I don't like Sneeko, I think is playing a role. I don't think this is authentically Sneeko. I don't think anything he's saying is real. I think there's a real version of him, the core version of him, the version his parents raised, the version of him he's been his whole life, the version of him I've seen slightly behind closed doors that I think, and sometimes you see it on the internet as well, I think there's a real version of him that exists, but he is being this person right now because this is his messiness. Look, I was really messy in my 20s. I was so messy in my 20s. And I'm not going to pretend that I was quote unquote better than Sneeko, even though I technically like obviously didn't get banned off of YouTube. Like I had much more self-awareness, obviously. But I know a lot of boys who are in similar positions as him. And a lot of them are just like throwing shit at the wall and trying to figure out what sticks. And this is why you need some sort of grounding mechanism in your life. But if you don't have one, you're probably going to experiment a lot more than the average person. So again, when you look at Sneeko, you can't compare him to yourself because you shouldn't compare anyone to yourself. If you're doing that, you're not being like extrospective. Comparing, like again, you can compare and contrast, but don't literally compare one to one. I can't compare Sneeko to who I was and I can't compare Sneeko to the people I know in his category. Well, I can compare him in a general sense to the people in his category, but I'm not thinking, well, um, oh, he were like, he is exactly like so-and-so. He's, he's not exactly like anybody. He's going through his own journey. And this is why therapy and mental health and philosophy and mentorship is so unique because you have to be willing enough to help somebody ground themselves. And most people don't do that. That's why most people aren't mentors because all you know how to do is criticize, which I understand. I'm very good at criticizing people too, but mentors have to be good at holding people accountable without like, well, understanding and seeing them. See, I can't see Sneeko fully. Like, I'm not a man. I'm not someone he can turn to and confide in in that way. Like, I'm not the person. But Dr. K might be the person. And that'd be pretty cool, right? But it's still up to Sneeko whether or not he utilizes the tools. So all Dr. K is probably going to do during this conversation, which is exciting, is give Sneeko tools. Let's see if he uses any of them. A way to Let's see if any of us use any of them, too, in regards to dealing with people like Sneeko, if you like, I don't feel that offended by Sneeko, but if you feel very, very offended by him, if you're very upset at him, see if Dr. K is going to give you tools to also be better because genuinely like Sneeko shouldn't get on your nerves that bad, you know, ben, at least not for the stuff he's doing in public. It's like a, a pussy way of dealing with your problems. It's an easy way out. I think it's actually really, I think people give themselves a lot of credit for going to therapy. Like it's something difficult. So I think it's really easy to sit on a couch and talk. I think what's better is, is moving forward and trying to, you know, shove it down and keep going because even if you don't shove it down you're still going to think about it i think people have this idea that you need to process your feelings in, on a couch next to a guy uh you could process your feelings like while you work a lot of times i'm thinking about the things that that i'm dealing with while i'm working I and mean, that, that could be therapeutic as well or prayer sure, i think yeah. prayer is much more therapeutic okay so so when you say therapeutic yeah that that's great dude so let's like i'm excited about this conversation um Oh, so let me just ask you a couple of, of things. So when you say that y you think therapy is a waste of time. Yeah. Um, why do you think that? Because it's, you're, you're basically just saying, you know the answer already. I think you, when you, when you walk into therapy, you already know the answer, like instinctually, you, you know what you're supposed to do and you kind of just want to talk about it to make yourself feel better. So where do you get the idea that therapy is about? Also, uh, Sneeko's ADHD. And if he's off his meds, he might be more like, right? Uh, so just like, that's what's interesting too, is he's like, he's neurodivergent. Sneeko, whether he likes it or not, as far as he's told the internet, he's diagnosed neurodivergent. That's why he said people have been telling him he's sick his whole life. You're not sick if you have ADHD or autism or if you have neurodivergency, you're not sick. But there is like a uniqueness to you that might make things a little bit more unique or different. But like he is neurodivergent. So just like as a neurodivergent to a neurodivergent, 
I get the desire to feel normal. I get the desire to say I am normal and I can do everything. I get the desire to pretend and boast and be like, I can work 80 hours a week. Fuck all of you. You're lazy. You just don't know. You're crying. You're a victim. I have absolutely gone through all the stages of grief about being not good enough, you know, because I'm neurodivergent. And it turns you into a person that's like not the greatest. Uh, where, where do you get your impression of what therapy is? Um, from everybody that talks about constantly, like, you know, I'm from New York and you all hear all these people in Manhattan, everybody, all, all the libs, the, they talk about like, I was just talking to my therapist. Oh, I just told my therapist, oh, my therapist, my therapist, they're calling their therapist. I need to talk to my therapist about this. People have relationship problems and like, oh, we need to go talk about it to my therapist for five hours and have a deep therapy, 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 therapy. Like it's, it's just, it's been way more normalized. And I think they prescribe a lot of problems so that you always come back. It's the same reason why the pharmaceutical companies do not want you to be healthy so that you continue to buy their medicine. If, if I go to a therapist, your job is to take my money from my mental health problems. Why would you want me to get better? You don't. You want me to keep coming back and paying you. So you're Some therapists absolutely are in it for the money. That's why you have to remember you're the customer. You're paying them. If a therapist isn't serving you, fire them. You're going to tell me, oh, come back next week and we'll unpack this and we'll unpack that. I don't need to unpack all this from childhood. I'm an adult. I'm 25. I'm going to shove it down and keep going. Why do I want to unpack this stuff? See? Oh, I love this. Isn't he so self-aware? That's what I mean. He says it. Why would I want to why would I want to do this? Shove it down and don't face it. So he's admitting there's something to face. It's not a gotcha. He's self-aware. As much as like you guys doubt my reading of Sneeko, and yeah, maybe he's like a three or a four. I don't know what he is. But he's obviously like probably like he could be anywhere from a 2a to a 4 i don't know right because like there's stuff about him like even when i've talked to him slightly um he doesn't like he i don't know him very well i just know him enough right just like i feel like when i know a stranger enough like okay so um but this is him being self-aware so he said it and watch he's laughing a little bit while he says it which is part of the grift he's laughing while he says it it's a part of the grift but the grift is also part of like a performance in his mind because Sneeko is an artist. He's like a theater nerd, right? He's like an artist. He's thinking of himself as like this performance artist, this like person who's like, you know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, there's a lot here to unpack, which is why I think he'll be so much more interesting in 10 years. Okay. Uh, what, what has happened when you've tried to unpack it? Um, unpack, unpack what? Childhood? So, so you, you said, you said that like, I don't want to unpack it. I want to shove it down. Yeah, right? shove it so down. So like what, what, what is, so obviously you want to do that for a reason, right? So you've had some experience that makes you prefer well, I'm, shoving I'm speaking, it down. I'm speaking generally. I'm speaking generally. Like people will talk about how they, they go into therapy and unpack all this stuff. Uh, it, it's better. Like I don't understand why people are 35 reliving all that. Well, okay, I, yeah, I, I get well, it, but well, I just think that's a stupid decision. Well, what, what, do, you, what do you get? When you say you get it, why, why do you think all these stupid people are in therapy? What do you mean get it? Like, well, you say you said you get it. So I'm curious, what do you get? Why do you think all these people are in therapy if it's such a colossal waste of time and, and essentially a monetary leech? Because it's easier to talk about things. right? Is it a grift if he buys his own bullshit? I don't think he buys it. I think it's a joke to him. This is my, like, this is, I'm not aware of this. He hasn't told me this, but I do think it's a joke to him. I think he thinks the world is stupid and he thinks everything's a game, which kind of true, right? And I think he's testing and he's like poking at authority and he's trying to say like, he's looking for something. I think he's looking for something and I think he's looking for the answers and I just think he's doing it in a way that makes sense in the same way that like a child would do it because like that's what he's going off of, right? So I'm I'm really excited. But like, yeah, he is definitely looking for something. He doesn't believe anything he says. That's my opinion. I don't think he believes it. I think he doesn't have the, the kind of cognitive dissonance like some other people. I think he's, he, I think internally he probably knows it's a game, right? Rather than find an action that's gonna, it's, it's easier to talk your way out of a problem than, than work your way out of it. Working is hard. <laughs> pushing forward and, and doing things that are difficult, that's harder, right? Like I, I consider the gym therapeutic. I consider sparring, I, I spar quite a bit. I consider that well, therapeutic. Yeah, so I, I think those things are therapeutic too. And and I, I mean, I'll be the first to say that I don't think therapy is therapeutic for everyone. I think that the concerns- I still think you give him too much credit. I think you shouldn't be reading at me as giving him credit. I think you should be reading, I'm reading him. I don't think I'm giving him very much credit. 
I think I'm saying that he's exactly where he would be for somebody who's in his position. I, you know what I mean? Like if this is your journey, if this is your category as a person, then he's doing exactly what his trope would be doing at this moment. He's like Bakugo from um, My Hero Academia. He's like unnerving and rude and mean, but in his heart, he's a good person, but he's going to fuck up. He's going to fuck people over. He's going to have problems. Like he's not exactly like Bakugo, obviously, but he's he's a certain kind of trope. I'm not trying to give him credit. I'm literally trying to say you guys expect too much from somebody in his category and expecting too much means you're not extrospective enough to hold to actually appropriately categorize him. Like it's interesting to me, like I said, people will expect more out of Sneeko than people who are older than him. And I think that's interesting. And then people with more accessibility and people with a different like Sneeko for some reason, we hold him more accountable into a higher standard than we hold a lot of people. And I don't know what it is about him, right? Right? What makes you think he's good deep down? Well, everyone's good. I think most people are good. Sneeko, like, is ultimately, like, he's reckless in a lot of ways that a lot of people are. He's pretty commonly toxic, like a lot of fuckboys are, right? Um... But he's not like murdering children in a back alley. Like, okay, he's done some things to some women that I think are abhorrent, but sadly not any different than most men would be doing. And it doesn't involve grape. So he's not graping people, right? He's not like, he's not, you know what I mean? He's he's not out here murdering people. He's not selling drugs to children. Like, okay, he's being sensational and he's playing into a bubble that he understands. But I mean, what do you need? Like, you can say he's bad, but that's like your values, right? He's a bad person to like, he's a bad boyfriend. He's definitely a bad lover. He's bad when it comes to like how he interpersonally interacts with people. I would say he's obviously a bad content creator in a sense because he couldn't follow TOS, but he's a great content creator in a sense that he makes really amazing videos or has. So like what is bad and good, right? Like he's, it's not about deep down. I think most people are good, which is my belief system. I think most people are good because they intend good for the world, right? Oh, yeah, he's not season six Bakugo. He's not a aff affable grump who is accepting and loving quite yet. That's true. If he accepted, men can be femme and talk about what makes them cry. He'd be fine. Yeah, he's Bakugo like season one or even prior to season one, right? And by the way, I haven't seen Bakugo season six, so no spoilers, you know? Case is saying he's bad doesn't give any further info. It's just a thought of terminating statement. He's bad, so we don't have to engage further. Exactly. Versus the challenge to us is to see the good in people because it's to see the good in ourselves, right? I think that's what's really important. That you have are actually like quite valid in terms of, I think sometimes therapy. If someone looks at the levels as though they're a ranking system, they may be irritated that you'd even say he's a four, which is, I could understand that, right? I could understand that, but then they're not understanding the level system. Being a five doesn't make you an automatically quote unquote good person. Fives can cheat, fives can rob, fives can murder, fives can do lots of things. They just probably wouldn't. But like, of course they could. The moralizing, the pedestaling of the fives came from other people. Being a five doesn't make you better than the twos right? It just doesn't. So the problem with people is like they're so in a bubble, they can't even understand the first concept around what enlightenment might be. And I'm not saying fives are enlightened. I'm saying fives are in the enlightenment journey, right? Like you can call it enlightenment, but I think like the journey is knowing like there is no enlightenment to seek because like enlightenment is a, is a construct. In of itself, it's a construct. But of course, it's something you can seek because like we have a fundamental, we have like a like a tangible relationship with it, but also it has its limitations because it's a construct. But if, again, if you're coming at this with like good, bad narratives, like you've already lost the conversation in terms of introspection. What is good and bad when they're constructs? That's what you have to ask yourself. So is Sneeko a bad boyfriend? Yes, to Britney. Is he bad in the way he treats women directly? Yes, to Britney. Is he a bad person through and through? Well, obviously not. If the worst thing he's done is be a fuck boy and maybe some other things he shouldn't have done, um, he can fix that. He can come back from that. He can realize and hold himself accountable and make amends. Like, he is not lost, right? But, I mean, rarely people are lost, right? R rarely are people lost lost. And don't forget, 
How many people out here, two Bs, causing a lot of war, a lot of destruction in the name of their God, in name of their church, in name of their government? If Sneeko is a bad person, so is every single person in Palestine that said the Jews should die and every single Israeli who said Palestine deserves what they get. Okay? And remember that. We all sit here on our little high, like our little pedestals, claiming we're the good people while advocating for the genocide and murder of other people's babies. I don't want to hear it. Okay? Auntie Brittany coming out. I don't want to hear it. He goes on way longer than it needs to. Um, and by the way, not to mention all the people in charge who are also making those orders come true okay Sneeko's not out here murdering tens of thousands of babies okay i don't really i swear to god you hold Sneeko more accountable than world leaders think that in my experience people most therapists that i know are not interested in keeping people there for monetary reasons and this very simple reason for that is there's no shortage of patients so if you stop paying me there's like literally a line out the door of like hundreds of people like the average waiting list for a therapist is like three or four months. Yeah. Wait, you, you don't um, get it. So when you see like a blue hair transgender walk in, you don't like rub your hands together like fall. <laughs> <laughs> Magic says, did you get the inspiration for your number system from numerology? I got the inspiration for my neurodivergency because I can't remember names. We called it one, two, three, four, five because I literally can't remember names. It's not even that deep. No, like when you see like a, a dude that looks like a girl no, with what, kitten what, ears. What? Like, what and, makes and, my and what, what makes me go what makes me go like this is listening to you talk about therapy. Mm -hmm. Why? Because <laughs> uh, I I think that there's there's like a lot of stuff to talk about that excites me. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's it's not the blue haired transgenders, man. It's it's okay. uh, dudes who dudes who focus on shoving it down in action and and don't have don't care to engage with their internal environment, which is a little bit of a judgment because I don't know that that's actually the case with you. But I, I yeah, I mean, this this excites me. Okay. Um, but uh, anyway, what do you think about what I said about, you know, with their waiting lists, 50 percent of therapists are don't take new patients like we're full up. Like we don't need your particular money because there's like tons of people that are waiting to give us their money. Okay. What do you think about that? Fair, but maybe the whole system works together. The pharmaceutical companies, the therapists, they all work on the fact that people's mental health, people are always talking about mental health. They all profit off of that. In a, in a world where people fix their problems with prayer and with gym, that whole industry would never exist at all. So even though you might not need more patients, it's all based on the fact that everybody's diagnosing themselves in real time. Well, so so let me ask you this. Um, so when you said to fix their problems with prayer. Remember how yesterday we watched Dr. K explain how to help people by not telling them what to do, but by asking them questions. That's what he's that's what he's doing. OK, he's asking him questions to try to get him somewhere. Right. I think that's really amazing. How does that work? Well, I, I just came back from Mecca and you can see people you, you call Suju when you put your your head to the floor. Um, and you see people sometimes like sobbing or when you go. Griffith is not a five, my bros. Griffith was. Griffith is complicated, but he's not a five, my bros. Like, absolutely not. He traumatized boy. He had trauma. Him and Guts traumatized boys. Go to the Majid on Friday. I'm going to go tomorrow at 1 p.m. For, for Juma. You see people like crying. And it's because they're they're definitely thinking of things that they're they're asking God for for certain things to be fixed. And I, I consider that therapeutic, that, that same type of tear that they um, crying that they, they might do in therapy. Instead, they're, they're connecting with God. I think all those problems like opening up about unpacking stuff like that, you should unpack it with God. You know, I, I, I see them and the, the way that they are. I, and I felt it, too. When I was in Mecca, for example, and praying next to the Kaaba, I, I really mm. felt every. That is a real sensation people feel, which is why religion is so compelling. Right. The reason things are so compelling is because we feel a way about things. I feel this way when I eat this food. I feel this way when I watch Sneeko. I feel this way when I watch politicians. I feel this way when I'm in a church. I feel this way when I'm in a house that's abandoned. I feel this way. We have to talk about what is our feelings, which are so valid, and then what is the relationship we're having with our feelings? And then what is our relationship we're having with our perception of our feelings? And then what is the relationship we're having with our like ability to to have a relationship with those feelings, right? Nico says, if you just introspect without any action to change without those realizations, where does um, that fall on the system? That's a good question. 
Uh, it depends on the level of introspection, but I think everyone, even babies, are introspecting, right? We're all having a level of introspection. Acting on it is difficult. Having a relationship with yourself is difficult. So I would say like an awareness of it without any of the change would make me question where the awareness came from if there wasn't a change to seek it out. Maybe ones are people who can introspect but do nothing about it. Maybe that's one way to think of a one, right? Because Boogie could be self-aware about what he needed to do to change but wouldn't do it. So maybe ones are people who... um. Well, but they don't, they don't always introspect. Well, maybe ones are people who are self, because everyone has a little bit of introspection, right? So maybe it's like they have enough introspection to know, but they don't do anything about it. Maybe that's like a good relationship with the ones maybe, because everyone has a level of introspection and then it matters where they stop or they go back to, or they continue forward. So like you could be a 2B who has a deep sense of introspection and never gets a five or never ask yourself, who am I in regards to the universe, right? You know what I mean? So you want to ask yourself, where am I on the journey of introspection, right? I remember when I first brought up the levels to my religious family, to like my priest friend and my brothers, and they were like, uh, you know, um, so you're telling me in order to challenge my bubble, I'd have to go outside of it and do things that are against my religion. And I said, probably. And they said, well, I'm not willing to do that. And I said, right. So you'll not pop the bubble. And they were like, but I don't need to pop the bubble. I have the objective truth. Like God is real. And I was like, right. But because you're in the bubble where you feel like God is real, until you hit another bubble that pops this bubble or until you pop this bubble to hit another bubble, you won't that might not be true. And they were like, but we know it's true. And I was like, but you're not willing to take the risk to challenge it in a way that would make you quote unquote sin. So introspection is possible, but you still can stop yourself from facing yourself. And then extrospection is a part of that. So what is outside of yourself is the continuation through the levels. So you can be a two that's really good and valuable and amazing, but you don't have to do, but if you limit yourself with your extrospection, right? You won't be able to pop that bubble enough to then be introspective again. Because remember, every time you pop a bubble, which is extrospection, you're also popping a bubble with your introspection. You're learning something new about yourself when you learn something new about people. That's why when you watch Sneeko, we're hoping to learn something new about Sneeko to learn something new about ourselves. Or Dr. K is going to give us a tool. Because remember, even though, even if you think you're smarter than Sneeko, are you smarter than Dr. K? And I don't mean smarter. Well, maybe I think like, are you saying he doesn't have a tool to give you? So I look at Dr. K as a person who can give me a tool, especially as a person who does calls with people that isn't therapy, but philosophy. I would love to learn how he handles Sneeko because I would love to help people like Sneeko or at least give them tools. I would love to know how to give a tool to Sneeko. One of my biggest bummers was I didn't have a tool to give Destiny. I didn't have a tool to give Sneeko. I didn't have a tool to give Max. I didn't have a tool to give Lav. Like it frustrates me when I don't have tools to give people that I think could benefit them. But it is what it is. Like there's only so much to do there. Um, And so it is like I couldn't give them the right tools, I think. So again, like, I just want to see what tools we can get from Dr. K, even for us, right? Especially for us. Everything that was going on in my head and everything, it's not like I have to shove it down. I, I know everything that that's there, but it becomes present when you're in the when you're in prayer. You you feel it. You're thinking about it. You're, you're reminded of everybody you love. Wait, Yaya yeah, says, what is prayer? Speaking to a therapist that doesn't respond. First of all, hilarious. I think prayer is an amazing meditation tool, and I'm a big believer in meditation. You're reminded of your past. You're reminded of your flaws. You're reminded of what you want to do better on. You're reminded of your fears and everything. And then you you look to God for strength and for guidance and to keep you on the straight path. Okay. So um, let me just make sure I heard you. So when you pray, so it sounds like you feel a lot of positive emotions. You and feel, negative too. Like I, 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 would, I wouldn't say positive too, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah everything. Nice. everything. Right. That is beautiful. That is a self-awareness that I think is beautiful in someone. When I pray, I feel good and bad. That's beautiful, bro. That means he's facing himself. Yeah, I wasn't done. So you said you feel a lot of love. You feel a lot of fear, yeah. right? You think about people that you love. You also think about actions that you want to take and places that you want to go. So you have goals that you think of. What? No. Kessler says, I'm not a whiz with the number system, but Griffith's clearly about his dream gets him higher on the scale, right? No. Are you talking about my scale or a different scale? Are you talking about my levels? Links in the description if you guys haven't seen them. Brittany Simon has her own level system called The Levels, and it's linked down below. But there's no way Griffith would be a five. Like, there's no possible way. There's no, I've watched that series through twice now, fully. Like there's, And I've read some of the manga. There's no way 
he could be a five. Right. There's just like no possible way. Right. And then and then what help me understand this part about God? Where does God enter enter the picture? Yeah. Kay says the main tool you're lacking is grace when it comes to those co um, conflictive personalities. It's it's like their specific type. I cannot stand people that blame the world for their problems. Like they blame everyone else. Right. They blame the Matrix. They blame women. They blame the I cannot handle that in people. Like if you blame the world, but then you get over it, I'm here with you. Right. But like people, I can't. That's like you're right. That's oh, I have no grace. It makes me so annoyed when people talk about ultimate victim complex. Talk about ultimate victim complex, blaming everybody else but yourself while pretending to hold yourself accountable. Oh, oh, Ooh. may God teach me patience. May God teach me patience. I, I would prefer I can understand why therapy is helpful for a lot of people, but I think it's better to go and talk that out. Talk about your trauma and your past to God rather than to a man. OK. So I'm a, I'm not trying to debate you, okay? So I'm not trying to like catch you or something. I'm, I just, I'm, I'm confused yeah. um, because now you're saying you you think that therapy can be helpful for other other people, but prayer is superior. Yes. So there is some benefit to therapy because it sounds like a lot of the mech. I'm assuming that you think a lot of the mechanisms. Ooh, what about this? Because I think therapy is useless without philosophy. What if Sneeko's like? Therapy works for some people, but you really need God, but you really need philosophy. When people say, man, I wish there was church again. I wish I had church again. Are you saying you wish you had philosophy again? You wish you had an understanding of wisdom and meaning and humility? When you say, I wish the world believed in God again, are you saying, I wish the world had a philosophy again? You know what I mean, right? Kay says, once you drop your expectations of the person you're talking to, I find all I can give is grace because they're just human with less tools than me. I think... That's true of most people that I interact with, but I will say I don't like liars. And I think at some point it becomes like for your own boundary sake, I think it's important to know where your boundary is, right? Because I do that with most people, but I don't think you can do it with all people. I like, I don't think anyone is God. So I think even the most like meditative, profound person has their limitations. Even Uncle Iroh had to cut Zuko off, right? Like everybody has a limit with who they're working with. So I just want to, again, because I don't believe in God-like figures, I want to say, yes, that's exactly what you should do. And that's what I can do with a lot of people. But just like Uncle Iroh, I have my limitations. I just think like it's important to know that about yourself on the journey. And maybe you're, maybe, I don't want to say you're making that argument either. But I think like in case there is Sneeko viewers watching, there is not a God in a sense like you as a man will never be perfect. And there is definitely not, oh, once I get to this stage, I'll understand all humans exactly how they are. I'll be perfect and patient and wonderful. No, you're a human on a journey and everyone is complicated. So if you're new to, ch to the channel, understand that like you will always have a limitation unless you are claiming you are like supernatural, which is why I think people create God because they want to believe someone could be like him. and at the same time, never be him because he's so unattainable, right? So say you, you talk about your positive emotions, you talk about your negative emotions, you talk about your goals, you can do that with a person, but it's better to do it with God. Yes. What makes it better with God? Because I, I don't believe in confessing your deepest, darkest secrets and sins. I think that you're gonna embellish the truth. Uh, I went to therapy one time, I was 19, and I, I was talking to this woman. I was basically like um, head over heels about this girl. I was in college and like it was just- a lot of was such- He's so in, like, he's so, he falls so in love, but then he thinks it makes him weak. So he resents the women that he falls for. I was just like going through like a, a, so I decided, all right, like everybody's doing this therapy thing, I'll pay her. And then she had giant tits. Uh, she was like really gorgeous. And so I ended up embellishing the story. And instead of like actually being honest, I was just. Hey, that's fair. My first therapist I went to, I wasn't completely honest with because I was like really resentful and I didn't trust her, which was a good instinct, by the way, because she was a bad therapist. But my second therapist, I was like fully vulnerable with. And this woman like saved my life. She was amazing. Trying to like, you know, I was like spitting game on her like I was on a date. And I realized in that moment, like I can't fully be honest with the person because the only person you I love it. I can't fully be honest. I can't fully be honest. I can't. I'm so proud. Of, look at them. Look at him saying it. I think, 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 I think. To really be honest with this God. Uh, to a person, you're always going to be, a, there's going to be a level of entertainment. There's going to be a level of lying. You're going to try to uh, make sure that they're engaged. You're going to try, your ego is going to be involved. When I'm talking to God, I don't have any ego. 
There's there's nothing I don't, there's nothing that I need to hide or it's just because God is all knowing. God's the best of planners, so He's gonna know. And I I even noticed that a lot when I was praying in Mecca. I felt all the the ego and the little blockades that I had in my head and the the barriers that you have when you talk to a person. They're absent when I talk to God. Okay. Can I think for a second? Yeah. How's this conversation so far, by the way? Interesting. Okay. So let me just make sure I understood. So you tried therapy once. And yeah. uh, because your therapist had big tits, yeah. it sounds like you activated a different mode of relating to that person. Yeah. So you started like hitting on her. I remember like telling the story and I was like, even my gestures, I was like, all right, so boom. So I was at the spot and then we really did it. And like, I'm making a like, you know, I got this girl and I'm doing my thing. And I was just like talking, like I was talking to her, like, I was trying so, to come off cool. Yeah. So would you say that what you did for that hour with that person was therapy? Bad therapy. What made it bad? Actually, think, think about it like I did learn some things and oh, oh, oh. I didn't need to go back anymore. So, yeah. yeah. But I think the real the, the reason it was effective. Was Come on, Sneeko's such a, he's just like a sweet boy. I can't handle it. He's like. I'm sorry. He just reminds me so much of a boy. He's just a boy. Like, this is a boy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is a boy attitude, boy problems. It's just so cute. I can't handle it. It's just, it's like when you're dealing, it's just a boy stuff. This is such a boy thing to do. So, not a man, not a gender, but like a boy, like an adolescent. It's just so fucking funny, man. Oh, shit. I love it. Woo. Yeah. Bad therapy. Whose fault is that, sir? So funny. Bad relationships? Whose fault is that, Sneeko? Like, he's so silly. Yes, right? He's so silly. It was because I realized that I don't Ooh. need therapy. Like, it just helped me realize that it, that it, this is unnecessary. So I did get to talk things out. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, hold, hold on. Okay, hold on, okay, hold on, okay. Hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly... He knows. I'm... Look at his stupid face. He knows. This is what I'm saying. I He acts like a teenager because he's a child. He's a child. That's what I'm saying. Like... He's a child. Like he, okay, <laughs> Sneeko legit I, low IQ. I know you guys can't see his chat. I just covered it in case it was like bad or TOS or something. But like, oh my God, his chat be going for him. But like, yeah, like you look at him smiling. He knows he caught himself. That's what I'm saying. This is the same look. Look, not to project. This is the same look my brothers give me when they say dumb shit to me and I catch them in a corner and they're like, ah, and I'm like, Wah. and then we all laugh. It's like, it's like they blush. It's like they know they got caught being stupid, but they also, they have to test. He's just doing normal testing things. A curious person tests. Curiosity killed the cat. Why? Because if you test enough, they gonna kill you. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's gonna come back to bite you in the booty. People who are not, who are only curious in a very like safe way, Yes, they're probably, you know what I'm saying? Like, curiosity killed the cat for a reason. And Sneeko's on his, like, he's already, like, seven lives down. How many lives do a cat have? Nine lives? He's, he's down at least five lives, okay? I'm not trying to, like, debate you or, like, I have no interest in proving you wrong. Honestly, I have no, 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 no interest no. in that, okay? Uh, it's, it's just, I'm just, like, kind of curious because here you are saying, okay, I tried therapy. But it sounds like, it's kind of like saying, like, okay, um... Swimming is a waste of time be and, and then you ask me like why do you think it's a waste of time? Well, I went to the beach and like I never really got in the water I just hung out on the sand and like swimming is a waste of time, right? Well, so you went there yeah. you you did something, but I mean you're telling me That you treated this person true case says the ending of that sentence saying is I uh, Curiosity killed the cat but satisfaction brought it back Let's hope he gets satisfaction before all his lives are gone, bro because that is it like curi curiosity, bro. Okay, it's like it's a threat to your safety in a way. You know what I mean? Person, you didn't do therapy. You started flexing. Safety and sanity, I would say. For her. Yeah. Right. That's not therapy. Okay. Now, and and I think that that's fair, right? Because you're also saying that okay, like the problem with therapy is that when <clears> you go. You can't be completely vulnerable or honest with another human being. 
Now, to be fair, that is also a fear a lot of us have. Like, I think all of us know the memes about like, I told my therapist, I was too honest with my therapist and now I'm in the ward. It's like we all have that like fear of a therapist and a hope for the therapist. That's why you have to find a therapist who truly believes like people can get better. You have to go to a therapist like Dr. K, like Dr. Kirk Honda, who actually believes you can get better. If you go to a therapist who's like, I'm sorry, like Dr. Romani, who thinks like people with MPD will never get better, like that's not going to be a helpful therapist. But like Dr. Kirkonda works with people with NPD and does believe they show improvement. It's not about curing. It's about showing improvement. So if I had somebody with NPD in my life, I would say go to Dr. Kirkonda. He believes in your ability to get better. And so do I. Right. But if I told them to go to Dr. Romani, like what good would that do them? Right. Like she's like negative to the point where I don't like her stuff. Because I think people can get better. Being. Yeah. Because well, they choose to get better is a different story. Because, and so some kind of script, and I, I would guess if I asked you, like, okay, let's say that you didn't, there wasn't a female therapist. Nail says, it would be so hot if I found a man who's addicted to lift, lifting weights and therapy. I mean, vibes. With big tits. Let's say the therapist was like, <clears throat> I don't know, a middle-aged dude. You would still be activating some kind of script with them. Yeah. Right. Right. And so what I'm hearing you say is that the cool thing with God is that there's no scripts. Right. Yeah. Oh, so oh, Dr. I'm kind of curious about something. So like one of the advantages of therapy, right, is that there's another human being there. Now, that's a disadvantage because now mm -hmm. ego enters the picture. Maybe you're trying to impress them. Maybe you don't want to be vulnerable, like totally fine. But there's also an advantage, which, which is that there's a person there. Right. So they're able to listen. They're able to respond. They're able to interact. Look they're how he able to, to the right person. Sneeko will listen, observe, or he'll at least consume information. And and maybe I'm making an assumption here. So I'm going to ask about this. Do you think that God does those things? Observes and listens and and talks back. Yeah, I do. And, and in, in what way? If you if you want something or you're looking for some sort of guidance, you can ask God and you'll God will respond. How? Not in the way that a human does, but there there is a response, and it's just it, it's kind of instinctual, uh, and you know, like you you can he'll tell you what you what you should be doing because I think deep down you always do know the answer. So, so when you say, so you're saying that God will tell you, and then yeah. you're saying deep down, you know, the answer. So are we, is, are we saying that deep down the voice that's talking to you is God? Is that you or is that God? Or am I not understanding the. Well, I mean, we all, we're all God's creation. So we have, there's a sort of connection. I think deep down you all know, because we're all born pure. And then we start to become corrupted with sin. We start to become corrupted by what's around us. And then that's what creates the, the blockade. So like behind all the ego, behind the mess and the, the programming, you know what the truth is. But you can ask God when you, when you drop it and you're able to, to hear his guidance. Okay, what makes it easier or harder to hear his guidance? I think it's, it's actually, it's, it, in a lot of ways, it's harder. It's not easy to... Uh, to be vulnerable like that. It's, it's not easy to, to get to that point. It took me a long time, uh, but I do know it's possible after um, consistently praying. Right, so, so what makes it easier or harder to hear God's voice? Because you said sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's harder, I, I'd agree. Uh, well, you have to fully, it's full, full submission to God. And uh, there's a lot of like, sometimes people aren't able to do that because they're sinning, or sometimes people aren't able to do that because they're too angry, they're too emotional, depends on what. Another way to think about it is like prayer is a form of meditation. And even if you're meditating every day, if you're too closed off to receive the tools of meditation, to receive the tools of God's quote unquote voice, you won't utilize the tool. So meditation will be useless to you. Prayer will be useless to you. Since I believe prayer is like the religious, is the religious community's way of meditation, I think that voice of God they're hearing is the same voices you hear when you meditate, which is just like your consciousness mirrored back to you. It's about practicing that relationship you have with yourself. And so that's why God's voice is recognizable to people because it's it's yours. It's, you know what I mean? Like it's just your consciousness in relation to the world or yourself or the, you know what I mean? I believe in prayer as a form of meditation. I just think people need to project it into something higher than themselves so they can like see it as valid. 
That's why we like have this idea like we want to appeal to authority. We want to reach for authority to like tell us what to do. Like we 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 want to surrender to someone bigger and stronger than us instead of realizing like you should surrender. Like you can surrender to the universe. You can surrender to the knowledge that like your little floating ball in the universe. Everyone needs their own tool. But I really believe in prayer and meditation. I just don't need the the concept of God to be literal to like value it, you know? What state you are in life. But if you can get to that point, then then you're able to communicate with God. Okay. So I'm hearing that, I'm with you that if you're able to get to that point, it's great, right? So you, you hear some kind of voice or some kind of knowing or instinct or connect with the divinity within you. Is it cool if I call it that? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm also hearing that it's not entirely clear what the mechanism or methodology to connect with God is. So there's certain things that get in the way, maybe angry, anger, maybe sin. But even if I'm not angry or I'm not sinning, does that guarantee I will hear God God's voice? No. Or, or right. So then, then what else goes into it? Uh, fear. It could be like sometimes, for example, well, I'll give you Islam, for example, because I'm a Muslim and a lot of people connect with God in different ways. And I don't think any of that. I thought he was off the Muslim grift. Is he still in the Muslim grift? I thought he was literally off that grift. What? I thought Sneeko literally was off that grift. When did he get back on the grift? I literally thought that was that was like literally what? 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 Yeah, yeah. With the quotes from Jesse Reyes, does the voice in my head that talks me off the ledge belong to me or does it come from the clouds? Who am I when no one's in the room? Beautiful, based. That is inherently wrong, but for example, when you pray in Islam, you're supposed to- Ew, Leo Skeppy's on the Trisha podcast. Oh. Oh, God. Make wudu before, which is cleansing yourself. Peace and love, peace and love, Papa bless. You're supposed to wash your arms, wash your feet. You're supposed to wash your face, your ears and everything. Uh, you're supposed to be in a clean state. Even when you pray in Mecca, you're supposed to be wearing a white garment that's clean. Like there's, there's a way to purify yourself and make sure you have true intentions. Mm -hmm. Even when you're washing yourself before prayer, you're supposed to make sure like, the whole point is to make clear intentions that I'm going to pray uh, or else your prayer isn't accepted. Like even when you when you um, get your knees and put your head to the floor, you can't just go through the motions and expect to be able to connect with God. You have to have clear intentions to do that. Just like meditation. If you go into meditation thinking like, hum, hum, dala, hum, 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 if that's not going to work. Sorry. <laughs> the Assyrian, Assyrian in me came out. But like, you know what I mean? Like that's not going to work. You can't just go hum and be like, is it working? You have to have intentionality. So much of introspection is intentionality. So much of meditation is intentionality. So much of just like pondering intentionally, meditating intentionally, praying intentionally. Intention is very good, you know? That's very good. Um, Charles says, how does your relationship to insecurity change as you climb the levels? It fluctuates. You will always battle with insecurities, right? Because like you're still a human. I, again, I want to make it clear that everything I've read and consumed, everything I've ever recognized about enlightenment does not get you to the sacred space of being not human. It makes you more human. It doesn't make you perfect. Perfection is a disease of a nation, as the philosopher Beyonce once said. Like, it does not get you to a place where you don't have insecurity. You just have a different, healthier relationship with your insecurities. You're aware of them and you recognize them as like a human experience because like you're still a human. You do not transcend being a person. You know what I mean? And so that's what I've learned. And again, I'm not claiming to be enlightened. I'm just claiming to be introspective on like a certain level and extrospective. But like, again, what is enlightenment? It's wanting to be enlightened is kind of a catch-22 because like it's a construct. We made it up. That. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things. If you're em emotional or y if you don't have faith. We're having a set of experiences that we're attaching this word to and creating bubbles around is what I mean when I say we made it up, right? In the sense that we make up what qualifies you to be a certain personality disorder. It's a set of qualities that we've lumped together to say, this is what that is. But like, is it? And what does that mean? Sometimes people just don't have faith. Like there's, there's okay. a lot of things that can block your faith. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so then let's say I'm having trouble, right? Let's say I don't really have faith or <clears throat> I'm afraid or I'm angry. Um, Actually, for, forget about that. I, I realized I was slipping into an, uh, a debating kind of mode, so I'll just say what I'm going to say. Okay. Um, so 
here's here's where I think there's an advantage to therapy. So I, I, I completely agree with everything that you've said. Okay. I think the challenge, though, is that what you're sort of talking about is like difficulties within you. So like, let's just take faith, for example. So not having faith is like really tricky, right? Because if faith is not something that is born of logic. It's born of faith. It's very woo-woo. It, the... Faith is woo-woo, bro. Faith is woo-woo. Faith in humanity is woo-woo. Even faith, like, that I should expect humans to do, like, what I would do is kind of crazy. Or I have faith in humanity. Or I have faith that people are good. Or I have faith that, like, you're not going to run your red light. Like, that's kind of woo-woo because you're kind of trying to make a prediction of something. You know what I mean? You can logic your way through it, of course. But it's, it's a good reason to expect it. But it's also kind of woo-woo believing that, like, things are always going to be the way they seem. Belief in something and if you really look at it, technically, you can't have a faith. You can't have faith if you have knowledge, because knowledge knowledge is when you know something. Faith is when you believe something, right? You have right. faith in something. Agreed there. And I'm not trying to argue with. Yes, exactly. What we believe versus what we know. We know very little. We believe a lot, which is not bad. I'm just I'm laying out how my understanding. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So I, I think the big advantage of therapy is that you've got like another human being. So if you have other problems, right? So like if you have, let's say, fear or anger or a lack of faith, that there's actually like another human being there to help you with those barriers. Right. But humans are inherently flawed and we're never going to be perfect. Right. So absolutely. You're I mean, a therapist's advice is always going to be inferior to God's because God's all knowing and God is perfect and God's more intelligent than us. But there's, I don't think that there's any human that's better than me or smarter or that knows anything that I don't know because we're all created equal. So, I mean, it's, I mean, literally people know more than us, obviously, obviously there are more people that are more patient than us or loving than us. Like there's always somebody smarter, better, stronger than us. It's good to kind of voice those things. But we're like the dignity of the human is the same but not how we interact with that dignity. Uh, and that's why that therapy session that I had with, the, with that woman with the giant breast was effective because I just, I realized something. She didn't tell me anything. It was just me talking that made me realize that this is useless and I don't need this. Um, I think when you talk to- Yo, Nail says the acceptance of the woo being crazy and magical is the healthiest part of religion. Should be more whimsical in Harry Potter. You know what's crazy? Is the healthy part. Sorry. You know what's crazy is like religious people are like tarot's woo woo and everything's woo woo and fake. And I'm like, sir, you believe in a God. You know, you believe in a God, sir. You believe in a God. Like that's what's so crazy is like religious people don't see themselves as woo woo. And I'm like, what? Like that's what's so interesting about religious people. I'm like, how are you not woo-woo? But they think woo-woo means like not real. And I'm like, or man-made. And I'm like, hello, sis? Like, ma'am? Hello, ma'am? So well, hold, hold, yeah. hold on, hold on a second. So, so, so I, I'm not, mm. I don't, once again, I don't disagree with any of your premises. <laughs> I just don't, I, I come to a different conclusion. So uh, you kind of said, I I'm with you, that human beings are flawed, right? And so, but th just because a human being is flawed doesn't mean that a human being can't help another human being. True. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it's completely useless. I'm just saying that prayer is better. Okay. And I think people like the echo chamber and have a certain level of narcissism. I think if you keep going back to therapy, like that long without any solution, you just kind of like hearing yourself talk. I agree. If you're in therapy for too long, red flag, bros. But too long isn't dictated on anyone else's number but yours. I think there are people who go to therapy for too long, you know, because they're comfortable. And it's like, I think a good therapist would encourage you to stop therapy if it was going on too long. Well, I mean, when you say that long without any kind of solution, like what's your understanding of what's your understanding of like the course and outcomes around therapy? Uh, there's a lot of people that I know, I'm sure you know these people too, they have their, their therapist on speed dial and they, they talk they talk about the therapist like they're friends. You know, it, it, I, I, I don't I don't think that's the majority of people. I think that is a tiny, tiny fraction of people. Okay. I would guess less than 5%. So I know that, for example, like part of our training as therapists is that we set very clear boundaries. We're not your friend. So you're not supposed to be texting us all the time. Mm -hmm. So when, when a, a patient texts or calls me at like 8 p.m., I'll answer because they don't usually do that. 
and then I'll ask them, hey, can this wait until our appointment? Or do you really need to talk to me now? Or do you need to go to the emergency room? Or like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. So so I, I don't I don't think that we because a lot of what I'm really confused about is that I think a lot of your understanding of therapy is is based on I'm not quite sure what like what you've heard, I guess. I, I guess my understanding is it's a lot of uh, a lot of liberals who who prioritize feelings over facts, the people that that. Yeah, the, the people that usually go to therapy, just I don't think that they're based in, in reality. I think that they they like trivializing their lives and they're just not that interesting and they want to make it more interesting by by making up problems I, and unpacking curious, everything. Where, where does that where where do you where do you get that? Right. So like there, for example, you said that they're like interested in feelings instead of facts. So like wh wh where do you get that impression? Like, have you I'm just so I'm confused by that. For example, because like, you're, you're drawing you're drawing a lot of conclusive statements. And I'm curious. They, they, like, what they have something called like gender affirming care. I remember having this in school where they there was we had like social workers and therapists. We're pro LGBT on this channel. LGBTQA stand up. OK, we're pro the gays here. That's a queer icon myself. Thank you. You're welcome. That were designed there. Um, and there were rooms for safe places where there was like a psych um, a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist and they would just talk and they would just talk about their feelings. And then it was always, they had like rainbow stickers on the front and all these people that were, that ended up becoming transgender or becoming gender fluid, they were always constantly in therapy. Or like, I, I went to school uh, with a bunch of depressed kids who were kids who thought they were depressed. Yeah. All these kids were on SSRIs. Uh, they were all, that said they were anxious. They were constantly popping pills. Um, and they all had the same political ideology. It, it was sort of like centered around the fact that weakness is okay. They didn't see strength as a virtue. They saw weakness as something to, to lean into. How, how do you know that what they saw that uh, I'm, I'm confused? Like, what, what, how do you know what they see? I mean, so, I, by talking to them, I, mean, I guess I, I can't, I don't, but talking to them all the time to see like hey hey hey! no lgbs in this comment section bro lgbt's uh, or i'll block you no transphobes allowed bro not a vibe the people that were constantly <laughs> going to therapy in my school were the gender fluid people the pe you know i think this is like a really as much as i think sneak was kind of like mm, i think this is a really common experience even the very first podcast i made guys the very first podcast i made involved me wondering if Elliot Page's journey was like legit because I was so sick of white women being like gender fluid. But he's obviously going through a real journey. I'm here for it. I support him. It's beautiful. It's fucking beautiful, bro. I love that for him. Right. But even I was so cynical because you like you get into a bubble enough and even you start to become cynical of like, what is your journey? Are you the real thing or the fake thing? Because not everybody who's going through a gender crisis is like having they're always having an authentic experience. But when people say like, when people say you're not having a real experience, they're saying you weren't even right about yourself. That's why people are discounting like Destiny's open relationship as working because they're like, you weren't even right about yourself. That's why people are waiting to see if I get divorced because so, so they can say you weren't even right about yourself because we're all kind of looking at each other like, do you know more than me? Do you know more about yourself than I do? And that's why people turn to God because only God knows you, right? But there is a way to know the self and still admit that you don't know the self. There's a way to say, oh, I know myself very well. And also, oh, that's new. What a mystery to myself. The back of my hand, a part of it I never realized existed. Like we can always discover more about ourselves, right? For the rest of our life, right? He's just a hypocrite though. I think most people do this. Most people are hypocrites, right? Like most people don't even know they're being hypocritical, right? I just don't believe him. Well, you shouldn't believe him because he doesn't believe it. That's what I'm saying. You're falling for this idea of Sneeko that you think is real. So you've convinced yourself Sneeko is being real right now, but he's not. Dr. K is picking up on the fact that Sneeko isn't being transparent because he's contradicting himself. He's not being a hypocrite. He's contradicting himself in a way that is like without reason, right? Life is contradictions. You can absolutely contradict yourself and it'd be rational and reasonable. But Sneeko isn't a hypocrite because he doesn't believe anything. He's contradicting himself because he doesn't believe anything and he doesn't have a reason or a rhyme for it, but he's trying to logic it the same way most religious people do. I don't think most religious people are hypocrites. I think they don't actually either believe what they say they do 
or if they do believe it, they try their best to be as consistent as possible while recognizing that they're going to fail. But I think it's much more nuanced than that. When I was younger, I used to think like, um, like a hypocrite. Well, it depends on how you define a hypocrite, right? Stop it. Jewel says I'm a hypocrite. I say I'm going to eat healthy and then I have buttered popcorn. Isn't that just being undisciplined? Like, isn't that just being undisciplined? That's not being a hypocrite, right? That's just saying un like that's undisciplined. I think a hypocrite would be more like I say I'm Muslim and then, oh, hello, OBS. Wait, am I still here? Wait, someone tell me in chat. Am I still here? Hold on. Hold on. Am I here? Okay, I'm here. Okay, good, good, good. So I think like a hypocrite is someone who says very strongly, like, this is my belief. This is what you should do. And then they don't do it. So Sneeko is probably a hypocrite when it comes to Islam, unless he's truly not drinking, truly not eating pork, truly not sleeping with women. Right. But while Sneeko was practicing Islam, he was definitely sleeping with women. So Haram. Right. He's not he's a hypocrite when it comes to Islam. He's a he's contradictory when it comes to his beliefs. And then there's the nuance of contradictory that I do, I do think belongs in everyone's belief system. I believe I should be kind to people. Sneeko's a, sh Sneeko's a shithead and I hate him. Like, that's not being very kind, right? Like, yes, I believe we should be kind. And I still want to call Sneeko a shithead. But also, like, what is kindness, right? So we all have contradictory beliefs, right? So again, it's like, what is it? What does it mean? You know what I mean? He's a hypocrite about him hating on gay people when he had gay friends at school. Well, he's fluctuated back and forth about gay rights, first of all. And also, like, lots of homophobes have gay friends. Lots of homophobes are gay. Lots of homophobes are sucking dick right now. People that okay. didn't believe in it and the people that were, like, on a different... Also, Fishy, if you were a turf, I might ban you. I might. Don't tempt me. Don't tempt me political idea like they, they were the ones playing i'm just kidding you know i love you sports uh working out constantly and who are uh who are like trying to build something <clears throat> okay so so i i'm i'm sort of seeing like there there's that, that just the way that you're viewing things is that there's a lot of like correlations yeah so going to therapy is correlated with weakness with is liberalism correlated weakness, with yeah a, a political ideology is correlated with not exercising is correlated with not doing things. Yep. Um, In action. Let me just think about. Why are we having this conversation? Oh, great question. Because maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my way. Oh of thinking is, is incorrect I, I consider i think it's pretty polarizing uh when i talk about this it upsets a lot of people um so maybe maybe my worldview was wrong and um maybe yours is right and maybe therapy is necessary uh maybe i need it what do you think i don't i believe well, I, the reason i believe what i believe is because I, I think i'm right okay um, yeah, so so that that's what's so interesting. So here's my experience of this conversation. So you say things in ways that are very polemic. So like uh, polar. So you, you say things in a way that invites me to argue with you right. and try to prove. <gasps> Let's go. Ren says fishes number one gay trans fan. True membership for five months. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I really do you wrong yeah. like just the the statements that you make and i can see why people are like inflamed by that and if i don't try really hard to catch myself then i will start arguing with you right why are you smiling right now because you're right because you're, you're completely right <laughs> that's just my way people people tell me that quite a bit i have like a argumentative style of speaking th th that's not the question that i asked i asked why are you smiling i'm smiling because you're right because so what is the correlation with me being right and you smiling? That in 20 minutes you picked up on what, um, you know, my friends and family. Ah, he was poking the bear, trying to figure out who, who is more of a man in this conversation. That's why Sneaker reminds me of a teenager, because he like, he's like a kid in class that like bullies the teacher to kind of get attention to prove that like he should listen to that person. You know what I mean? I love that. Ren gifted five memberships. Thank you so much. 
and Miss Fishy with the super chat. Go off transgender queen. Let's go. Let's go. LGBTQAIA. My dyslexia. Yay. Thank you so much. Let's go. Nova, Amber, Just Joe. Wait, who has Brit and who? Ripley. Let's go. Members now. Woo woo. You guys are going to see me make some Christmas cookies. If you are on Open With Boundaries memberships, I'm going to make some Christmas Assyrian cookies. We make them every year and they are freaking delicious, bros. You will never eat a cookie better than this cookie, bro. And we have been saying for years. Okay. And when I pick up on something that your friends and family have been saying for years. So that's just like a fact, right? Like I picked mm. up on it. Yes. But you have a reaction to that, which yeah. is that you're smiling. Right. So that re reaction. Ooh, the introspective converse. This is so good. Dr. K so good. And comes with an emotion. Yes. That's what the reaction is. Yes. What's the emotion? The emotion, um, I think I get like a dopamine hit from, I, I like. Dopamine's I like, not an emotion. What's up? Dopamine's not an emotion. Right? Um, so what's the emotion? Laughter. Laughter's an and I'm not trying to make you sound stupid action. here, but laughter is not an action. So let's think about it. What What's the emotion? Um, joy? Laughter is the expression. Yeah. Okay. Right. So like, how do you understand that? Like, here I am noticing something about you and your reaction is joy. Okay. I, 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 I like. <laughs> I'm such a mom and a big sister, but bro. This is what it is like dealing with boys, like brothers, like little boys, like when you're talking to them and literally, oh my God, they're so exhausting. Like, they're just like so cute. I just like, I love it so much. <laughs> I'm still rooting for Sneeko because he obviously has it in him. If, with the right person, he like, he has it. He has the humility. Yeah, he want to be seen. He wants to be seen. He wants someone who sees him. Oh, I just love this about him. I want it for him so much. And he's being very respectful to Dr. K. So I'm good. I'm really happy for this. This is a great conversation. <sighs> Yay. Connecting with people. Yeah, right? Is this, does that feel good? Yeah. Is this weakness? Is what we're doing weakness? No. But is it strength? Is it strength? No, it's just a conversation. Like this, this is yeah. similar to most. Yeah. By the way, I can't show you Sneeko's chat just in case, but Sneeko's chat is like, He's uh, Sneeko's fucking. Oh, he loses debates every time. He shouldn't debate people. He sucks at debates. Sneeko always fails debates. Sneeko's not debating. He's curious and researching. He's open minded. Sneeko is open minded. He's open minded. He's open minded. You might not like his appearance. You might not like the way he presents himself, but he is very open minded. Sometimes too open minded but he is still more open-minded, right? He is curious. He was he was curious enough to make this thing happen. There would have been so many reasons not to talk to Dr. K, right? There would have been so many good reasons not to talk to him, but he's like, fuck it, I wanna talk to Dr. K. And he's being very respectful and he is actually admitting fault and he is being honest and transparent. It's really good. Okay. Right, so it's neither weakness or strength. Yeah. It's just we're connecting. Yeah. Feels good to connect. Yeah. Yeah. Boom, yeah. Does, it, yeah. does it make us weak to He also connect? overperforms. First, he's so ADHD, but he also overperforms. So now he's going to overperform his bashedness, in my opinion. It feels like now he's going to overperform it. So it almost seems like a joke. Like, ah. and that's what they do. It's like they, they like, oh, I'm tough, get caught, get bashful, and then get more goofy, right? The goofiness is also like, you know what I mean? Oh my gosh, we'd love to see it. No. Does it make us strong to connect? Um, neither. Well, yeah. yeah, it does, yeah, it does, yeah, it does, yeah, it does. Whoa, 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 how? What, what's so? Because uh, you're stronger in groups. So if I connect with somebody and then we, you know, we go for- Everyone in his chat is like, gay, 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 gay. Everyone in his chat is hating on him right now. Oh yeah, he really has little brother energy, doesn't he? That's why I call him my son, because I the first time I ever talked to him on his stream, his audience was like, she sunned you, bro, because he's like, let me fly you out. And I was like, what, Sneeko? Please, I'm your grandma. I'm your elder. No. And then his audience was like, she sunned you. She sunned you. I could never. This is what I'm saying. I don't know how you all sleep with 25, 26-year-olds. They're babies. This is how I see young people in general. Like, I like 
they're just young. They're just doing young people things, figuring it out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's just like figuring it out. You know what I mean? And again, like I've dealt, I guess I just deal with a lot of boys too in this age group because I have brothers and cousins, obviously. But like, they're just, you know what I mean? Like, mm. You know, Ren says you do have to be somewhat open minded to convert to Islam at an older age for sure. Just just not open minded in a way people like. That's true. He would have to be pretty open minded to go from Catholic to Islam. Like that's a pretty big deal, right? To go from Catholic to Muslim. That's a most Christians or most Muslims. If you're most people deviate back to the religion they were in to convert in general would be pretty open minded, right? To convert, to change political parties. Like you do have to have a variation of open mindedness, right? I think that's really important. Or there's two of us in, instead of one. So there's value to connection. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm not a baby, y'all babies. I look at myself and I knew I was a baby girl. Like, I look at old, like, um, dating shows and they're like, I'm 23 and I'm this girl. I'm like, you're a baby. Like, everyone's a baby. When you're almost 40, everyone feels like a baby. Dr. Kirk Honda talks about that. He calls 30-year-olds young. He's like, when you're really young and in your 30s. And I started laughing. He goes, well, I'm in my 50s, you know you're young and people in their 60s look at me like i'm a baby like i'm a child because i i'm not grown like they're grown i'm not grown like dr k is grown right like dr k is like 20 years older than me 15 years older than me like he's he's a different kind of grown we're both adults but we different types of grown okay so i, I think that like this is we're not doing therapy but i think that we just experienced what I would call one of the benefits of therapy, which is to be seen. Um, I'm closer to 40 than I am. Okay, I'm almost 35. So I'm basically 40, you know? So I know that, I know you're putting on an act. And yet, it feels good to like, see through it, right? Like I kind of saw through it. A little bit. And that feels good. I'm not, and this is the other thing is I'm not judging you for it. I'm not saying like, hey, bro, you're an asshole for doing this. Why do you do this? I don't get angry with you. I imagine a lot of people get angry with you. Yeah, that's true. And that must be tough for you. Uh, oh, maybe we'll talk about Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me rephrase. I'll let you cook. I'll let you cook. It, it, it used to be tough for you, but now you're better at it. Now you're stronger. Now you know how to pray and you have faith in God. So it's no longer a problem that people are angry, angry with you, right? Uh -huh. No, no. No, um, no, meaning what? Um, also, the kind of reason I laugh, I kind of like, um, I like making people react. Mm. I like, like, even if, if it's laughter, I have the same sort of reaction to when people get upset. I like being able to say stuff and then people go, huh? Or laugh or like, I like ha having an effect on people. He likes getting a reaction out of people, which is fair. Most entertainers do, right? Yeah. So like I, when I, I say like a, a racial slur and then people huh, like that's really fun for me. How do you how do you understand? So first of all, is that common for many? <laughs> Ripley says, Bray, I think you're just excited about being old and you work on the Internet with a bunch of youths. True. I am stoked about being old. I love aging. Dr. K is 41. I thought he was I thought he was 50. Oh, he's only 41. My bad. I thought he was looking good for 50, but he's just looking good in general. Okay, okay, Dr. K. Wait, he's only 41? He's my brother's age. No, really? I'm a Google. Hey, people? No, I don't think it's this common as, no, I don't think it's that common. Yeah, I, <gasps> I'd agree. Wait, Dr. K's a baby. I mean, he's an old man like me. Dr. K's my brother's age. Never mind, he's a baby. Oh my God, why did I think he was older than me by a lot? Oh my God, he more grown than me though. He's a little, he's ahead. I can see it. He's definitely ahead. What? We're babies. Dr. Kirkonda's in his 50s. Why did I think Dr. K was too? Dr. K looking good though. Okay, never mind. We're siblings. Never mind. We're besties. Dr. K and I are siblings. He's my sibling's age. Never mind. We're the same. He just, yeah, he has more tools. That's true, K. He has, he has very different tools. Yeah, he has, he has more tools than I do. That's what it is for sure. Maybe everyone likes it a little. Which I hope so, bro. It's, uh, you know, that's exciting for me. A little bit. A little, but I not like it more than most people, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, how I do, do you understand so. that? I don't know, it's just always been that way. It's always been that way. Are you interested in understanding it? Yes. Okay, so what? What's that expression? Sorry, Dr. K, Kirk, Dr. Kirk. Dr. Dr. Kirkonda, Dr. K. 
Just be clear. Um, because now it's like I'm thinking you're gonna like dig into my past to figure out like oh. why. why I, don't, that is. I don't need. To, I don't even know the answer. It's just, What's the answer? I'm not gonna tell you yet. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not gonna. You're, 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 we don't need to dig into your past. We don't need. We don't need to. Uh, we can do that if you want to, but we're gonna. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna figure it out together, right? Because connected, ape strong together. Right. Yes. Is that stronger work? together. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's think through it. Right. So um, and and see, even the way that I'm talking to you is changing. So what what have you noticed that I'm changing? Yeah, we have more uh, defense mechanisms, and now they're dropping. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, so so you know what I'm doing to drop your defense mechanisms? Um, you're saying things to make me feel welcomed and like I'm your understanding. Yeah, yourself. and what am I saying to you to make you feel welcome? Um, I, it's it's everything. Am I saying, it's, oh my God, Sneaker, you're so great. No, I no, love no. you. Like I'm not right. No. Uh, what I'm actually doing is I know the answer you don't, and I'm not going to tell you. Nya 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 nya. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. And somehow, like, you feel welcome with that. Like, let's play. Like, we're playing a game. You feel it? Well, because everybody likes talking about themselves, and that you—it's you know, you're, you're you told me that you're going to talk more about me in the future, and that's like everyone's favorite topic. Is it your favorite topic? No. No. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's everyone's favorite. Topic. Maybe I, I don't just make lied. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. Oh, but I, I think it's like, I think human beings like to understand themselves. I don't think that's unusual. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so let me ask you, so when, when you try to get a rise out of people, right? It can be negative. It can be positive. Yes. Okay. So let me ask you, so how does it feel to not, so when you get a rise uh, from someone. Is he, is he performative? See how I say he does this? He's performing. Okay, this is my theory of what he's doing right now. So now that he knows he slightly got vulnerable, he's performing vulnerability to kind of make Dr. K, this is a theory, feel less like he got Sneeko, right? So like when someone sees him, he plays a game where like, you didn't really see me. It was all act. I let you see me. And now he's going to play it up, right? Look at his body language. I don't think this is authentic. This is performative. But it's weirdly authentic because even when we perform, we're being authentic. We are performing what we think the audience wants and what will make it make them think what we want them to think. Because it's telling us something about what he's internally conflicted with, right? So right now he's going to perform vulnerability. Like look at the way he's rubbing his shoulder and he's like, oh, 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 oh. he's not really physically that uncomfortable, right? I'm going to say that that means that I'm... But he's also got ADHD, so play into it. But look at, look at the body language. It's slightly disrespectful, by the way, which slightly could knock Dr. K off his, like, confidence kilter because Dr. Gay got pretty... Dr. Gay. Dr. K got pretty confident right there, and Sneeko took that confidence, and now he wants to shatter it, which is something he does with people, right? Relating to you. I'm noticing you. I'm acknowledging you. Is that fair? Yeah. So if you don't get a rise out of people, how do you feel? Um, inadequate. Yeah. And right? it, it, uh, getting a rise doesn't just have to mean Damn, anger. Son, you just went, yeah, I know. But inadequate. Yeah. In inadequate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got there that fast. Like you remember, like I remember standing in circles at school and stuff like that. And like, there's like a group of people talking and then you say a joke and then nobody reacts. Or like you just say something and like that, like, am I here? Like, is, did anybody just hear what I said? Or like, am I invisible? And then someone repeats the joke louder and then they all get a laugh. Like, what the f yeah, that shit sucks. Yeah, right. So you feel invisible unless you get noticed. Um, and so like. You sure. Right. I, your words. I mean, I use the word notice, but you use the word invisible. Yeah. So, so, so now let's like kind of think about it. Right. So now like let's, there's a guy who goes out of his way. So at this moment, is Sneeko being natural with his body language or does he expect Dr. K to comment on the body language? Is Dr. K deliberately ignoring the body language or is Sneeko just being ADHD? Because fucking A, we're going to notice you, Sneeko. Right? You're going to make sure of that. Right. Right? And you kind of come out... <laughs> Stimming King, true. Charging. And we'll see if you flip back into that mode later. Okay. But 
you know, we'll see what your tolerance of, of vulnerability is. Yes. M maybe. But I, I, I think you're okay with this because I think you like to be seen. I think you're actually more okay with being vulnerable than you give yourself credit for. Right. But I think the, the biggest issue and what I noticed in Mecca was that, um, yes, that's true, but doing it for the right reasons. Like, I think it's okay to say a racial slur and, you know, if someone gets upset because my intentions are pure. It's just like, it's funny to me and it's funny to people who get it. But also the fact that if I do have eyes that I'm putting out the right message and that I'm influencing in the right way, that it's, it's not just like clamoring symbols like a loud monkey um, or getting, you know, there's some people that just turn it into a giant clown show um, that I'm doing something right. And that every time I speak that it's, in, you know, there is some something positive coming out of it. Sure. So it sounds like you, is this the first time you went to Mecca? Yes. Just came back. Yeah. And it sounds like it was quite a powerful experience for you. It was the most, yeah. Yes, Brit. I think he's uncomfy with opening up and being squirmy and somewhat goofy so he can say he wasn't being serious just in case. I think so too. I think it's like a defense mechanism because he doesn't want to look stupid. And also his chat is roasting him. Oh my God. It's so funny. He's got a really good like... Sneeko is really good at like handling being popular and famous and handling everything because most people would just like, this chat is intense, bro. This chat is intense. It's weird. It's like Sneeko doesn't want validation from just anyone. I think he is seeking validation from the right people to know if he's on the right path. And I think it does help um, to hear from a lot of people that he is. But there's a reason why like I don't, I'm not bothered by Sneeko. Again, I don't love the way he treats women. I think that's like the worst thing about him. Literally for me, the worst thing about him is the way he treats women. And then of course the way he treats himself, um, which probably starts with the way he treats himself because that's why he treats women. Anyway, and Dr. K sees it too. Um, but it's interesting because like there's still like so much curiosity in him. Um, and he's very open and he's really good. Like he he's not combative with people that he respects to some degree. And I appreciate that about him because um, that means he has a standard. Whether or not we agree with the standard, it means there is one. He's not just like combative with everyone. He's not like a feral dog. He like has a standard of like, these are the people that I look up to. Everyone else, you're a joke. Everyone else, I'm smarter than you. But these people, I'll listen to them for a second. Tell me, what do you know that I don't know? You know? Yeah, most powerful. I, I haven't even fully talked about it yet. Yeah, it, it was like one of the most... It was the, the best experience of my life. Yeah, so like now I can see that you're more centered, right? And now you're sort of saying like, okay, like if my intentions are pure and like all this other stuff, which is cool. But like you were you were clowning long before that, right? You were getting rises out of people long before you met, went to Mecca and, and understood everything that you've understood now. Yeah, since I was like four years old, I used to uh, like tell knock jock jokes like there's... Um, I would, yeah, always. I, I was always like making uh, stand up comedy type jokes uh, since I was like three. Yeah. Like, Can I, I ask I, you about what growing up was like for you? That's like, oh my God. Like, um, growing up was good. Growing up was, you know, I grew up in a, um, around Connecticut and New York, um, New Haven, you know, a pretty mixed, diverse, um, two parent household, really good parents, um, and feel Siblings? pretty. Yeah, siblings, older sister, younger brother. And and what will you say? You feel pretty. Um, I'm very grateful that I have really good parents, and I still do. And what they, made your parents really good? They sacrificed a lot in order to raise us properly, and they they put 100 percent into parenting. And I think that's pretty rare. I, I don't. My parents are still together, and like it's it's very rare that I meet any people that still have parents that are together. Mm -hmm. I love my parents. And, and when you say they sacrificed a lot, can you share a little bit about that? Do you feel comfortable? Yeah, I mean, I think that they. They chose to, you know, they didn't go out and party ever. You know, they don't really have that many friends. They didn't really have like a, that much of a social life or a life outside of raising their, their children. Like that was their one number one priority. Like they didn't, they weren't that, they weren't selfish whatsoever. Okay. And what was school like for you? Um, school you were the was. the class clown? Was that? You were the class clown? Yeah, later on, I wasn't as funny earlier, but then I did get funny and then I was a class clown. Like I had I had ups and downs. Like I tried to be, I was like fourth, fifth grade. I was like tried to be the class clown more than I was. It was, it was cringe, but then like I, I developed a good uh, flow. Yeah. And and what was, what was like, what were your friends like? You know, things like that. 
Um, diverse friend group, and we used to make like really fucked up jokes. Like uh, my best friends when I was younger, um, a Jewish guy and a black guy. And um, I was more Asian when I was younger, so they would always call me. Uh, ancestors died building on, the railroads, and I would make Holocaust jokes, okay. and then I'd make slave jokes, and then we would, we would just—it was just brutal, like just just trashing each other all day long and trying to make each other cry and laugh. And and do you have a sense of what about that? Kind I've used uh, Lila says, I feel like Sneagle craves a parental figure. He always seems, he always seems to seek out guidance. You know, what's interesting is I think he's not looking for a parental figure. I think he's looking for like a mentor because parental figures are not mentors, even though they can be, I think a mentor can sometimes be a parent figure, but I had like, um, I had great parents and, but I needed mentors, like people outside of my parents, right? Because I needed somebody who could see me separate from how my parents saw me. So I kind of think he needs a mentor in a way that helps ground him. And I wonder if like Dr. K could be that guy. I don't know. And that's the thing is like, what's a mentor, right? Um, for me, I definitely needed mentors outside my parents, you know? And I think you can have a mentor who's a parental figure, but I, I never needed a mentor who was exactly a parental figure. I needed a mentor that was like not a parental figure because I already had very strong parental figures. You know what I mean? But I, yeah, I think he does need that. He needs like a mentor or something for sure, which is why he went to Andrew Tate, which is even why he went to me, which is why he's going to Dr. K. He's looking for somebody. And um, I, I really hope he finds them. Like I really hope he finds them. Kind of humor resonated with you? I think it was bonding over the fact that uh, you can say fucked up things and it doesn't have to come from a bad place because the teachers would always try to censor and say, you can't say this, you can't say that, don't do this, don't do that. But deep down, you, all, you know, oh, well, my intentions are pure just because I say something doesn't mean I mean it. You know, it doesn't have to dictate what my belief system is. And, and so have you been judged a lot for what you say? Yeah, <laughs> I got canceled off every day. Yeah. And FYI, apparently people in Discord are telling me there might be some section of this talk where I might need to mute it on my end, listen first, and maybe go back and show you. I just don't want to get demonetized or slash break TOS on my end. So if he tell if he says anything being the reason he got TOS'd and kicked off YouTube, like I'm going to mute this stream. So just FYI. How do you understand that? How do I understand? What do you mean? Like, what's that like for you to be um, judged for what you say? I think it's a big responsibility because, I mean, obviously it's a bigger platform than just being like a class clown. Uh, a lot of people listen. I think one of the biggest um, shifts in my perspective was I was at a baseball game with Lil Pump and I it was in between the innings or something. We're walking to the hot dog stand and then like these 11 year olds come up to me and they start like, they, they get really excited. They're like three, three or four, like they must have been fifth, sixth grade and they go, fuck the women, fuck the women. And I'm like, what? I'm like, no, I'm like fuck transgenders. I'm like. This is, he's talking about that famous clip that went viral of the children he had, who were in his audience, you know what I mean? No, 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 fuck the gay people. I'm like, no, no, we love- We're pro LGBT here on this channel, thank you. Everyone, we love everyone. Just like, they were all excited. I'm like, is this what they get from my <laughs> But I think it was equally like good and bad because they were also, they were joking, they were trying to be, they literally like reminded me exactly of how I was at 10, 11 years old. And it looks bad because it's on camera because people are like, this is what he's making them believe. Like, this is not what they believe. It's just something that adolescent boys all kind of go through. I think that's true. I think, I think that is true. But also it is what people say in their household. Like conservative households, that's how they talk. Again, I don't know how you think Republicans and conservatives aren't voting against your LGBT rights and they're not in their home saying F LGBT people. Like what, how do you think I was raised my whole life? with religious people and they all talk shit on you guys and me while I'm there at the dinner table. While three of my parents' queer kids were at the dinner table, my parents actively talked about denying us civil rights because they love us so much. They love us like Christ does. So they're going to deny us our right to marry and have abortions and everything else because that's what people do. They love you and the road to hell is paved in good intentions. And I think it's good that they found a vessel within my, my videos to... Uh, to find a similar sense of humor. So actually, at first I was a little shook, and then it made me really happy. And I, I, I think about those, think about those guys a lot, and I hope they're doing well. But it, it okay. is, it is reassuring that. Well, not reassuring, but it's like it gives you a little responsibility. Like, okay, like everything I say and do, like I should have something, something positive there because I'm influencing the youth. You know, whether or not a lot of people like to admit it, or how much they try to cancel or silence or censor. 
Brit, you're so right, but a wise person isn't going to give you some exciting, crazy answer. It's going to be basic balance shit, which is kind of boring. That's the part of humility that comes into introspection that I think is difficult, is we do think we're waiting for this big, amazing, magical answer. It's why when people hear that I have a level system, one through five, they're like, how do I get to five? And I'm like, why does it matter? Because like, if you think getting to five is going to be this magical, amazing answer, ooh, Habibi, I wish... I wish it's just a tool by bros. There is no magical great answer. Radical acceptance, love thy neighbor, love thyself, be kind, find balance. Like, you know what I mean? This idea that there's like this great, amazing like answer. It's like, it's all out there. All the information you need is already out there in the world. It's whether or not you pick up the tool. There is no mystery that, that, humans are trying to solve when it comes to the basics that hasn't been solved, right? It's just a matter of whether or not you utilize the tool. And most of humanity isn't ready. Most of humanity isn't ready to utilize the tools because they're going on journeys and they're babies and they have their own traumas and their own limitations. And you know what I mean? Just because Dr. K found his answers with his tools doesn't mean those tools will work for Sneeko. Or maybe they will, right? Ah, Brit says Sneeko is a social adrenaline junkie. He wants excitement. That's very possible. Like people who want toxic relationships because the back and forth. Like people who ask me, are you going to get bored in your relationship because it's healthy? It's like, ooh, girl. Mm. Colleen, I think you're right. I don't think he's ready yet. He enjoys the class clown. Roll a little too much still, maybe in time. I agree, bro. I'm very excited to see him. That's why I keep saying give him nine, ten, eight years. Give him some time, bro. Let him cook, you know, let him cook, you know. Answer like there's, you know, um, what I say is influential. Yeah. And, and in what way or would you say you're influencing them? Um, I think I'm helping them embrace their their boyhood in, in, a, in a generation where it's really suppressed, where men are becoming... Mm. Ripley says, I don't think it's true because they are in a bubble of Sneeko's extreme jokes, but I don't think it's intrinsic to young men outside of this bubble. I see it across many bubbles. It's not every boy bubble, but it does seem pretty common for young adolescent men in America to share some. They have like men are the the audiences for like video games and certain types of humor and certain kinds of comedians. Like we have data to show that men overall males do enjoy a certain type of humor that is unlike what generally speaking women enjoy and I'm fine generalizing these types of things because I think it's like telling about sort of what people find funny and when you deviate from the norm um I think that is true like I think I think it is pretty common in a lot of it, it seems to be pretty common from everyone I know even my international cousins and stuff they have some universal boy traits but I'm not saying it's like one-to-one -one every boy, obviously. But I do think the men that I know who aren't into that humor are considered the anomaly. And even the guys, even I was into that humor growing up. You know, I'm into it now a little bit growing up, depending on how you have that conversation, because I think there's a way to have it. You know what I mean? But like not believing it. Humor is one thing. Belief is another. But like video games, gaming lobbies, um, I don't know. It seems like pretty common amongst people to want to make fun of people. And I think it's like nobody wants to feel trapped. So when you feel trapped, you say the most like heinous shit to feel like you have some control in the world. So it's a pretty young person attitude. It's like pretty immature. But also it's pretty common amongst people who like want to have a sense of control. Right. And so that's how I view it more. Like I think like I have dark humor. I have like raunchy humor. I think it's like a desperate attempt to have control and or something you think is funny, you know, and I do think that like everything is a construct so even the words we use are constructs and I think little kids kind of feel a desire for adults to admit out loud like none of this matters right it doesn't mean anything but also it does mean something because we've decided it does and that's kind of what's difficult right I think if you grow up in a conservative bubble you gravitate more towards it I think that's probably also true yeah I think that's probably also true yeah I agree with that more feminine where we're told to to cry more and talk about our feelings more. Though I will say, if you look at liberal comedians who were not conservative growing up, they also use this humor. So I think it's like rebellious people. 
people who like want to like poke society and be like, oh, look what I did. And comedians are like 13 year old boys. Where, you know, gender Even the girls. ideology is pushed where, and, you know, inherently like no 12 year old boy believes in that. They don't believe in any of that. Uh, they, they think it's garbage, they think it's stupid, and they don't want to make racist jokes, and they just want to um, be unapologetic and be themselves. And they're, they're, we're trying to mold boys into something that they're not, and it's making a lot of people unhappy, and they, I don't think a lot of people see what's going on. When you say it's making a lot of, uh, when, when we're molding boys and- Just a reminder, there's a crisis in the world and it's the meaning crisis. Look at John Verveke's work. It's great. The meaning crisis on YouTube. To what they're not, right? So th this is, this is not, th th that's the side that's winning right now, which is not your side, right? Right, right. The godless side. And, and when, when, when the, the godless side is succeeding, what, what happens? <laughs> when we get, we, when we get boys to talk about their feelings or men to talk about their feelings. Then the woman controls the relationship then you become deeply unhappy, you become weaker, it shows in your body, uh, the way you speak, you become more of a snake, you, you just become less of a um, man. Um, I don't wanna brag, but I've been working out and I'm pretty sure I could take Sneeko in a fight. I don't wanna brag, um, but I've been like working out and I'm pretty sure I could take Sneeko in a fight. Let's go, me and you in the ring, my bro. Let's go, my bro, me and you in the ring, my bro. I don't wanna brag, but I'm pretty sure. I could take Sneak on a fight. And I'm 5'1 and three quarters, girls. I am 5'1 and Harry Potter three quarters. Okay, girls? I could 100% take Sneak on a fight. Okay? I could 100% take him. And, and, and you're not leading like the way you don't lead anymore. You're not leading the so charge. So talking about your feelings, is it, it means that you become submissive? <sighs> yeah. because Sneeko is kind of submissive and breedable, in my opinion. You know? you're submitting to a person instead of to God. So it, it, like you opening up in that vulnerable way uh, to that extent, it, 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 yeah, yes. Okay. Um, so if we're- Oh, why is he obsessed with racist jokes? Because, because he has a relationship with his race. I think racist jokes are for the adolescents, especially deciding like how to be normative. Like Sneeko's mixed. He doesn't fit into any bubble. He was raised into a bubble where, like, nobody wanted to embrace him fully. You know, he's, like, not black enough, not white enough, not Asian enough. He's never enough for people. He's never enough. And when you, you know, sort of have that relationship with the world where you're not enough, when he's an other, that's why he was featured in one of my podcasts, when you're never enough for one group of people and people are always questioning your validity, um... Yeah, you grow up with like a relationship with like, what is racism? I don't even believe in racism. I'm cool. I don't even believe in it. Or like, I'm cool. Everyone's racist. And honestly, like, I think everyone is probably racist or at least prejudiced or biased because we're just humans. We're not racist in the traditional sense. But I do think as a person who's been in enough rooms with enough ethnicities and diversity, Brown people be just as racist as white people. I'm sorry. Y'all talk way too loudly in front of me. Just like all the men I know who tell me their fucking secrets. And I'm like, do you hear yourselves? Like people, they, you know, when shit is quiet and they think the right people are listening, people tell you shit. Okay. And you're like, whoa, bro. That's why I say you got to transcend all this to realize like this is a construct race is a construct, gender is a construct. Having this relationship where you're saying men do this and whites do this and blacks do this, that is just, that is just limiting your perception. It's fine to acknowledge it as real because I'm a Syrian. You can't take that away from me, but it's also a construct that like, this is what we call these people from this region. And this is what we've dubbed these people from their, like, this is identity issues are part of everyone's story. And that's where race, racism and prejudice and bias come in is like identity is how we form our realities. As much as conservatives say it isn't, as much as Sneeko says like identity doesn't matter, what is, what is he, a man? If identity doesn't matter, then I'm gonna start using she, her pronouns with Sneeko, right? But like that's not gonna work. Andrew Tate needs you to know he's a man. Myron, well mine's a better example because I think Andrew Tate's also grifting, but Myron needs you to know he's a man. So he cares about identity. Because if I went around calling him she, her, he would kick me off that podcast if I was ever guesting. You feel me? We're not supposed to talk about our feelings. What are we supposed to do with them? I think there's better, like, I, I see 
I think joking is a way, like there, there's better ways to talk about your feelings rather than, than crying in front of a therapist. Like I think stand-up stand -up comedians, for example, are all fucked up. Like the best stand-up comedians have mm -hmm. like all this trauma and stuff like that. And they, they put that into their craft. And I think that's a really effective way of turning uh, trauma, turning problems into something that's positive. They, they're spreading laughter. All of them, like if you go to a stand-up comedy show, I used to do it a lot when I was in New York. So, if, um, Brittany, one day someone's going to be like, okay, fight me. I'll fight them, bro. I'll fight them right now. But um, I have fibromyalgia and um, I'm mentally ill. So, like, can you really trust me? Can you trust me? But also, I'll fight you right now, bitch. I'll fight you right now. Um, and then COVID <laughs> happened. I was standing there and these people are just talking about their parents and their drug addictions and their relationships. And just, like, they, and then they find, like, a way to, to make fun of it. Instead of feel bad about it, they just kind of, like, make light of it and they you it's therapeutic to be able to share that information with strangers and then laugh about it and then you feel better after because you're not like uh, everybody's a little racist yeah yeah um, avenue q was like the shit when i was in high school everyone thought avenue q was like mind-blowing mind-blowing like everyone thought avenue q was like the most like literally what bottling it down but even then you don't just need to do it in stand-up comedy like sometimes you'll see like the super jack guy in the gym and he's deadlifting like 400 pounds you go, rah, rah. it used to be me I, and you're kind of like all that whatever's going on you're letting it out in the gym or when when i'm sparring too like you know sometimes you get into a mode where you're angry and you're thinking about something that happened what happened at work and you just you know you, you let it out there and afterwards you shake hands with the person you might have a bloody nose you might have hit you too and you it, in that moment, now you're stronger, you know, you're better at fighting and you've let it out. And I think you need all of these things and some therapy might not like might make it better. I love this, by the way, this bubble. I love the let's fight it out. Let's have good energy like I but I grew up kind of like a boy. So like I get it I, a little bit. But like I do love that shit. It makes me feel really good when I'm like wrestling people and fighting people. Something about the adrenaline, something about, like a wholesome consensual fighting. I'm OK. I'm going to grow up. But like, you know, wrestling and like it just it feels good. A healthy way so i think there's healthier ways to express negative feelings i just think you need all of the tools you need the therapy again mental health you have to have a good relationship with it and sometimes that takes some science sometimes that takes a relationship with knowing trauma and sometimes that takes some knowledge of knowing your past and sometimes like and then you have to do philosophy right but then you also have to take care of your physical health which by the way physical health coincides with happiness like we need like we need physical, we need to work out. We need to have a relationship with our bodies. It absolutely correlates to your mental health and your spiritual health. Or channel that energy then. Which is why people get trapped in the, I just need this. I just need this. You need it all, bros. I'm so sorry. You got, you need it all. You can't just do the physical health. That's why the memes at the gym are like mental health. Like the gym is just a place for mentally ill people to hang out. The gym is full of body dysmorphia. The bim, gym, body dysmorphia, dysphoria. Dysmorphia, dysphoria. I always forget the difference. Um, dysmorphia. I have notes I wrote down. Okay, so like the gym is full of mentally ill people. They talk about it all the time in like gym bro culture. Like there is definitely a lot of mental illness there. That's why they go to the gym every day. That's why they eat and breathe like their protein and whatever out. Like it's a thing. So you have to be really careful. But that's why you need it all. You need everything. You need all mental health, spiritual health, physical health, financial health. Who are you in the anime? You need it all, girls. Therapy. Okay. Um, can I think for a second? Yeah. Do you have any questions for me, by the way, so far? Have I changed your mind on anything? No. Okay. Um, uh, how long have you been doing this? Look, look, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Are, are you under the impression that I don't already agree with you about most of what you're saying? I was under that impression. Your... I was under that yeah. impression, yeah. I mean, am I, is anything that I'm saying? So like, for example, when you talk about like, well, let me just toss a couple things out. So I, I completely agree with you that I think comedy can be very therapeutic. I think exercise can be very therapeutic. I think prayer can be very therapeutic. I think we have tons of scientific studies that support BDSM can be very therapeutic, just not therapy. All of those things. We actually know that those are all very effective ways to manage mental health. And I think the other things that we know are that. By the way, his chat is currently roasting him for being a fake Muslim. And I love that because it's true. It's not exclusive to that. And in fact, I would say the mind is probably the organ of the body that can benefit from the most diverse kinds of things. 
as well as the optimal function of the mind requires a diversity of different things to be healthy. The mind actually needs the most balanced diet out of every organ in our body. I think humor, for example, is a very well-documented defense mechanism. When I have patients that I work with, we oftentimes with the male patients, I will make dick jokes <laughs> and we will talk about making dick jokes. <laughs> the way he laughed at dick jokes, bro. And we will even do it very intentionally. Uh, and so after we go into a deep part of therapy where we're talking about something raw and real, we will- Yes, Nova, my ex was super hot and muscular and went to the gym like every day. His mental health was awful. And he constantly complained about being ugly and fat. Literally, bro. Literally. We'll do something called come up for air by making a dick joke. Can you and tell I'll me like, what's, your, what's your best dick joke? Um, let me think about what's my best dick joke. Very important stuff right here. <laughs> I hope Sneeko gets something out of this, even if he isn't completely open, but I guess you have to be open to that. I mean, I think he's open-minded enough. I think he's taking it in. And I've seen that with the way that he's like interacted with me and other people. I do think he takes it in, but I think he likes people who like walk the walk. So he has an idea of like, he likes discipline. But also he's struggling to find himself. He's a little lost bean, which makes sense. I mean, I felt like I was really lost in my life until I hit about 30. So I'm always open to people having like a long journey. Some people are lost at 80. Some people are lost at 60. I don't think people are always like lost. I don't think it's just a matter of like, how do you need to engage with them? It, you don't have to save them just because somebody else or you don't, you can't save them and you don't have to keep giving them tools. Right. Like it's just up to like you're allowed to have boundaries with people. Right. You do not just because somebody else has patience with Sneeko doesn't mean you have to just because like, you know what I mean? That's just not how it works. It's just a matter of knowing that just because it's too much for you doesn't mean it's too much for others. Just because like I have a shortcoming with certain people doesn't mean those people can't have people who can help them. Mr. Girl could be like he can take a tool and be better. Like people can take a tool like Destiny can take a tool and be better. Um, Lav can take a tool and be better. It's just up to them. And just because like I blocked, you know, Mr. Girl Lav doesn't mean other people have to block them. You know what I mean? Like they don't ha like it doesn't have to be that way. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. He's really thinking. <laughs> OK, that one I can't say. <laughs> you can say it. Uh, we're on Rumble. I don't know. I, I, I have. I, That's the I one I want to hear. I want to hear the one you can't say. I know. Let me think. Let me see if I've got about it. Oh my god, this is silly. Move on. <sighs> Move on. I, I I I I don't. So so there's one there's one that came to my mind, but usually the dick joke that I make is is like in line with what we're talking about. Okay. Right. So like, um, you know, like it's hard it's hard to describe. But like you know, you can make dick jokes about whatever we're talking about. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not like I have a dick joke, and it's like, hey, we just talked about your childhood trauma. Let me tell you a joke. Yeah, knock, yeah. knock. Knock, knock. Yeah. Who's there? Your dick. Nice. Boom, <laughs> Nice. Right? Okay. That's a good one. Because you went. No, I, di I didn't block Steven. Steven blocked me. <laughs> I didn't block him. He blocked me. No, I didn't block him. I blocked Lav and Mr. Girl. You bitches are blocked. Okay. To therapy and it got lopped blocked. off. And now what? I was dangling out here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't even, that's a fucking awful joke, but it's just an example. No, of, that was like a fine, like, that, that was better that was than what I was, was thinking. Like a, for that, all was this a good, that was a good dad joke. This is like a dad dick joke. I thought that was good. Yeah. I mean, if, if you want to, I'll, you know, if we get into something deep, I'm sure that my mind will, will come up with one. And okay. And I'll share it with you at the time. Okay. Um, and, so... Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't actually disagree with a lot of what you're saying. I, I think, uh, oh, I'd say that if anything, I think that your understanding of things I would describe as incomplete, not incorrect. Okay. Um, can you well, anyway? That's that's. Can you, can you explain that? Why incomplete, not incorrect? Uh, so I, I, that's what I was thinking about, and I'm, I'm going to get to. And that's when I asked you, uh, you, do you, do you have any questions for me? How long have you been doing this? What do, What do you mean by this? Um, talking to people crying on a couch. Ooh, Kessler says, do you have a go-to anime when you think about who you are in the anime? I'm guessing mother type character. I like anime. Um, I have two 
two people that I think of the most, but they're mostly my future self more than the present self because I still am growing and like seeking wisdom. But I think of two characters. I think of Ponyo's mom. Oh, they're both Ghibli characters. I think of Ponyo's mom. And I think of um uh is Zaniba Zanib hold on Zaniba is is what are the sisters' names on Spirited Away? Spirited Away. Oh, psychotherapy. Oh, psych psychiatry. Uh okay, so so I I became a medical doctor. Uh has it been? I became a medical doctor. Yeah, so Zeniba and what's Ponyo's mom's name? After nine years ago, I started doing psychotherapy eight years ago. I started to do psychotherapy very seriously seven years ago. And then I became a fully trained psychiatrist five years ago. Do you notice a common theme when you talk to streamers? Her name is Gran Mamar. I like her. Those are the two that I think of the most. But they're kind of like future me, right? And that's what my siblings call me. My siblings call me Zaniba. Um, and sometimes Yubaba, if I'm being honest. I have two personalities, right? My now self is more Yubaba than Zaniba, but I'm slowly on a spectrum going towards Zaniba. And I think that's probably the most honest is that I'm always growing, changing, but I'm too young, guys. I don't know how to say this to you. I'm young as fuck. And so I am not in my, like, I'm not wise. You know, I don't have it yet. I don't have the years. I don't have the time. Um, like, I'm still young. So I'm more you, my Yubaba stage. But I'm definitely, like, I'm definitely, like, halfway through the spectrum, right? If, like, okay, but I'm heading to Zaniba, girls. I'm heading, I'm landing in Zaniba at some point in my life. Okay? Yes, many. What is it? Uh... <clears throat> Like when you talk to streamers, uh, I mean, so many. So, like do you keep a giant baby pillow in your room? Um, no. Are you referencing Yubaba's son? I don't keep any pillows. We don't have pillows in the house except the ones we sleep on. We are a pillowless house, not on purpose. It just like they're kind of cluttery to me. Like, are you talking about specifically about streaming or no, no, no. when you talk to live streamers? Because I've seen like that's one of your consistent. Yeah. Do you notice a common theme that's separate from other people? What do you notice about streamers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Can you? So I, I think at the top of the list is like we're all misfits to society. Like we can't. The reason we become successful at streamers is because we get rejected by the rest of the world in some way. And then there's something about us that is busted in school in nine to fives in standard jobs. And so we start streaming and then something about this environment fits like a glove. So it's not one example of that. So that's the overarching theme if you want one, but there are all kinds of different examples of that. So one is that the prevalence of ADHD among streamers, yep. I think is way higher than the regular population. You think ADHD is real? Yes. Okay, they, they told me I had ADHD when I was like nine and ten. I used to take Ritalin and saw that stuff. I think it's, uh, I think it's a lot. From one neurodivergent to another. My bro. Even, um, yeah, even, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, look, I'm, I'm working on getting formally tested for a bunch of stuff because I swear to God, if I could get on meds and be 10% more productive, I'm going to rule the fucking world. Y'all better watch out because if I could have 10% more focus, I could literally take over the world move the fuck over like i oh if i could get 10 percent more focus mm. lie it's especially because the fact that they say it's like a deficit the, the, the fact that they say it's a disorder i think is garbage it's not a disorder it's just a different way of thinking i actually think it's a superpower i think it's oh so he doesn't have adhd oh he does have adhd oh i actually think it's a superpower this is what's the, this is a relationship you have to have with your neurodivergency because sometimes i cry Sometimes I'm so frustrated with my limitations. Sometimes I'm so frustrated with my fibromyalgia. Sometimes I'm so frustrated. I'm like, just do the thing, Brittany. And my body's like, mm. or we could sit on the floor in the fetal position and cry. And I'm like, mm, okay, listen. <laughs> okay, like just, and look, I can willpower through a lot of circumstances. When I need to, when it's life or death, I willpower through a lot. But holy fuck, when I'm just trying to like listen brain, and that's why I think my brain and my body are like so specifically different than my consciousness, because I'll be watching myself and I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? 
What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And even I'm so proud of Tom Fullery because he recently talked about this on stream, how he convinced himself for 20 years he had cured his ADHD. And then he realized like, no, I'm not functioning the same way. Like I should be doing differently or better. What am I doing? So he's trying to get back on meds, which I think is really amazing because I've seen meds really help people. You don't need meds for your ADHD, obviously, or, or for your neurodivergency, whatever it is. But it's kind of cool that we do have some meds that seem to help some people. And so I think that's pretty exciting. Um, and I'm not saying I have ADHD or autism or anything. It's just that it runs in my family enough that I'm like, okay, I probably have something. I could probably use some meds if maybe it helps. But otherwise, like, I'm good with therapy. Like, if there's some, like, like if I could be 10% more productive, holy fuck, bro. And I already pushed myself to be, like, really productive in my mind. Obviously, I work seven days a week. I'm, like, hustling. I'm pretty happy about that. But also, you know. So anyways, I think that, like, cope of, like, it's a superpower. I don't think it's a superpower. But I do think being a minority allows you a tool that neurotypicals don't get automatically that you get usually automatically because you're a minority um, as a neurodivergent person. But I also think like black people get it. I think minority people get it. I think like disabled people can get it. I think that thing that makes you feel like you have a superpower is also the thing that gives you a tool into introspection. And it allows you to be more self-aware. It allows you to have this idea of like people in the world around you. So I, I do think it can feel like a superpower. Like you're a lot of neurodivergent people I know, not all of them, obviously, some of them are very aware of like what's happening in a room over neurotypical people. And those are the people I gravitate towards the most. So you know what I mean? It's a gift. And calling it a disorder is uh, is incorrect. Yeah. So, so I, I think that that too is not something that I entirely disagree with. I wouldn't say you're wrong about that. I, oh. I've worked with many people, myself included, who are probably somewhere on the ADHD spectrum, and I've come to see the way that my mind works as a gift. At the same time, so I think this is one area in which I would, if I had to judge what you say, one area in which you're incomplete is that you tend to make a lot of generalizations. So I don't hear in you that ADHD is variable amongst different people. I don't hear that conception when you speak. So I, you say, it wasn't a disorder for me, which is fair enough. Ritalin for me didn't work, which is fair enough. But you don't know what the experience of everyone else with ADHD is like. And for some people, it is a crippling disorder. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by crippling disorder is that they cannot function in the world because they cannot get their mind to focus. Yeah, like literally, I mean, it's such, such a spectrum. Um, I think of like my sibling who has ADHD, like it's a struggle, my bros. It's a struggle. Like it's a struggle. It's interesting too, because it makes sense for, um, a lot of the reasons he struggled, but also he made up for it in a lot of ways, but also it's really difficult, but you can see it in him for sure, which is interesting. Yeah, it is fascinating. And I'm like, I see some parts of that in myself, but not like to his extent. And then I see that's the problem is like, um, when you're a little bit like when you're very functional or very good at masking, it's also hard as a woman to get diagnosed. So I'm a little afraid because like I don't know if you guys do this as women, but do you ever go to a therapy office and put on your best self, which means they are not going to see anything diagnosable because like when I'm at home and I'm completely unmasked, like completely 1000 percent, like you guys think I'm bad on stream when I'm at home. And now that I have a husband who looks at me and goes, huh? And I'm like, what? What? And then I'm like, oh, like here's somebody who like sees me so unmasked, like that I'm I'm just like, I'm obviously I'm not neurotypical. So it's like, oh, what is it? I'm just curious on what it is so I can know if I can make me like stronger, better, smarter, faster. But it's interesting. It's interesting. Like when you when you go to a therapy office and you put on your best face and then you self-sabotage because like now they can't fucking you can't explain. You know what I mean? Anyways, in the worst cases of ADHD, I think that that puts the blame on something that's genetic or something that's innate rather than just saying it's misled focus mis or like misdirection. For example, this is a guy on Twitter, Brute, and he talks about how a meth head is almost identical. To OK, really fast. This conception of neurodivergency is fine, but I do kind of think it's a cope in a way, because, again, as like um, what I think about. When I think about like what is life, 
and what is the struggle of life and what makes life more unique to one person or another. And I think about the consequences sort of like being a person. I think it's kind of a cope to say like, oh, I'm just born different and like ADHD people don't have anything going on that's different. I think that's possibly true, but not really at the same time. I mean, I know some people with ADHD that are so crippled because of the specific thing called ADHD that like, you know, uh, they forget to eat or uh, grooming is really difficult. Same with autism. It's like some people with autism have a really hard time grooming, a really hard time like, you know what I mean? It's like if they didn't have this thing, would they be a different person? And it's like kind of, sort of, depending on how you have a relationship with it. Some people feel like they are their diagnosis and some people feel like they are them and then there's their diagnosis. And I think it's probably dependent on the person and the relationship they're having with said thing. But I do, th I do believe in these things. And I think it's an interesting, a very complicated thing to talk about. Um, cause I know we talked about even like having children older, like I don't really believe there's a lot of health complications for most people. I think it's sort of a rumor, but then the truth is, is that women who are older, Dr. K said it himself, women who have children older, men and women who have children older, they often have like kids with autism and ADHD. And it's like, would you, do you consider that a negative? And it's probably more of a negative than a positive overall, Right. Um, even men, if you smoke, you are more likely to give your kids ADHD, right? Which kind of makes sense because my dad used to smoke way back in the day before he had me. And so like your sperm is impacted. It's not just the woman. Men are also impacting. Obviously, it's your genes too. So it's kind of one of those things where as an older person, are you willing to accept that your children might have a version of ADHD or autism that is so severe that they are disabled under every criteria of disabled to a point where when you die, you better find a housing for them and care for them and love for them. And same with young people who have babies. Like, I don't know if people have children always thinking their kids will be completely healthy or independent, but plenty of people struggle no matter the child you're having. I always think if I have a baby and I have to fund this baby after I die, right? Like, what do I do with that? And I think that's kind of how I look at parenthood. When I think about having a baby, I think, what if I have a baby that needs financial care even after I die? Can I afford that? Can I justify bringing that baby into the world? Because again, what happens to that baby after I die and after my husband dies? And what if none of our family is alive? What if you have no family? What happens to that baby? And I think we just assume we'll always have a healthy baby. But like, what if you're that person who doesn't? You know what I mean? You know, to a Elon Musk CEO billionaire, a meth head has all this energy that instead of he's putting into a Fortune 500 company, he's just putting it into the pipe. You know, he's digging holes in the backyard looking for China. As soon as you put that guy in the right direction and you can put him to something where he could direct all that meth energy, something that's positive. He's the same. Like those people are very are very similar. The two sides of the same coin. Yeah, and so, so they have more in common the, the, with the average person. The, 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 that's what confuses me because I would com agree with you 100%. I mean, the majority of clinical practice that I've done is like actually addiction psychiatry. And I would completely agree with you that the majority of my patients who are addicted to stuff have an immense amount of energy, are incredibly resilient, um, are oftentimes highly intelligent, and helping them channel that into healthier things leads to excellent outcomes. I wouldn't disagree with that at all. But why are generalizations like that a bad thing? Because like, I, I don't think there's anyone that said there's no exception for cancer. You know, cancer is something that you it just happens, right? There's not oh, cancer was actually really good for my lungs. You know, hold on, hold on, hold okay, on. So, okay. So I have spoken with a ton of patients that I was very confused by. When oh, dooms! Great question, Brittany. What's an example of a good mother? Um. I think that's a really nuanced question and it would take up way too much of the stream to answer it. Um, but ultimately, if I was going to make a really like simplified version of what I think a good parent is, it's someone who considers the thoughts, feelings, psychology and physical health of their child, basically all parts of the child um, to a degree almost beyond their own. But I would say a best form of parenthood or a best kind of parent is a person who tries their best and really considers 
that their kid is like a consciousness all on their own. And I just don't think a lot of parents realize that. I think a lot of parents see their kids as an extension of themselves, um, which is why people have babies. It's like they want to procreate their own seed and make something that looks like them. So I think the most considerate parent is a parent who really recognizes like their child is their own person. And then after that, it's like, you know, it's a little it's a little complicated of a story or answer. When they would say things like cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'd be like, bro, what are you talking about? Right. And then I would listen to them. And that's when there are cases of cancer where like, here I am, I'm 36. I'm not taking care of myself. I'm not taking care of my family. I'm like, ah, like whatever life is like, whatever. I'm bitching all the time. Like I'm not really doing anything my, with my life. And then you sell, tell someone, hey, you could have one year to live. And they're like, oh, shit. Like, I've got one year to live and like, I don't want to die. Like, I hate my life, but I don't want to die. I want to live. And then six months later, after chemotherapy, they have a surgical resection. They, they shrink the cancer, they remove it from the body, and then they discover that you're cancer free. And suddenly someone is like, thank God. I was dead at 35 and at 36 post cancer, I'm starting to live life. I've started. Well, it's because of that idea too, that like conflict breeds like success or innovation or thoughtfulness or you know what I mean there's something about that right doom says I've always have to treat my mom like a little kid and I hate it I just can't unsee the insecure little girl in there that was clearly not ready to get married hey sometimes we parent our parents man I parent my parents sometimes sometimes it's necessary like my parents are grown but there's always a little kid inside of all of us just like Sneeko Dr. K is talking to the little kid inside of Sneeko right now. The biggest, the most beautiful thing a, ch parent, a child can do is remember that their parents are children. And the best thing a parent can do is remember that their children are um, adults. Eventually, right? Like we're our own people. Parents sometimes infantilize their kids so much that they never like let them grow up. And then kids sometimes parentify their parents so much that they never remember that they're kids. Like, we're all just kids who have grown up. Our parents are on their own journey, just like we are. Our parents are literally us. They're just doing their own story. That's why when we become kids, I'm sorry, when we become parents, sometimes we forget, like, what it was like before that. But we need to remember that, like, we were once kids, too. Like, in a really significant way, remember that. That's why I think I have a lot of love for Sneeko, because I remember being a kid. And I remember it was not easy. It was not easy being an adult at 25 even though I had a job and even though I had a place and even though I had responsibilities I felt like a fucking fraud dude I felt like a kid I felt like a kid who thought she was grown until so humility hit me and I realized like I knew I was a kid all along I know I'm a kid now I just know I'm a little bit more grown up than I was before but our parents are on that journey too and then sometimes you have parents that like never grow up in any capacity and that's really sad but that's their journey you know to realize that life is precious and I, I should stop taking awake. it for granted. Yeah. Was that Walter White? I don't know. Oh, okay. I mean, I, 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 I don't know Walter White well enough to know his quotes. Okay. But, I, I mean, so, uh, you know, it's humbling. And, and I think what, why is it bad to make generalizations? Because I think human beings have different experiences. That's true. And, and what works for one person doesn't work for someone else. You heard it here. Dr. K doesn't like generalizations and me neither. I don't want to hear the debate space say ever again, we need to generalize. Oh, do we? Do we? And right. that that's also where, I mean, I've met my fair share of people, um, myself included, who got way more out of spirituality than I did out of therapy. Oh, damn, I'm muted. Oh, I'm muted. Oh, Boomer Brittany. Oh, Boomer Brittany. Okay, I'm unmuted. Okay. So Doom says, how the fuck are they still on their journey for decades? Every journey is supposed to have an end. Okay. There is no end. There's always the journey. There is the enlightenment is not the end. There is no enlightenment. Level five isn't the end. There's always another level. Like nothing is the end. There's only the end of the chapter you're willing to go on. Your parents are stuck in a loop and this is where they decided to end. And you're just not excited about it because you wouldn't have ended here. But they also haven't ended. They just, this is where they are. This is where the journey is right now. Right? Like your mom is on a journey and this is where she is right now. And there is no end to it. Right? The journey continues. It continues. Some people think the journey continues when we die. 
You could tell she was cooking. Damn, you know, the end is when you die. We don't know that. Right. Like that's we don't even know that. Some people think life continues after death. Maybe it does. Let's find out. We don't know. You know what I mean? Muted, passionate, Brittany is so cute, though. Thank you. Like the stream for my cuteness. So I don't even believe in the end of the journey because I think we wear recycled energy, right? We like go back into the earth. So I'm not convinced that the journey even ends if you believe in recycle. Like if you believe like we are recycled energy, there's no evidence that we disappear. There's only evidence that like we go somewhere like there's a whoop. That's why people believe in like the souls and heaven and stuff or even reincarnation. So like I don't even think there's an end, you know, way more. So but that's a belief, you know. What, what transformed my life was spirituality, not a psychotherapist. What did you do DMT in Peru? No, I, I, I spent seven years studying to become a monk in India. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah. Can you levitate? No. Oh. Still working on that one. Then I went to med school. If I had stayed with it, maybe I would be able to at this point. Okay. Yeah. So I, like I said, I, I think the main thing in which, which I'm sort of hearing is, is not that you're wrong. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's uh, most, I, I want to even say that most psychiatrists or psychotherapists would agree with a lot of what you're saying, that humor has therapeutic value, that prayer has therapeutic value, that just talking about your emotions. I actually think a lot of psychotherapists, well, it's not that it's a waste of time, but I think many people, myself included, I don't want people to come to my office and just talk about their emotions. I don't know. That's not what we're here for. Mm -hmm. We're here to do work. We're here to help someone get better. And we're here to help someone go like my goal with all of my patients is for them to never come back. Mm. Fire line from a therapist or a psychiatrist. That is the goal. That is an amazing goal. That's fucking beautiful, bro. Let's go, Dr. K. What's the longest you've had a patient? Five years. Seven years. Bone Six bone. years. Wow. Yeah. Damn. Ask me what my average amount of time to spend with a patient is. What is it? Because you're asking about the longest. Yeah. Yes. Okay. This is important because even when I was going to therapy, my therapist was busy, y'all. I only got to see her once or maybe twice a month. Like therapists are not available every week, like in the movies. Was the average three months? Six to 12 months. And was it weekly? Because I always thought it was weekly. I thought I was going to see my therapist weekly. Girl, I saw her every three to four weeks. Like I didn't have a lot of time to see her. You know what I mean? Okay. Probably around uh, under a year, I would and say. That's, what, that's once a week of yapping? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes more than yapping. Sometimes jerking each other off. Huh? There's your dick joke. <laughs> That's pretty good, Dr. Keith. a pretty good, Dr. Keith. a pretty good joke. Doom says, I can't help but always think how they unconsciously depend on me for a quick source of happiness. I'm not saying I'm all that, but having to always comfort them in their obvious misery, fair. I would work on boundaries, my bro. I'm open, but I have boundaries. Hey, mom and dad, I love you. I'll come home every Sunday. I'll come home every this. I'll call you every this. Open, but boundaries. Like open, but I have boundaries. You are allowed to have boundaries around how much emotional labor you do for your parents. Listen, I'm Middle Eastern. You're Middle Eastern, right, Dooms? I know there is an obligation to take care of our parents in a very strong way, depending on your culture. But I will tell you this, right? Nothing is better for you or them than you having boundaries. And it's not boundaries you put on them. You're not going to punish them. You're not going to give them an ultimatum. You're going to give a boundary to yourself. You're going to say, Dooms? I know you want to reach out. I know you want to do this and you are going to do this. You're going to do it once a week, once a month, once every three weeks. You're not going to do it every time they ask and you're not going to do it every time you want to. You're going to do it every time it's the right time to do it. When you actually have the spoons, when it's reasonable and when it's actually helping both your joy and theirs. Okay. It is absolutely okay for kids to be exhausted at doing the emotional labor for their parents that their parents should be doing for themselves. It is very normal for a lot of us to have to take care of our parents. It is also okay to have boundaries. And the boundary is for you. It's not for them. You are not punishing them. You are giving yourself a space to recharge your spoons so you can be there for them when it really matters. When it really matters. <laughs> Nice. I didn't expect that one. <laughs> it came out of nowhere. I forgot. 
Why were you were you interested? Is that because you were you seemed? Uh, it seems like you, you got, you know. No, no, it was just uh, a surprise. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. <laughs> Bombaka. How are you feeling now? Uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll I'll be. What would it help if I apologize? I don't need. No, nah, it's fine. If you're joking, then it, it's okay. <laughs> And if I wasn't? Um, no, you, it, it, uh, <laughs> I told you this shit is a liberal gay psyop. This is how people come transgender. They go, I, you're proving my point. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's hilarious how, how, how a tiny little joke can make you so uncomfortable. Sorry, that was demeaning. I apologize. You know what's even funny about it? Is the irony is because, like, that's what... He does all the time, right? He makes fun of people and says you're sensitive. Ooh, but he apologized. Let's see how that's taken. Just denigrating. Yeah. Um. Anyway, shall we get back to it? Yes. So uh, I, I would say that. Uh, so you asked how long I've been doing it. So I, I would say the longest patient is six years. But even in in that case, uh, the patient has done well for extended periods of time. So they'll be like done with therapy for about two years and then something will happen and they'll call and then we'll kind of work through it. We'll work together for about six months and then we'll take a break for eight months and something else happens. And that that's usually what that looks like. Three to six there hours, are six definitely four. some patients who need ongoing emotional support. Um, but those people I think tend to have difficulties with the basic day-to-day -day skills that lead to wellness. So either they are um, they're in a situation where they can't exercise. They're cognitively in a space where they really can't regulate their emotions and they require someone else's like support in an ongoing basis. I've absolutely worked with people like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's the majority of people. The exception rather than the rule. What do people usually come by? Like, what's the, what's the, what are normal people going through right now? What do you mean by that? What's the average person coming into the therapy? Like, what are they? What are people dealing with? Are you? What do you? What patterns are you noticing? You're saying that streamers are ADHD. Hey, that's a great question. I would love to know that answer. Like, that's a great question from Sneeko, right? The rejects who are attention-seeking narcissists. Uh, what about the average person? Why are they coming in to pay for services? Uh, are you talking about the average person? Yo, the way he just talks shit on himself and me and everybody else. That's so funny. In general, the yeah, average like, person like, sees like, me. Like a nine of, yeah, the average person that sees you. Like, what are you, what are you noticing yeah, as so a comment? People see right me now? for a different reason. So I think people see me that are a little bit less enamored with therapy and psychiatry. So given my background of like complementary and alternative medicine and the fact that I studied to become a monk, like people will come to me because they don't want to be on medication um, because they want to optimize their performance in some way. So, and most people come to me because they are interested in like understanding themselves better and mastering themselves more. Okay. Um, and, and sometimes they've got like, oftentimes something will push them into my office. Like, so for example, you know, people are afraid that like their anxiety is getting in the way of work, but most of the time it's not, it's like, I want to be free of this. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to enjoy life. I want to be able to um, do a good job at work. Um, I'm tired of worrying about stuff that I know is not important. And they want help with that. And I think that most people will figure it out. I think it's just having someone who knows is an expert in the material. It's way easier to learn, right? I can figure out how to surf if I spend enough time in the ocean. But having someone who knows how to surf teach me, I'll just learn way faster. Right. So I, I and this is kind of where, you know, I have some questions for you. But um, and I, I think that's really what we do as therapists. Is, is help people, people focus up. Help people understand how or this is what I try to do. I try to help people understand like what a human how a human works. So when I ask you, for example, what are the mechanisms of prayer? How does a pray, how does prayer work? How does it work? How does it not work? What does therapy do not do? So like the questions that I have for you, and if if you want uh, an impression of fixing what I think is incomplete about your understanding, we can start that. Okay. You have other questions, or can I dive in? You could dive in. Wait, before you dive in, can I go pee? 
Yeah, of course. Okay, I'm gonna go to bed. Yeah. Yo, Sneeko on a pee break right now, boys. Sneeko on a pee break. Bro, this snackage is so good. I'm gonna talk less, obviously, because I'm eating, but like, mm, cheese and crackers, pancetta, and some whole yogurt. Greek yogurt. Mmm. Mmm. Chair stream. I'm gonna go get some water. I don't know who I'm talking to. A bunch of schizo ADHD people. Okay. So let me ask you something. What is an emotion? Uh, a feeling. Okay. What are, what is a what is a feeling? Why why do we have emotions as humans? Um, as a reaction it, to what we see and experience. Okay. What um, what is the purpose of an emotion? The purpose of an emotion? I don't think there is one. I think they just happen. Okay. So that sounds very. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think about. Okay, so I'm gonna try to convince you that that's incorrect. Okay. Okay. So first of all, we can take the God angle. Like, I don't think God is omniscient, right? What does omniscient mean? One? Uh, all knowing. Okay. So like God made us this way, right? Yes. God gave us emotions. Yes. So like God doesn't do nothing. This is to something for no reason. He's not like, hey, I'm a fuck with the human race and I'm gonna give you all emotions. I'm gonna Maybe he does. In order for y'all to be whatever, like I'm gonna just toss in emotions. Like, so we exist for a reason. Like everything within us, every part of us exists for a reason. So okay. we have eyes for a reason, we have nose for a reason, we have mouth for a reason, we have dicks for a reason, right? Bumbaka! Yeah. Not liking the dick jokes anymore? I can no, stop. No, you're doing good. That wasn't really a joke, <laughs> you just said it, but... <laughs> okay. Um, so, so we have emotions for a reason. So like, in, in what I would say, if someone asked me the question, what are emotions for? I would say that emotions are a source of information and a source of motivation. So for example, if I walk into a room and there's like tension in the air, I'm going to feel emotionally uncomfortable. So we have emotions for a reason. So like in what I would say, if someone asked me the question, what are emotions for? I would say that emotions are a source of information and a source of motivation. So for example, if I walk into a room and there's like tension in the air, I'm going to feel emotionally uncomfortable. Yes. Or if if I walk into a room and everyone was laughing and then suddenly everyone goes silent, what do you think is the emotion that you would feel? When everyone's laughing, wait, and then I say joke and everyone goes silent? No, no. So you, everyone's joking and you walk into the room and everyone looks at you and shuts the fuck up. Uh, embarrassment. Right. So like if you think about that, why would you feel embarrassed? Because you know they're talking about you. How do you know they're talking about you? Because the whole energy shifts. Exactly. And the energy shift, by the way, is all neurologically mediated. So your eyes notice the change in behavior. Your ears notice the change. You can sense things. So you're getting sensory input. That sensory input gets processed very, very, very quickly, but in a very, very primitive way. It's not like a logical thing that your mind runs through. Your mind gets, your brain gets all the sensory input and then it reacts with an emotion. Yes. And then if we think about emotions, emotions prepare us. They prepare the whole body to act in a particular way. Okay? okay. So for example, if I feel angry, all kinds of stuff happens. I'm more willing to fight mentally. Agreed? Yes. I have adrenaline pumping through my system, which increases the blo blood flow to my skeletal muscles, decreases the blood flow to my visceral organs. So I stop digesting things, liver doesn't need blood, stomach doesn't need blood, colon doesn't need blood. We need blood flow to our arms, our legs. Our mind starts thinking in terms of black and white when we're angry, so we stop seeing nuance, we stop being empathic. And that way, when we need to throw down, we can throw down. So anger helps us throw down. It makes us more motivated to throw down. It makes us more likely to throw down. Okay. So. And if I like, if I walk up to you and I slap you across the face, you will get angry. 
-hmm. and that anger will is good right we don't shook you see that like it serves a purpose yes okay so uh, emotions are sources of information and sources of action mm. now the next thing is that emotions when i was in therapy i was taught that emotions are valid but they're not always reasonable and i think that's it's reasonable to have emotions, but the emotions you're having aren't always reasonable, though they're valid because you're experiencing them, right? That's kind of like how to have a relationship with your emotions because sometimes I'm like, I am feeling this way, but it's not always justified just because you're feeling it. But it's okay that you're feeling it. Let's figure out how to have a different relationship with it, right? Let's have a different relationship with our feelings, you know? Are not always useful. Sometimes our emotions can lead us in the wrong direction. Yes. Agree? Yes. Has that ever happened to you? Of course. Can you, do you feel comfortable sharing an example about that? To where an emotion led me in the wrong direction? Yeah. Um, does horny count? Sure. Uh, fucking focusing on women instead of what I'm supposed to do. Happens like on stream all the time. Or... Uh, fear, I think supplementing, using drugs to cope with fear, mm. stuff like okay. that in the past. Okay. So, so like, uh, yeah. So I, mm. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's actually, I'm really, I love those examples. S such good examples. Like, again, like a person cannot have this conversation with him unless they are self-aware. But how self-aware and how mature and how able to handle that self-awareness is a different conversation. But Sneeko, he's like, answer, these are good answers. These are great answers, right? I can say he is very self-aware and still say he's too immature to handle that self-awareness, right? He has the right answers. He just doesn't know how to apply them across the board. Which, by the way, we learn over time. Even with me, like, I know how to have grace with people. I can't have it for all people. I know how to love people. I can't love all people actively. I can only love people in a philosophy way, but not like in a literal way, right? Or like in a, a specific way, a more general way, mm, a more specific way. I know, I know, I know, but yet I can't, I can't, I can't, because we're, we're on the journey of learning to apply the tools that we gather. I have so many tools that I don't know how to utilize yet. You know, and I'm I'm so young and I'm still nine years older than Sneeko and I will be so young forever because there will always be someone who feels older. You know, one of the things older people say often is they don't feel their age. My parents are in their 60s. They never feel like they're in their 60s or what they perceived they would feel like in their 60s. So I know when I'm 60, I'm still going to feel young. Look at Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is a grown man, but he's still learning how to utilize tools. We're all learning how to utilize tools for the rest of our life, you know? I'm trying to hold people to a certain standard based off of like their ability and their best, but also we have to recognize how much it takes for us to learn things. Now, if you never go on a journey of curiosity, if you never break a bubble, if you never really have to face yourself and rebel, you're not going to have the same journey. So of course, everything's going to look crazy to you. Like I have people in my life who never had to rebel the way same way I did. And they always looked at me and said, why do you have to do it this way? Why do you have to be crazy? Why can't you just do it normal? Why can't you go slower? Why do you have to be so destructive? It was my journey. It just is what it is, my bros. I had to touch the stove. For some people, they won't. I think that's why I do like see enough of Sneeko. I put him in a category of like boy crazy versus girl crazy. Girls, I'm, I'm generalizing go through different journeys. But like I had to touch the stove a thousand times to question what was true and what was. But if you don't go through that journey and you're like, I'm mature at 22 and you have a different life, you're still 22, my bros. But you might be having a different, if you've never had to rebel that hard, you're not dealing with the same level of like touching the stove. You're just not. So of course, if you look at Sneeko, you're going to think like, why is he doing that? Well, you, you don't even have to think about it. Especially people born into bubbles that were perfect for them. Hello. Because I think they really speak to. So when we have emotions, if so, they can be useful, but they can also like if we're not in control of them, if we don't really understand where they come from or why they come from a particular place and we're not able to regulate them, we get into trouble. Right. Right. So then. 
Are you, uh, by the way, are you kind of fall? Are you, is this okay? What we're doing? Yeah, right no, now? I, I, I'm, I'm kind of... following. I'm following. You're okay. uh, you're explaining the use of emotions. Yeah. So so and then I think that like so this is where we kind of come to emotions such as crying or or is a weakness and that's kind of where I'm going with this, is that I I think so in my opinion or expertise or call it whatever you want to like you will be a more effective human being if you can understand and even to a certain degree control if you have a better relationship with your emotions in the same way that we can train our muscles or our breathing um we can also train our mind right i agree right and so i think one of the key parts of that training is a better relationship with our our emotions and specifically to understand so sometimes we will also have inappropriate emotions so a good example of this is let's say that I get anxious asking for a raise from my boss. Even though I've worked really hard, I feel I deserve it, but something has happened to me over the course of the way that my brain formed where asking someone for a favor or something that I believe I deserve results in anxiety. Yes. So that's like a bad situation, right? Yes. And in this scenario, I imagine you would say, go work out, pray, and gas yourself up in some way, and then go demand what you are owed. Go and be strong, right? I, I wouldn't say gas yourself up, but yeah. What would you say? Um, work on yourself. Like, just, just work on something. Work, okay. Work. Two things I want to observe. One, yes, Stephanie. Stephanie says, one thing I really appreciate about Sneeko is his openness to explore open-minded i know everyone was molding when i said he was more open-minded than destiny but do you guys not see what i mean sneeko has gone from growing up in a liberal household to going more progressive to going more liberal again to going more conservative to going red pill to going islam to going catholic to going islam like he has literally gone boop 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 he was like curious about an open um or a uh a swinger situation, tried swinging. Oop, wanted to do this, tried it. Wanted to do this, tried it. Wanted to do this, tried it. He is much more open-minded than the average person because the average person doubles down. I mean, I say I say the same shit Dr. K will say. We're like, I don't like to make generalizations. It doesn't seem to help. And people go, Brittany, why are you here then? You have to make generalizations. You have to. And I'm like, why? Why would you make generalizations about the individual's experience? But also, who is a, who are, what are we all doing on this YouTube, like, pretending like we know what's going on in society when we all live online chronically? Right? Really? Like, come on. Sneeko's young. He's in his 20s. He's figuring it out. Um, it's going to take some time. But his openness is definitely going to be one of the tools that he uses it. He uses his openness. He's changed so many times. Right? Which is like, it looks crazy. But also, to me, I'm like, hey, at least he's trying everything to see if it works. And one day he might try something else, right? But that's the key is like, ooh, let's see how many times he tries. And that's that's what open-mindedness is, not to the point where your brain falls out. You know, even I'm closed-minded to an extent, but you want to be open-minded enough to try things out. He wanted to know about swinging, he tried it. He wanted to know about this, he tried it. And everything that didn't work for him, he assumes doesn't work for everybody, which is the mistake he makes, which is the mistake everybody makes because they generalize. Well, if it didn't work for me, it's going to not work for you. And also, just because it worked for you doesn't mean it's going to work for somebody else. I like it, depending on when you watch my content, <clears throat> there's always like this misconception that people think like just because it worked for Britney, it's going to work for you. No, you have to figure out what works for you. What's the tool you need? I can only give you the tool and then you can decide how to use it, right? That's it. But every time these people with their lives being a mess are like trying to like compare themselves to someone whose life is worse, try comparing yourself to someone whose life is better. If you want to know where you stand, find someone whose relationship you admire and then if you want, compare yourself to them. But don't even do that because comparison is the thief of joy. Compare yourself to the ideal relationship, the one you wanted, the one you say you want. But at the end of the day, like the first step is like, I did this to myself. This is my karma. This is my life. This is like my life reflected back to me. I did this to myself. Other people didn't do it to me. I did this to myself right? Everyone wants to be like so strong and independent and say, I'm in control of my life. Then own the fact that this was your choice. 
Not the type of relationship you had, but how you had it and the kind of person you were that facilitated it, right? Work for your future self. Gassing yourself up, I think, is inflating your ego. True. I, I don't True. Well, inflate. gassing yourself up could be like cheerleading yourself, maybe, but maybe Sneeko's right. I think you should earn it, so work. Okay, so so work. And yeah, so I, I, I think like that's a fair perspective. So I think a lot of what... So the, the, another thing to understand is sometimes the way that our emotions get wired. Sorry, one more thing. I know you guys can't see it because I'm a, I don't want to get TOS here, but Sneeko's viewers were watching that coin game that goes by. I love that shit. I just watch it all the time when I'm listening to Reddit stories. But now they asked him to change it to the fight. So now I'm watching a fight and Sneeko's watching it too. It's like, I usually like that's very interesting to me it's like very, like he need he's watching this fight so if you watch his eyes go back and forth it's because we're watching a fight on stream I'm, I'm watching it too honestly it's hard not to watch it are based on our experiences so for example like um <clears throat> you know let's say that like i don't know i mean this is kind of a random ass example but uh let's say that one of my parents was a clown and one of my parents was physically abusive and then what happens is since they were wearing their clown costume when they were physically abusive, when I was five years old, I learned to fear clowns. So my brain formed associations, which is what brains do, that when I see big floppy shoes. I wonder if an hour in, Sneagle's also losing spoons but doesn't know how to communicate it or if he needs something to watch so he can listen better. And a big red nose, that means that I'm in danger. And so this is the way that our brain wired. Wait, he can't be smoking weed right now. That's halal. No, that's haram. Just kidding. Not halal. That's haram. Wait. Wait. Is Sneeko smoking weed right now? This is what I mean. Oh, religious people who can't follow the basics. Oh, they piss me off, bro. It's based on experiences. Does that make sense? You follow yes, me? Yes. Okay. So then what happens is like, I'm 35 years old. I'm at my kid's sixth birthday party and someone invited. A that's probably not. It's probably not. Is vaping haram? Great question. I think it might be, actually. Is it, guys? Any Muslims in the audience, bros? Can you fill us in? Clown, which I've been avoiding, which means I start having anxiety and panic because my brain has learned a long time ago when my neurons were still forming that cr clowns mean danger. Clowns mean run away. Okay? Yes. And so now I've got this problem where, like, I need to rewire my brain. I need to, even though intellectually I understand that clowns are not dangerous, there's a part of my body and my brain that responds in a way that is separate from my intellect. It's primitive. Does that make sense? Yes. So there are many ways. To mm, it's a cigar, is it? I mean, I guess it could be, yeah, for sure. Like a tiny a little tiny one. To do that. One of the most effective ways to reprogram yourself is psychotherapy mm -hmm. so psychotherapy is the process of understanding so for example like i'll just give you like a, an actual example so there's a kind of psychotherapy called emdr i know which yeah, is, yeah yeah oh i'm aware of it, where you, your eye it's like hypnosis your eyes follow and you're supposed to forget traumatic past like people, nice nico well, I, I heard about emdr yeah yeah so, so it's not that you forget traumatic past it's that normally when we think about a particular memory and I'm sure that if we talked long enough, we would, I could ask you about particular memories and those memories would trigger emotional reactions with you, mm. right? Yep. Okay, and you could do the same with me. We could talk about whatever and it, we would have some emotions. Now, the problem is that when people have something like PTSD, the size of their reaction is debil- I think tobacco's fine because isn't hookah not some sort of, um uh analog vape yeah yeah it's like hookah is tobacco right it's i think you can smoke because even in catholicism you can smoke cigars and stuff like absolutely you can even get tattoos but you're not supposed to like really permanently scar the body you're not supposed to do it um in a degrading way you're not supposed to over drink you're not supposed to overspend you're not supposed to so i bet in islam it's probably really similar where they can smoke tobacco we just can't take advantage of it debilitating so like when I hear like if I'm a Vietnam War vet or something like that or an Iraqi war vet and I hear a door slam, my mind literally goes back to being in a combat scenario. I stop, drop and roll. I'm trying to duck under fire, but like I'm at a bus stop dropping my kid off. Mm. So that that needs to that shit needs to be rewired. 
And so the way that EMDR works is we actually have those people recall that stuff. But the way I'm really interested in EMDR for my PTSD, I think it'd be really helpful. A that we move our eyes since our attention mm -hmm. is somewhere else. Yeah, while you're I'm supposed talking. to look back and forth to forget things. Does it actually work though? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I'm gonna say yes. Uh uh Teal says it seems like he became a woman. Uh, a woman. <laughs> It seems he became an, a Muslim because he doesn't like women. No, no, no. Sneeko loves uh, women. No, 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 no. Sneeko loves uh, women. He's upset that he loves uh, women. Sneeko respects women. He doesn't respect his himself for respecting women. Like, he... He doesn't understand. He absolutely loves women. Sneeko, a lover, bro. Sneeko, his biggest sin right now is women. Sneeko doesn't hate women. Sneeko loves women. Sneeko is upset that he is, he needs women. Sneeko is upset that he needs women. That's, I'm dying on that hill. But there is certainly a camp of people in the psychiatry and psychotherapy community that, say don't that think that e EMDR, the be therapeutic benefit of EMDR is way, is been overblown. And it's not everything that everyone thinks. Hey, 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 hey. Also, aren't Muslim men supposed to not shave their beard? That is what Sneeko can grow. You leave him alone. He's a man. Thinks <laughs> so it is. <laughs> so that, that, that's kind of, anyway, so... EMDR is just a good example of what we're trying to do is almost like split your mind and prevent that emotional reaction. So now we're going to talk about this stuff, but since you're concentrating over here, you're not actually... <laughs> Zen says he loves vagina. No, he loves women. He doesn't just love sex. Myron tolerates sex for dominance. Sneeko loves women. I will stand by that. I think Sneeko is struggling with his relationships with women because of the relationship he has with himself. But I actually think in his core self, like in his heart of hearts, um, the part of him that isn't the loudest right now, but is the most honest, I think he has no problem with women. I think he has no problem with people that are like experimenting with gender either. I just think that it doesn't map on to any belief system, any bubble that coincides with what makes him feel comfortable about the world. I think he's uncomfortable with the world, uncomfortable with himself in the world. I think he's just trying to figure out where he belongs, like all of us, you know, in a different way. Like that's what the journey of life is, right? Figuring out where you belong and who you are and what's the most authentic part of yourself and where you're going to be, where you feel strong and at the same time where you feel like you could fight everybody. I think something that's so important is like feeling like you are strong and don't have to use it. You know what I mean? Like. And it could be related to his HD and his impulse control as well. His ADHD, you know what I mean? He might have this like horrible, re if he's not on meds and he's not really caring for his ADHD, you know what I mean? He might not be able to actually like control that impulse, right? I think that's like, there's something there to it maybe. Um, it's interesting, you know? It's like when I see someone freak out like a Karen, like, there are different kinds of Karens. Not everybody who's a Karen is actually just a Karen. They're probably having a mental breakdown as well. Like, I think sometime during, like, the pandemic and the shutdown, I think we really lost a lot of our humanity during that stage because we were just watching people on screens and we completely forgot, like, people having mental breakdowns is real. And if you're acting like this in public, something is actually wrong. Like, something is actually wrong. You know what I mean? As much as it's easy to make fun of people and be like, you deserve it because you're acting crazy. Maybe they're not acting. Maybe something went wrong. And then maybe sometimes they're just being a bitch. But you know what I mean? Like, I'm I'm mostly convinced it's all mental health and something is actually severely wrong. It's like the homelessness population. Everyone always like writes them off like they're just choosing to be that way. And this is what they want. Do you think people want to be homeless? Some people, sure, let's say 10% of the homeless population wants to be there and is 1,000% cho choosing it with no, like, no other factors in mind. Sure, 10% of them. I'll give you that. 
Do you think a sane, competent, healthy person chooses to be homeless? Just like, do you think a healthy person chooses a toxic relationship? Do you think a healthy person cheats on their marriage? Do you think a healthy person, like, again, when people do these things, there's like a relationship with like, is it mental health? Is it um, a lack of values? Is it, there's a reason, right? Like there's a reason why you went from working a perfectly decent job and a perfectly good marriage to cheating on them with somebody half your age and something happened. Something happened, right? But a healthy person didn't make that decision. Now, maybe that decision is what led you to being healthy, but a healthy person didn't make that decision, right? Really paying attention to the memory and then you get desensitized to it. It's, it's, there's a little, it's a desensitization therapy, mm -hmm. right? So what we're trying to do is like stop a automatic reaction by retraining the brain, actually, and the body. Is that even possible? 100%. I mean, you, you would desensitize. People record, Jessica says, people record others at their lowest and most vulnerable to humiliate them to the world for the internet points. It's sick. I think they're also mentally ill. I also think they have a problem. I also think there's a huge problem with somebody who records and mocks people. Like, I think there's a huge, like, something is wrong with how they they socialized, you know. And people got to be a part of that population. There's got to be a part of the population where they do that, right? Um, Sneeko's trying to prove his manhood. I agree. I think Sneeko's trying to prove his manhood and who he is and where he belongs. And regardless of whether or not his dad was great, and he probably was, he's still going to go on his own journey. Good enough parents also make good enough kids. Sneeko's good enough, right? Like, he's good enough. Like, the, I, like, again, people, if one in five guys are admitting to cheating in a lot of studies, or I think, I don't know, this recent study came out. Oh, what was it? One in 42? What was it, guys? It was like, it was a bad number. But like one in so many men admit to being attracted to like young people, um, KIDS. And I was like, bro. So it's kind of like when, you know, when we think about these things and we think about like what people could be, you know, there is a bad. Sneeko has done bad. But I don't think his core is a bad person. But I also think it's okay to not feel sorry for him. I think it's okay to move on. But again, how you treat your enemies tells me more about you than how you treat people you like, you know? You can desensitize. You have been desensitized. But you're trying to you like trick saying? yourself into doing it. Is that, is like the I've movement not actually trick. doing it or is it the process of thinking about it and... It, it's the process of having your attention in one place so that all of your attention does not gravitate towards the traumatic memory. That's the mechanism, in my opinion. Okay. Well, I, I don't know if that kind of makes sense, but like, let me put it to you this way. Let's say, well, what's an example? So let's say that you're about to have sex. So in this moment, your full attention is on whatever the stimulus of sex is. And so uh -huh. you're very involved in it. You have an emotional reaction, yes. you have a physical reaction. But let's say that someone is, is like trying to seduce you, but you're playing a video game. So your attention is split. So even though there's like this naked person over here who's trying to seduce you, your phys- Okay, just to, um, the post news from Wellington, this is from New Zealand, says about 15% of respondents said having smexual feelings towards KIDS or teenagers. Um, I don't trust this website because I haven't verified it, but the conversion briefly says that a survey found one in six men admitted to having these feelings, according to the UNSW Sydney and Jesuit Social Services, but that feels religious to me, so I less trust that. Um, um, yeah, I think there's some stuff coming out about it, which is interesting, right? But I think... That's something we should be having a conversation about and see if we can sort of see the nuance in it as well as examine how we're going to bring harm reduction into these conversations, you know? Physiologic reaction, your mental reaction is not going to happen because your mind is over here. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, one of the treatments for premature ejaculation is to think about other stuff while you're having sex. Correct. Or I think porn has actually fucked up a lot of people's minds. They become kind of desensitized and have weird expectations and thinking about different things, what they should be doing. Or porn is the, is the, the quickest way that people become desensitized to, to sex and are out of the moment. And uh, yeah. yeah.
Yes. So I I, I think like um seven i think you're wrong you said are you mentally ill to promote homelessness as something so much bigger than it is homelessness is a huge crisis you don't need like those numbers are a lot we have 350 million americans 18 out of every 10,000 people in the country are homeless that's a lot of people my bro like eight, 18 out of every 10,000 and there's 350 million of us if you're talking about the u.s that is a huge problem I don't know why you think that's not a big problem, right? Like these are examples of like psychotherapy. Does that sound? Yeah, 650,000 Americans are homeless. That's a huge problem. Weak to you? Uh, yes. How so? Because you couldn't deal with it yourself. You need to pay to do it. So like. Like asking for help is a sign of weakness. Like asking for help is a sign of weakness. It's a great sign of weakness. I'm weak. Help me, bitch. What do you mean? It is a sign of weakness. Help me, bitch. I'm weak. That's how I ask for help. Help me, bitch. I'm weak. <laughs> of course, we asking for help is a sign of weakness. What? I'm. That's why I need the help, girl. Even though everybody needs help sometimes, it is weakness. If I can't climb up yeah. the ladder, I need somebody to hold it. Then yeah. I'm too weak to climb up the ladder by myself. Yeah. Same thing with okay. psychotherapy. Okay. So so needing help from anyone makes you weak. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it doesn't make you weak, but it, it's a sign of weakness. Because, like, you can have weakness and still be strong. Weak in, in whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you value independence. Yes. Yeah. And so, like, let's say that you're in a car accident and you need a surgeon's help. Yes, exactly. MMM says not asking for help can also be a sign of weakness. Absolutely. See, one is a healthy sign of weakness and one is a toxic sign of weakness. I think asking for help is a healthy sign of weakness and not asking for help because you're afraid to look weak is a bad sign of weakness. You're weak in that moment because you can't. Yes. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> literally, your body's weak, so you need it. You need help, but the and strong. That, yeah, is that bad, or is that acceptable? I don't know about good or bad is the best way to describe it, but you know, it's you're more optimized and you're a more complete person, more independent, reliable if you're able to deal with it yourself. Yeah, you're more, I mean, you're more I, competent. I Competence that, means that you you need the least amount of help. Do you have an emotional reaction to being weak? Not all the time. In, certain, in, in places where I think I should be competent and I realize I'm not, that makes me feel inadequate, yeah. Yeah, I don't like that. But if it's something I'm not good at and I do need to ask for some help or some information, then you know I'm, I'm okay to learning things. But when it's, when it's my area of expertise, when it's something that I've trained and worked at and I need help, it's like, it's like I'm, I, there's disappointment and there's, there's anger that I'm not better. Oh, there's so many beautiful things to unpack here. Um, Nova says needing help is weakness, but being able to ask for help is strength. Yeah, I just think like it's you knowing yourself. Like if you want to be independent, you also have to outsource some of those things so you can have more time to be independent. So like instead of spending your whole life researching all of like, I don't know how to do the gym, you could just like hire a physical trainer. You know what I mean? It's so interesting, like the relationships that we have with weakness and strength, I just contextualize it into healthy or unhealthy because the idea is like I should be able to like get myself closer to my joy and towards my goals. And sometimes that means, you know, doing whatever it takes to help me. See, I'm selfish. Help yourself, bitch. Help yourself by getting help so you can excel. Can I think for a second? Yes, you can. Okay, so we talked about like PTSD for a second, right? Yeah. And sort of this idea of an inappropriate reaction. Yes. On the same page that that happens? Yes. Okay. How do you know that the disappointment that you feel in yourself is appropriate? So like, let's take two scenarios. One is you secretly have PTSD. And that all of the thoughts that you have are a equally inappropriate reaction. How does someone know the difference? Great question. How does someone know the difference between 
an appropriate disappointment and an inappropriate disappointment? I mean, if you're disappointed, it depends on why you're disappointed. If you're disappointed for selfish reasons, then that's uh, it's inappropriate. If you're if you're disappointed because you should have been and, and it's, you're, you know, and it shows that you are trying to seek out more competence, then I think that's appropriate. It's good motivation. It's like, it, say you you miss like okay, I used to play soccer when I was a kid. If I miss a penalty shot, I've been working on the penalty shot for a while. I think it's appropriate that I'm disappointed that I didn't hit the game winning goal. And that motivation there, that disappointment means I'm going to keep training harder and then make sure the next time we're in the game that I hold my team on my back and get the goal. That's appropriate. I'm disappointed. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me just think for a second. Okay, so, Chad, you like this so, so in no? this case, what, what you do with disappointment is try harder, practice, get better, right? So negative emotion isn't bad. It, it drives you towards positive action. Yes, I think negative emotion pushed in the right direction. Um, and same thing with ADHD, like a lack of focus, I guess, in, you know, in school. A, a lot of like where they attribute negative negativity or disorders if you channel that in the right place, it's it's. Sorry, he just asked his chat if this is like a good stream, and most people are saying yes. While they're still being like, it's gay, but we like it. Like it's very funny. His chat is like weirdly. I think they have like a really love like bully relationship. In my mind, I think that's what's happening. I think it's like a loving bully relationship, maybe because they're young, they're kids. So that's probably what's happening. But I think that's kind of cute. Extremely effective. So being inadequate in something and feeling disappointed feeling worthless that is good motivate that's good fuel to become better i think a lot of so i yeah i i can see so so if i take that fuel and that if i take that disappointment and i go sit on some someone's couch and i cry cry it out and i'm no longer disappointed then i don't end up improving yes and that's how a lot of women and the, why I, I attribute therapy goers to like effeminate liberals because when women are disappointed and sad they call up their friends and they say let's eat chocolate and drink wine until Ooh, we yeah. feel better right men will say hey get on this bench and get to 225 like that's that's our way of getting through something you know if, if my friend is ever down about a girl or down about something i'd like you know i'm not going to try to cope for it's just like, let's get back to it the, the best solution is, is forward yeah so so i've got a couple of kind of i feel like the best solution is cuddles and some anime, and then getting back to it. I'm a self-care myself, so I kind of feel like, you know, feel your feelings and then let them go. But, like, you got to feel your feelings first. Otherwise, you'll do what Sneeko did, which is push them down. Remember earlier in the stream, Sneeko said to push his feelings down and get over it? I think you should feel your feelings and let it go because, you know, I'm already carrying this ass. I don't need to be carrying all that baggage, you know? Questions about that. One is, so, like, that's what works for you, right? Yes. <laughs> and is it possible that different things work for different people? Yes, that's true. My okay. initial reaction I was like, no, I was going to say, well, no, there's one, one right way. Actually, that, that's true, but there's a better way. Yeah, it can work for most people, but I think God created men to be leaders and women to be uh, the nurturers. So I think God wants us to be as competent as possible, and we should be strong. And there is, there, of course, it can work for other people, but the most optimal way is to is to work through it um through through it's just to work through it instead of talk about it and, and sit in it and yeah so so and when you say i like that he says work through it but like that's what therapy is you like work through it optimal like you're basing that idea of optim optimal because that's how do you know that that's optimal because your, your primary data set is you right yes and so you're basing optimal on your own experience Correct, but you know, also information, talking to other people, looking at history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but so now, now I, is where I get confused. I swear to God, I'm not trying to convince you of shit. Okay, I'm not I trying to. I, I, I can tell. Like I can that, tell. But, so, so, but what I'm curious about is like, if you've never really tried therapy, how do you know that it is inferior to the things that you're doing? I told you I did try. I I wouldn't call that trying it. Right. Okay. Well, I guess. Um, Sneeko tried therapy like people who sign up for the gym try it during the New Year's season. They show up once and leave. That's not trying the gym, bros. 
Like you showing up to therapy once is not trying therapy. You showing up to the gym one day is not doing the gym. I would call that going to the ocean, uh, going to the beach and saying, I don't like swimming when you don't get in the water. Right. Um, you went into that room, you saw the big tits, you activated a script and you started flexing. You didn't actually do therapy. Well, you could just look at the history of, of men and you could look at the history of world leaders and people who have, uh, all, prog it's literally, time is the most valuable currency. That's the most valuable thing. Money's not real. Um, so you think about what are we spending that holds the most weight and it's time because all of our time is limited. We're all going to die one day. Oh, amen. Nihilus Sneeko. And if our time is being spent wasted talking about how to get better instead of getting better or improving, <laughs> that's wasted time. But if we're all going to die, why waste time getting better? That's the, that's the philosophy question you have to ask yourself. If we're all going to die, why do we waste time getting better? And then some people believe it's God and some people believe it's blah, 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 blah. And that's why you have to make purpose. But like, that's the question. The most effective use of our time is forward, is progress, is cre Why? creating something more, is inspiring more people. Is Why? Is building something. That is the most effective use How of every second. How do you know second. what the right direction is? Ooh, Dr. K with the questions. God tells me. God wants us to create. God wants us to be strong. Sir, are you hearing voices in your head? God tells me. I'm going to start saying that to people. God tells me. Oh, God tells me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God tells me. I'm going to start saying that to everybody. God tells me. You know, God tells me that. That's a cult, bro. That's a good excuse. That's a pretty good excuse. See, this is why, like, we are so, look at us in the world. We're so nice. We let people say God tells them. We let people play with voices in their head. But, like, look, we're so good. Look, the world's so good. The world allows grown adults to pretend they can hear the voice of God. And we just go, sure, buddy. We're so nice. God wants us to be able to provide. It, all the time spent that I am sitting in therapy crying is time that my competition is getting better. It's time spent where I am not working yeah, on so, what I'm supposed to be doing. So I, I'm not quite sure what you think about data. And, and we can talk about that if, if you're not into like data or science. But like, so, so here's kind of my experience and I'm you know, just sharing it. I'm not trying to convince you here. Right. Um, well, actually, let me close off one point. <gasps> Nova! I'm telling God on you. God tells me you're full of shit, Brittany. Um, rude. It's about what therapy is. So in the case of something like e EMDR or PTSD, it's like, it's literally trying to rewire ourselves. So cognitive exactly. behavioral therapy is a really good example of this, that a lot of times our behaviors, mm -hmm. so I noticed that you're smoking something and you're drinking Red Bull, right? So our behaviors are tied to certain internal impulses mm -hmm. and that the better we understand the relationship between our thoughts, our emotions and our behaviors, the better control we will have over the whole system. So mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy has been designed to teach people to better control. Usually <gasps> hi aim with the super chat. God told me to give you money. Oh, pfft. He's telling me to tell you all to give me money. That's what he said. He said it just now. He told me. He also told me, uh-huh. Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah. Okay. He also said Sneeko's a bitch. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he said Sneeko's his little bitch. Their behaviors, but oftentimes their <laughs> thoughts you, and their Aime. emotions as well. So we can create the instrument that we want. And emotional competence is a big part of this. And a big part of emotional competence <clears throat> is familiarity with your emotions, getting in and like playing with the Play-Doh of your emotions. And frequently in that kind of way, there it involves things like tears, right? So if I if I have some something that I'm super sad about and super hurt about, and I shove it down or I drink or whatever, and I don't do, engage in healthy behaviors, one way to sort of fix that is to actually like cry let that stuff up and out and kind of exercise it from the body. And the the value, I think, is sort of this. I mean, maybe not the same because it sounds like you think prayer is superior. But you've you you even said that, you know, people will go through some level of I would call it catharsis where they're at Mecca. The, all these tears are flowing. They feel connected. They feel like and you were kind of like letting that shit out. Right. And so I think the mechanism in therapy is very similar in some ways. I think the big difference is. There's <gasps> Nova, thank you for the super chat. Brittany is stealing from her followers. Help. Wait. God told me it's okay because I'm doing it for a good reason. So it's okay. Thank you for the super chat.
different ang uh, aspects about the psychology and neuroscience of things like surrender and spirituality. So um, but I think that you have a human who's sort of showing you through it. Yes. That, that's one thing. The other two things, are you, you want to respond to that? Or I, I've got two other things I wanted to share. I just want to quickly say, like, I, I think a lot of crying could be self-pity and self-loathing and serving the self. Like, feeling bad about yourself and blaming. Like, I, w when a lot of people cry, they do it because they're like, why me? Why this? I don't... True! Stop being such fucking little complainers, bro. I hate complainers. You can vent, bro. Okay? Vent your frustrations. Be like, holy fuck, why is this so fucking hard? But complaining is like, don't self-pity, bro. Pity is gross, okay? Pity, a pity fool. Don't pity yourself, bro. But you can cry for yourself. You're allowed to cry for the version of yourself you'll never become. You're allowed to cry, have a funeral, murder yourself if you have to, spiritually, metaphysically, like meditationally, and then move on. I also don't like pity who people, I don't like people who pity cry for themselves either. I don't like people who blame the whole world for their problems. Yes, the world sucks. Radically accept it that you are not special. Everyone feels like the world sucks. Hey, newsflash. I don't know if you guys know this. A lot of people feel that way. You are not unique or special. Everyone feels like the world is against them and life is hard for them and I have to pay my bills. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we all figure out how to do it or not. But like no one likes a negative Nancy. Okay? And nobody likes a negative Nancy. Okay? Don't deserve this it's 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 a it's a very selfish act but so one of the most consistent things that i do for my patients is stop that cycle i completely agree mm -hmm. i think that we see an overwhelming amount of what i would call emotional masturbation mm -hmm. that is guised as like like support as progress places. yes yes i i i, I mean I, there, there are places that people will go and essentially emotionally vomit over and over and over again but over time it doesn't get better mm -hmm. right so the whole point of like processing emotions is to be done with them not to repeat that cycle over and over again and i've had my fair share of people who are way too indulgent with self-pity but mm -hmm. i would argue that that's the same problem in, in a different way but is the same problem as all the others that I've said, including things like PTSD, which is that their inappropriate emotional reaction or the emotions that they've lost control of are self-pity. Mm -hmm. So I one time had a patient who like, this was early on before I became a really competent therapist and would come in and after they would complain about being depressed. Yeah. And six months later, like they came in, they had the same fucking complaints. And I was like, are you getting better by coming here? And he's like, no. And I was like, what are we doing? And he's like, I don't know. I thought this is what we're supposed to do. Isn't therapy like coming here and I just tell you about what's like wrong with my day. And then we just like, I just tell you everything that's wrong in my life. And I'm like, is that actually helping? That's my problem. And he's therapy. like, no, that's it. No, that's my problem with anything. I really wish people were more able to say like, I don't think you should come here anymore. I think that's what I pride myself in. Like genuinely, if you're doing calls with me and I feel like it's not really a vibe or working, I will either suggest to you that we stop the calls because like maybe this isn't the tool you need or um, that we do it less or maybe that we say five more sessions and like if it doesn't, it's not a vibe, it's not a vibe because you do have to like figure out if it's a vibe first, right? You're not going to get everything you want from a first call. Sometimes I'll have callers and the first call is like magic. Like it's vibing the whole time. They're like, holy shit. Sometimes I'll get a caller and they'll be like, holy crap, you just like gave me so many tools I never had, but it feels like you're reading my mind. And I'm like, yeah, it's just because like I know I have these answers for your tool. So it feels like that. I'm not reading your mind. Newsflash. Okay. God says he might let me read your mind eventually. So anyways, so then I give them those tools. And then sometimes a caller comes to me and for the first like five times we talk, they're not so sure I can give them something, but they still want to call to figure out if like, what they need and what they end up finding out is that they don't need anything I can provide them, which is finding out a lot. That is quite a tool. Finding out you don't need the, a certain kind of philosopher or a mentor or a therapist or a fitness instructor, like figuring out, oh, I don't need the gym, bro. I need a better diet. Oh, I don't need a better diet, bro. I need therapy. Oh, I don't need therapy, bro. I need, sometimes it's about eliminating what we don't need as much as it is finding what we do need. And so like, I wish practitioners would literally say, like, I don't think this is a vibe for you. I don't think it's helping. 
versus um, pretending they can help you just to like take your money, you know? And by the way, not everyone you go to has to literally help you because sometimes like, I mean, ultimately you have to help yourself. I mean, you can go to a fitness instructor every day, but if you don't follow the regimen, like you're not, it's not their fault, it's yours. You know what I mean? Um, Jessica says, thank you for being a member for 11 months. Thank you so much. God told me to tell you, say my name in your Brit accent. Jessica, Jessica, why is it Jessica? Wait, Gold says your twank. No, wank, twank, twank. Wink. What did the Brits say? You're a wink. No, you're a twink. Twink sounds better. Twink sounds like us. <laughs> oh, it's not. And then I was like, well, then what the fuck are we going to do about it? Right? And then like, and then we started, then the real therapy started. But I'm, I'm with, uh, anyway, so, so I, I think that there's value to therapy. Oof. That I, oh, twat. I, I would say that. You I think you're right. It's twat. A wanker. Guys, I think I'm mixing two words together. I'm neurodivergent and very pretty. So, you know. <laughs> your, your understanding of this is incomplete, right? And if I was trying to convince you, it's simply that you haven't tried it. I don't, I don't disagree with some of the judgments that you make, but I would still say that those are judgments that you're making, like listening to a tiny slice of the population. Like people who are transgender who go to therapy account for less than, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. I don't know this. I don't have the statistics right at hand, but I'd guess that they're less than 1% of patients. 99% of people who go to therapy at definitely 95%, if not more realistically, I think gender dysphoria and stuff like probably counts for about 1% as my, my gut, maybe 2% or 3%. But the vast majority of people don't go for stuff. I think what happens is that people take the most extreme opposite of themselves, like what they don't want to be the most, and just say, as long as I'm not that, I'm okay. Instead of saying, this is what I would like to be, and then why do I want to be it? So I feel like for this bubble, when they're like, transgender people are everywhere, they're thinking like being trans is the worst possible thing when in my head it's like very neutral like it's so neutral like I remember when I was like 19 I was still living with my parents and I had a blog and my dad would like read the blog and comment and try to help me but I wrote a blog about trans people and I wrote a blog like defending them and my dad was like Betsy why are you talking about these people they're very sick and I was like yeah but if they're sick then they need help and then if like transitioning would help them like that'd be better and he was like, no, Brittany, I'm, like, that's not how it works. Like, you need to make them not be trans. And I was like, oh, well, and he goes, you shouldn't be writing about these things. Like, ever since I was young, like, once I made the decision to, like, I'm going to be a writer and I'm going to do these things, which, by the way, I wasn't going to be a writer. Well, maybe. Well, and so anyways, it's like, oh, what does this, like, mean? Like, what does it mean to be the furthest away from the thing that you're afraid of being? And I think it's, like, the thing that you think is, like, the scariest in theory, like, Trans people to me are so, no offense, kids, basic. <laughs> like, okay, you're trans. Get over it. We're all trans. Like, maybe I just feel like we're all trans. Like, no, we're not literally. But it's like, yeah, like, okay. But for some people, being trans is like the biggest deal in the world. Where I'm just like, I don't know. I couldn't imagine thinking it's a big deal anymore. And I think when I think of the opposite of what I want to be, I don't want to be someone who, let me think, what don't I want to be? I probably don't want to be somebody who um, doesn't learn and doesn't change to some extent, obviously, because I'm seeking change constantly, which in the bubble I grew up in, change was only good if it was about getting muscles and getting healthy, not about ideas. But I'm very open to changing my ideas because like that's the whole point is like you might have a different perspective on the same thing or better way of saying it or... You know, like, I hope I'm very different in six years when you guys see me. But it's like, I don't know. Maybe there's like a fear in this bubble that like, I'm so afraid of trans people, even if they're 1% of the population. It's like, that's a fear. But that's an irrational fear. Right? Like, that feels like an irrational fear to me. You know? So I kind of feel like, mm, you know, like, okay, do you guys, I don't. Look, it's probably for grifting, but Tim Pool was like, oh, I'm not going to play the new Grand Theft Auto because it's a female lead. It's like, okay, I, I could not date a guy. Like, I could not date a guy that was like, oh, I'm not playing this video game. It's a female lead. I was like, cringe, bro, cringe. 
But that's the thing. It's like for some people, they're like, that's so attractive. He's such a man, Tim Pool, with his beanie and chubby cheeks. He's such a man. He like doesn't want to play GTA because like it's a girl lead and he's such a man. He can't even play a virtual woman. And I'm like, okay, like you do you girls. But like I could not imagine being that person and like I don't I want to be the opposite of Tim Pool. Whatever Tim Pool is, I want to be the opposite. <laughs> I couldn't eat. I couldn't imagine limiting myself to such a degree that I'd be too afraid to wear boys' clothes or girls' clothes. Or like, I just want to limit myself. All these people are always like, I don't want to limit myself. I want to reach the top. But you limit yourself in so many weird ways. Can you imagine not playing a video game because of the gender? What? Who? What? Huh? What? You know, you're in a very liberal bubbles, urban communities. Am I? I mean, I live in Croatia, so not really, but, you know, um, but you mean like in even in the States, I was living in a conservative Trump county. I was living in like the mountains of Arizona where everyone was like Mormon and conservative. Um, but if you mean like online or in my philosophy, yes. I mean, I'm in this community. You know what I mean? But anyways, you do. you. Like that. Um. The last thing that I want to say is that in, in my experience as a therapist. I mean, if you meet in my head, much more progressive than liberal. Achievement becomes way easier once people have gone through therapy. So I work with a lot of people who are executives, people who are not the demographic that you're describing. So people who are at the top end of net worth, like billionaires. And these are people who are have built gigantic companies from the ground up. Yeah, a lot of these billionaires go to therapy. Why aren't people paying attention to that? Wait, a lot of billionaires and millionaires are definitely going to therapy. They talk about it. Why don't they listen to them? Fuck Andrew Tate. He's poor. Listen to the billionaires. They go to therapy. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder why they don't care about that. And their experience in therapy is that it helps to take care of this emotional shit. It's just mm. about learning about this dimension of like self-understanding. And frequently I'll teach them meditate and all that kind of stuff too. Um, but whether it's like startups or streamers or just ordinary kids who are 24 years old and haven't done shit with their life, um, whatever the case is, in my experience that people usually get a lot better. They learn about themselves. They learn about things like their emotions and their thoughts, their desires, their impulses, and they get better at controlling all of that. And then they get better at life. I think Sneak goes out of spoons because even I'm lower on spoons. Like this is why I can only talk to someone for so long unless it's like a very specific thing. But I think Sneak goes very low on spoons right now. I'm feeling it too. Even though the conversation's really good. Okay. But what do you want? Do you have a son? No. I thought his kids were a boy and a girl. He has two girls. You saying that all now, I, I would, I would prefer that my son never even have to get to that position. He'd be strong enough to avoid that all. That's my point. Is that is that it, it can help people, but mm. you need people, you need men that don't need it at all. Uh, so, so this is the this is the other thing that I think is incomplete. You're using the word need. I would say that. At least 50% of my patients don't need therapy. So why do they go? It's a tool. Because it's a tool, my bro. It's just an extra tool. For optimization. To master themselves. Okay. Exactly. Because it's a tool. Alien. You know, Ali. Ali cattails. Spoons. Energy, my girl. Spoons. Uh, Spoons are, um, it was actually made by a woman with lupus to explain how like every task takes energy. So like brushing your teeth, taking a shower, like getting yourself food, sitting through a conversation, takes spoons, takes energy. And then when you're running on no or negative spoons, whoo, you want to see angry, cranky Brittany? Let me tell y'all. Okay. okay. To learn more about themselves from an expert who spent seven years studying to become a monk and meditating in the Himalayas, and then eight years become a medical, becoming a medical doctor, psychiatrist, neuroscience researcher, an expert in the mind and the body. 
and you go and you learn from that person mm -hmm. about how you work. When you have the impulse that you want to do anything, whether it be scratch something, scratch mm -hmm. an itch, piss, smoke, mm -hmm. make a joke. Right. But isn't, laugh. isn't it funny? Like, you're kind of agreeing with me. You're saying that because you're, you're a monk and. He keeps. See, that's the problem with winning and losing mentalities. It's not about, like, as long as you're healthy, there are so many ways to be healthy. Like, there are countless, limitless ways to be unhealthy. There are many ways to be unhealthy, right? But that's, like, kind of the irony is, like, work out. Go to therapy. Like, you don't have to go to the gym. It's just nice because they have more equipment. You don't have to do a lot of things to get better. It's just nice because the tool is there, right? It's, like, it's just it's just a tool. But people are like, is this it? If I do this, will it all get better? If I do this, will you give me all the answers? And it's like, no. If I reach five, will I be like, is that it? And they're like, no. And they're like, oh, if I do this. And I'm like, no. It's not the shortcut. It's radically accepting that like this is life. This is what it means to be alive. So every time you think about having a baby, remember that you're going to make them do exactly the fucking shit you had to do. Look at all these people just selfishly having babies while complaining all the time. If the world is so bad, stop bringing babies into it. Listen to all these fucking people. We have to make the world better for like people. And it's like, okay. So start with yourself. If you want to make the world better for people, start with yourself. But they don't want to because it's easier to point the blame on everybody else. Because you, you've connected with something spiritually, they're looking for some sort of guidance from you. Isn't the ultimate form of that guidance just talking to God? If I pray, that's like quicker. What, it's, it's almost the same thing, but just I see prayer as a... And they want the general answer. They want the answer that's good for everyone. And it's like there is no answer that's good for everyone. There's only the tool that's good for you. So maybe it's religion. Maybe it's meditation. Like, look, I'm really anti-religion. But if my caller is religious, I'll help you be the best fucking religious person you've ever been, homie. Like, if you want to be religious, let's do it in the best, healthiest way possible. Just because I'm not pro-religion doesn't mean you have to be. You know what I mean? But the problem is people don't believe that. Because, like, Sneeko and everyone else are like, no, if there's a way, everyone has to do it, right? It's like, um... I think it's because they don't want to feel left out that they've got it wrong. I think there's like a sense of competition that you've got it right. And I think that's fair because that feels pretty normal to me, like that thinking. I think what's exciting is like sharing information and seeing what lands. And then figuring out if you're talking about the same thing. Because that I think is the most confusing part of all of this. It's like, are we talking about the same thing? Because when I say healthy, it's not what everyone means by healthy right and that's what's confusing is like harm reduction let's talk about harm reduction does having gay parents versus straight parents in a society that accepts both harm reducing or harm contributing you know any significant way more so far no but we also haven't had a completely like pro lgbt community raise those kids so we don't know because some people won't let us experiment with it. And it's funny because they'll say, you can't just experiment with life. Like people's lives are being impacted. Yeah, so are mine. When you experiment with anything from putting in a traffic light to changing curriculum at school to like integrating X, Y, and Z, you are absolutely, we are all absolutely just experimenting. We are just trying to figure out what works. But we always preface this with, we know it's going to work. Do we? And what does work even mean when something is so, un like nothing is really universal, you know? There are things that are definitely seem to be better in terms of like harm reduction. It's a better vessel for that. It's, it's similar. Yeah, so I, I, so I, I, I mean, I think I've said this several times and I'll say it again. I, I'm not disagreeing with most of what you say, Sneeko. I've never said that prayer is not good or is not incredibly effective. My issue is one of probability and population. So I would, I'll be the first to, comp I mean, I even said in my own experience, spirituality has helped me way more than psychotherapy. But people are different.
Yeah. And there are some people who come to me who spirituality benefits a lot. And there are other people that we can, we sort of alluded to this at the beginning. We can get into it more if you want. But there's some people for whom faith is hard. There's some people for whom they don't hear God's voice. And it is a very dangerous assumption because this is an unfalsifiable hypothesis, right? So if I say you're not trying hard enough, that's why you don't hear God's voice. You can never disprove that. So let's say that there's one human being on the planet. Mm, great question. Vegan says, how would you react to a caller who wants to be a 2 or 2A? Well, first of all, I don't get people to levels. So you can't call me and be like, I want to be a level 5. It's like, I can't. Okay. Look, I, it's not up to me, first of all. So I can't make you a level 5. I can just give you tools. But like whether or not you end up a 5 is like, that's your journey, my bro. Whether or not you end up a 1 is your journey. But I don't have tools to make you those things. Like to be clear, you can't call me. And be like, can't give me the hand. I can't sell you a course on how to do this because it's individualistic. That's why I take individual calls, right? So like, to be clear, if you're thinking about, I'll call Brittany and she'll like get me to five. Like, I'm not going to get you to shit. That's your job, bro. I'm just here to chill. And people will call me. They're like, I'm a five. And I'm like, okay. I don't argue with people that tell me they're fives because like, why are you calling me for validation, bro? But also like, obviously not, bro. Why are you calling me for validation? And also like based because that's like such a human thing to do. But like I don't help people get to anywhere. I give you tools and if the tools help, great. Miss Fishy is true though. I did make her a level 69. That is true. That is a fact actually. That That's good. That's good business right there. Thank you. But truly, like I don't make you do anything. You know what I mean? I don't do, I just give you the tools and we talk back and forth. And if it's a vibe, it's a vibe. But if it's not, like, I hope the tools help you in the future, if not right now. Are your levels akin to spiral dynamics? I don't know enough about spiral dynamics to compare them. So I haven't read the book on it and I don't know, but I have been told maybe, but I don't know. I don't know how to compare the two really. Who it's impossible to hear God's voice. We would never be able to detect that, right? They could be trying 100%. They could be doing everything right. But it's possible that this person will never hear it. I disagree. So, I think it's possible for everyone, but I see what you're saying. Right. But I mean, you're allowed to think that, but you don't know that. Right. You can have faith in that. Sure. So I also for the... The difference between what we believe in and we know. Most of the world is built off belief, and that's not bad. It's just limiting which is fair. Record agree with you, which is, uh, you know, I, I agree with you that I think everyone can hear God's voice. But I can also say that just because I believe that doesn't make it true. Exactly, Aya. If you want to climb a mountain, whether it's Mount Everest or a smaller one, you're still climbing a mountain. I can't climb the mountain for you, my bros. You got to do it yourself. But I can hike next to you and talk to you about tools and give it to you. But I'm going to keep walking. And whether or not you use those tools to follow me, girl, that's you. True. In fact, what we know about truth is, to a certain degree, uh, internal. But we also know that there's plenty of data that, for example, you know, religiosity is protective in some ways. But we also know that, like, people... Actually, do we know that? Let me think about that. We also know that, let's talk about men, for example, that, like, men still kill themselves at an alarming rate. And we don't have great evidence that exercise is sufficient to protect against suicidality. Mm. But don't you see, isn't there a correlation between the amount of people, how much we are talking about mental health and the, the rise in suicide in men? More people are going to therapy than ever. Mental health is being talked about more than ever and also the suicide rate has never been higher. So what does a correlation mean to you? A correlation means that maybe, a correlation is, is when two things, um, Two things are consistent with each other. Yeah. So the question is, are are we talking more about mental health? Because You know what's crazy? Is even though the suicide rates in men are going up, I wonder if we're paying attention to if self-harm has gone down. Like in somebody like me, no one's ever asked me anything about my case. Right? It's not like anyone's gotten the statistic on me, right? How would they even know? 
What about all the people going to therapy that it's helped? Do we have those, like that data? And how do we even know that data? Because for me, like therapy mixed in obviously with philosophy and spirituality, like Dr. K said, for me, like philosophy and spirituality were the foundation I needed to have my therapy work for me. But like my therapy was so life changing. It was exactly the tool I had been looking for the whole time. Like I've been looking for many tools, but that was like the biggest, greatest tool I could have gotten. And it was the right kind of therapy. And I had to go through like a therapist that wasn't great for me till I found a therapist that was. And then once I found her, I didn't need very much therapy, but I needed enough, right? Just the right amount for me to go, okay, I got the tool. Thank you. And then I grabbed the tool and I fucking changed my whole fucking life, bros. Turned it around, but it would never have been turned around with therapy alone. I also need a philosophy and spirituality, right? I needed to believe in meditation. I needed to be open-minded. I needed to be considerate of other ways to do things. So it's like, I, and, and then I stopped self-harming. I haven't been depressed in four years. I haven't had a BPD splitting episode. I've literally like, that therapy for my borderline completely changed my life. So the question is, well, exam well, admitting out loud that, of course, I was considered pretty high functioning and I had a really great foundation. And to be fair, my parents are still together and like I have a lot of things going for me. So to be fair, I was dealing with a lot less of a severe case in some ways of borderline than other people, I think. So uh, I needed certain tools maybe. But anyways, what was I saying? Fuck. Oh, Therapy without those other things, it's really difficult without the foundation. And I think that's what happens is a lot of people go to therapy and they don't have the foundation, so it doesn't work. And then on top of that, when it does work, are they documenting people like me who like attempted but never completed? And I have no issues now. Like who's here to take my statistic down? Who wants to document my statistic? Because it's fucking cool. I love being one of the people that it worked for. But it only, again, it worked in conjunction with other things, just like Dr. K said, right? Um, the artifact says, even though 69 is usually syn synonymous with something else, is level 69 the peak level? Uh, 69, 69 is the, le hold on. God says 69 is the level um, where you actually get to like shake hands with him, so. I don't know if you're kidding, but obviously we're like making a joke. I don't know if you're making a joke, but we're making a joke. My work is worried about the first five stages of introspection, extrospection, and self-awareness. Everything after that, go study with somebody else. Um, let's see. Um, blah, blah, blah. Vegan says, is there even tools to get to a level one? Part of part of was wondering if someone's values were so different that you'd not want to help them reach their goals, like a goal to be a one example. Oh, um, well, I give people tools and I, most of the people who call me are, are pretty similar, uh, similarly minded or interested in themselves. I don't think, let me think, hold on. Okay. Well, first and foremost, if you're calling me to change something about yourself, like if you're calling me to actually hit a goal that isn't just like hanging out or something because that's also fun. I love when you guys call me and you just want to watch anime or YouTube videos or discuss like a lecture or something. Um, but if somebody called me and wanted to reach a goal that I didn't agree with, I would probably, uh, it depends on what it could be. No one's ever done that before. Like no one's ever done it before. So I'm trying to think of who it would be. Like, I don't know. I'd probably like talk them out of it or end calls with them but like I'm just trying to think of what it could be most people who call me are dope I have really great callers I have really great discord members I rarely have issues with people you know I remember one girl did call me though and she just wanted to spend time playing video games while I edited and I just didn't want to spend time doing that even though I was being paid so I asked her if like we could end the calls without her feeling completely rejected just because like I I can't actually do that. Like I, if you pay me like $250 an hour to just work while you're doing your own thing, that I probably wouldn't accept that. Like I could accept it if I could talk to you or if there was like some sort of conversation or maybe we were both chatting while we were working, but she literally wanted like no interaction. I was like, there is not enough stimulation in this conversation. 
And she was paying $30 for 30 minutes, to be fair. But I was like, girl, go save your 30 bucks and buy some Starbucks. I'm not doing this. So like, I'll turn down money for those reasons. Like, I have to also enjoy the call, guys. But yeah, no one's ever called me to do something like awful, I guess. Not that I can think of. Because people are more suicidal than ever? Or are people more suicidal than ever because we're talking too much about mental health? I think both things can be true. Yeah, so that's what a correlation is, right? There isn't a clear causation. Now, the interesting thing about suicidality is that the suicide rate is higher than it's ever been, but not by much. The really shocking thing, and this is what's really interesting, is that suicidality, especially in men, has been relatively constant. It's going up a little bit, but it is not actually correlated with the rise in mental illness. There's even one study that I was looking at recently that suggested that 50% of men who kill themselves have no evidence or history of mental illness, which for the record, I, I kind of buy. So I think a lot of suicide, 50% of, of men who kill themselves have no evidence or history of mental illness, oh. which for the record, I, I kind of buy. So he's thinking no history of mental illness because they didn't get diagnosed or because it was more impulsive? So I think a lot of suicide, a lot of men that kill themselves, and this is also like as a professional, there's a difference between someone coming into my office and who's suicidal because their mind is not functioning correctly. This is mental illness. It is a pathology. Ah. Their, their, their thoughts are warped. Yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. That's what we mean by illness. It's not functioning properly. But I'd say that half the men that come into my office, the reason they're suicidal is not because their mind is misfunctioning. It's because it's functioning very well. And they played the tape through to the end. And their genuine assessment of their circumstances makes it so that staying alive is not as good of an option as just ending it. Mm. That's what really scares me the most, is I think a lot of men kill themselves who are not mentally ill. Oh, interesting. Just because it's a spiral dynamics can be applied to analyze societal and cultural dynamics. Well, that's, I mean, yeah, the levels teach you mostly about your your introspection in relation to yourself against the bubbles and against yourself. So extrospection and introspection, but it's less about the dynamics of other people unless you're just examining them through the bubbles. So it sounds like spiral dynamics is like more talking about cultural differences, which is mostly about bubbles. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, I should look up more into um, spiral dynamics because that's interesting. I guess that's more it's more about like the bubbles than the relationship you're having to the bubbles. Is that more accurate? Oh, interesting. Like <clears throat> vegan says, like, it sounds like religion is something you think you can run parallel to your morals and somehow don't cross a certain line. Yeah, I don't care. Um, I've had callers who have been cheaters. I've had callers who have been thieves. I've had callers who, um, I don't know. I've had all kinds of like unique callers. I don't care what you're doing. I care that you're calling me to get a tool to either stop what you're doing or to reframe what you're doing. Like, again, like if you call me and you're like, hey, I'm cheating. I'm like, okay, what's up with that, bro? And then they'll tell me like, I've had so many unique callers. The idea is that I don't help people reach a goal. I give them tools to better their life and harm reduce and to face themselves. I'm not trying to get you towards a goal. I'm trying to neutrally help you by giving you tools and you decide what to do with them. You know, because like if you called me and you're like, I want to cheat on my husband more. I'd be like, why? I don't have tools to cheat on your husband more, bro. Like, I don't have those tools. I can't give them to you. But if you told me I'm cheating on my husband, um, I need tools to face myself. Like, okay, I know how to do that. Does that kind of make sense? Like, I don't have the tools to help you cheat on your husband more. I don't know how to do that. You know, I mean, I know how to do it. I could be a villain, but I don't know how to do it. Like, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? They're just, life doesn't offer them anything. Mm -hmm. life doesn't offer them anything um because they're not they're not working towards something I, that's the, the best way to avoid depression is to be occupied with what you're doing so much that you don't have time to think about it a lot of this mental health crisis is i think that's a really good way 
to like cope when you're not ready to be introspective, which is why I say people like go through moments of like being two, threes, fours, whatever they're doing. They like cope so they don't have to face themselves. Like Sneeko just said in the most beautiful way possible, um, be so busy you can't be introspective. Fair. I think most people are so busy they don't spend the time or make it a goal to be introspective. I think that's true. I think they're only introspective to a degree and just enough. Enough to shut down your feelings. Like you can be introspective enough to say, I have to shut down my feelings right now or I'm going to collapse. So Sneeko is very introspective enough to shut down his feelings so he can keep working, which is really interesting. That's a pretty good introspective tool. Due to the fact that people- But it's temporary. It's a Band-Aid. Are inactive. They're lethargic. They're lazy. And they're, they're living <laughs> internally instead of externally. Yeah. So, so uh, w once again, I think this is like where- I think I disagree with some, agree with some. So I completely agree with you that a contributor to the mental health crisis, and now we're getting into the polemic because we're talking about agree and disagree, but um, is because of inactivity. Completely agree. But I think the- Yeah, yeah, that's crazy about your MRI, bro. I've heard of that stuff though. If you like the differences in the brain, that's crazy. First part of what you said cool. is spoken like in terms of people can work, you know, work out and conquer depression. I think there's a subgroup of people that can. But that really is a statement made by someone who I don't think has been clinically depressed. Because if you really look and you talk to these people, I would argue that someone who's clinically depressed actually works way harder and puts forth a lot more effort than someone who is not depressed. Well, the difference is they just get very little out of it. So like think about the hardest thing that you've had to do. This is what I was like frustrated with my neurodivergency the other day or my chronic health or something because I don't know what to call it yet. But it was like my brain was so tired and I'm just like I'm working so hard but I'm like only producing so much compared to a person that wouldn't have these problems. And I'm like, okay, comparison is the thief of joy. We all have intrusive thoughts. No problem. What do I do with this thought? I'm like, I'm going to examine it. I'm going to pull it apart. I'm going to share it with my husband. We're going to look at it. And then we're going to accept that like this is a part of it. Because I'm still, you know, I'm still having a relationship with my fibro. And I'm still having like a relationship with my limitations. But yeah, I, even my younger self, like my younger self had so much more energy to an extent. But it is really interesting. You know what I mean? Um... But yeah, it's it's very interesting. Ugh, more sleep. Oh, I wish. Ideally, I'd be sleeping like 12 hours a day, like nine, nine to 12 hours a day. Um, I could. I could do it so easily, especially with the fibro. But uh, yeah, the world doesn't function on people who sleep nine to 12 hours a day, people. And what would your life be like if getting out of bed was that hard? So the scale of difficulty of people who are like clinically depressed is that Everything is like very difficult. Everything's the right boss. I think it's just a belief. Like saying that it's, if you believe that it's very difficult to get up, then it's going to be very difficult. But if you don't even have that as a possibility in your mind, then that's not going to be a problem. If you believe like I'm clinically depressed, I have a difficult time waking up. Guess so that, what's going to happen? So Sneeko, that's not how it works. So people don't think I'm clinically depressed. People resist it for a long time. I would even say probably 50% of people who are clinically depressed don't even- Oh, hi, Smithy Smith. Dr. K does a lot of refraining things in a validating way. He's so good at it, bro. He's so skilled, bro. I can't wait. I want all his tools, bro. Realize they're depressed. They just think life is really, really hard. They're not even aware. There's a huge underdiagnosis problem. <laughs> so and it's just life becomes- do you, do you difficult. give these people meds? You give them SSRIs? Cause sometimes. Sometimes. So I would say that... Um, um, again, somebody was diagnosed with depression. I also was a symptom of my borderline. I never took meds for anything. Never needed them. I needed meditation. I needed a DBT. And I needed a foundation of values and philosophy. So it's not always about meds. It's about what tools you need. You know what I mean, jelly beans? Oh my gosh, Sam, Cam, Cam, and Robin, literally, how many, even when I get like eight hours, it's not enough, which the rheumatologist told me. The rheumatologist did warn me. He was like, 
you're going to have to sleep more than you've ever slept in your life. And I was like, why? And he was like, your body's not going to recover the same. And I was like, what? And like, it would be great. Truly, when I sleep, if I sleep a minimum of nine to 10 hours, I feel so much better than if I sleep eight hours. Like I can't even tell. It's a huge difference. If I sleep in just an extra hour or two more, oh my gosh, I feel invigorated. But I'm usually still dead by the end of the night regardless. So the rheumatologist told me that would be normal. But chronic pain, all of these things, like, oh my gosh. And I do think the chronic pain heightened everything else. But oh yeah, like I can feel it. My body is in so much pain today. Like I woke up, my knees were snapping, like you could hear them. My body was just like, okay. So then I go, what do I do with this? So like Nico said, if I just don't think about it, it's not there. Totally. It's about willpower. It's true that regardless of how much pain I'm in and regardless of if I don't want to get up or not, I have to go to work. And that's good. Work gets me out of bed. That's really good news. Did a couple calls today. Um, had a great combos, like great time, vibes, got to do this today. Like, so Sneeko's right. In some ways, it is about willpower, but the pain's still there, bro. I'm fucking tired. Shit still hurts. I just do it anyways. And my head is pounding. I've got a headache because I don't sleep enough, but I can't sleep enough. Like nine to 10 hours a night is not where I'm at right now. Now, to be honest with you, I'm changing my, my call schedule in January. I'm going to announce it soon for Discord. So if you guys need to change your tiers, I get it. But I'm willing to do that because one, streaming is becoming like this full-time gig that's working out. But two, I'm limiting my call space. So if you want to call, I'm happy to do it, but there's very limited hours for it. And the reason for that is because I need sleep. So I know it's probably going to impact some stuff. That's usually pretty normal, but I have to sleep. So again, you're always picking and choosing what you're going to have, like what you can do, and then until you can switch things around. You know, Ingrid says you have an amazing or an insane amount of willpower. To be honest with you, honestly, I really do. Can I be honest with you? The one thing I fucking have is willpower. It's the thing I've been riding on negative spoons on my whole fucking life. It's not great because once I crashed, I crashed fucking hard, bro. I crashed so hard. I lost, like I was going to lose everything. So I try not to go back there. I try really hard not to use willpower too often. I try really hard just to like treat my body correctly. But that's just like, this is the part of the chronic health and radical acceptance that I think is still a learning curve for me. And I know a lot of you have been suffering a lot longer than I have. So you probably have better tools. So give them to me, please. But like Sneeko has to understand it's, it's mind over matter when you're doing willpower. But willpower is like using negative energy. It's like taking, it's, it's like taking a loan of spoons. The way I think of willpower, willpower is dipping into a piggy bank of spoons that aren't even mine. I'm loaning them out. And when I have to pay those spoons back, I'm going to crash. You know what I mean? So literally, that is how I think of it. Every time I think like, I'm going to do this anyway, I'm going to wake up anyways. I'm going to force myself out of bed. I'm going to like wake up every morning and move my body and try to get it going. I know I'm going to pay for it later. So willpower is great, but you will pay for it later. Just like shoving down your feelings, just like all of these things. And so the, the idea is how do you get ahead of it so you're not dipping into those negative spoons? So you're not taking out a loan from the spoon bank. <laughs> my personal prescribing pattern is 25% of my patients are on medication. If I prescribe medication, it depends on the patient. If, I'm, if I prescribe medication, I would say that 70 to 80% of people that I prescribe medication for will be off of medication within 12 to 18 months. So I think medicine is a tool just like anything else. I don't think that antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication fix anything, but they make your life easier as long as you take the pill. Easier in some ways, more difficult in others. Yeah, that, and I don't that, think that, that That's why I think it goes back to belief because you have to accept that life is always gonna be difficult. It's not supposed to be easy. It's sure. going to be hard. Who's, who's, who said that? Hold on a second. Life itself is suffering, but it doesn't always have to be hard or it doesn't, well, it doesn't always have to be awful. I think my life's pretty good. Like, I, I hope you guys know, even though I'm dealing with chronic pain and all that shit, life's pretty damn good, bros. Like, life is chilling. I get to eat. I can pay my rent. Like, I get to, I am get to hang out with my cat every day. I get to chill. I get to do this for a living. Like, even though I'm in chronic pain every day, like, okay, that's life. I can deal with it. It's annoying. But okay, 
I'd rather have this than everything else I had to deal with in the past. Like this is still the best. Like this is still, I'm always like, life is always getting better. But it, like life itself is hard, right? Making sure you to go to work, making sure you engage in that willpower, making sure you pay your bills. Like that stuff is hard, but every, like it's still joyful. It's still beautiful. It's still wonderful, you know? I don't agree with that. You're saying that giving the medication makes their, their lives easier. No, no, I don't say medication, but I'm saying that I don't agree with you that life is supposed to be hard. I think life is supposed to be easy. Really? Yeah, my life is easy. Is your life hard? There's a, yeah, I would say my life is difficult, yeah. I mean, no, compared, compared to a lot of people, no, I live in the first world, make a lot no, of money. I mean, forget about comparison. Is your experience of life that it's harder? That it's yeah, easy? there's difficult things that I go through every single day, every day. Aren't you tired of that? Interesting. Interesting. I think it's hard. Well, what tool is Dr. K about to give me? Because I do think like paying your bills is hard. But I also think it's like life. You know what I mean? But like life is hard because like it's hard on us as a human species that we have to like we can't just eat. We can't just sleep somewhere. We have to like get a job and figure it out. Like there's something hard about that inherently about knowing that if you don't work, you don't eat. There's something really hard about that, right? So hold on, let's see what he says. But no, I, I enjoy conquering. I enjoy difficult situations. I enjoy solving the puzzle. That, that's what makes life- Me too, life me too, Sneaks. Worth it is, for the, is, the, is the everyday struggle. If you don't, if you can't that accept that, then you're going to become depressed. If you think that it's, that, a, that, I think that, if people believe that it's supposed to be easy, that's when they fall into depression. If you can't accept the fact that so, you need to work, then you're going to, yeah, of course you're going to cry. So, so let me, let me ask you a different question. Would you say that you suffer on a daily basis? Suffer? No, I no. wouldn't say. Well, I think life is suffering in a poetic way. I suffer because I've seen suffering. Yeah, obviously. Like, I don't wake up every day thinking my life is hard. I wake up every day thinking my life is easy. I just think it's pretty hard to have to, like, pay your bills and to eat. But that's normal, right? It's a normal kind of hard. Like, going to the gym is hard, right? Is that the right way to say it? Like, going to the gym is hard, but it's still, like, pretty privileged that you have time to go to the gym, right? So it's like, you can live a privileged life and it be hard. I think Dr. K is hearing that Sneeko is, like, yeah, because life isn't supposed to be, life is hard, but it's also joyful. Like life is hard, but it's also joyful. You, you can be joyful and, and life can still be hard. But yeah, I think it's pretty. Let's keep listening. I've yeah, so I mean, I, I think my life is pretty easy. I think there's a language issue here, like a semantic yeah. issue. But yeah. I, I think that, and it sounds to me like you rather enjoy the difficulty of life. That's a better way to, to deal with it. For example, like, uh, I, my dad's from Haiti. And from a very young age, I always saw some of the worst poverty the world has ever seen. Haiti's one of the poorest countries in the world. And they don't go to therapy there. They don't get, the suicide rate is very low. The suicide rate is higher in first world countries where people get to talk about their feelings more. And when people get to think about what they think and how they feel and how it should be better. But the suicide rate is lower, even though there's more poverty. And it's because they don't even... That idea that life is supposed to be easy doesn't exist. They've all accepted that it's difficult and they find enjoyment anyway. So there's a couple of things. So that, that's, uh, I, I, Sneeko, it's really interesting to talk to you because I, I, I don't think you're wrong. Once again, I think it's incomplete. So there are a couple things to consider. One is how is suicide rate in Haiti measured? No, I don't know. I don't know. Right. So one I, I, know that, one, I know that's not a one, thing there. I know that like the average, there's, there's no, no like therapy system. There's not hold, this in hold Haiti. On. Yeah. So if you don't have a, 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 a how, so when someone dies, uh, anyway, so the, a couple of something, a couple things to understand. One is in developing countries like Haiti. Um, one thing you've got to be super careful about is that suicides are not cataloged as suicides because they don't have an infrastructure to detect suicide. They right, love it's, it's anecdotal evidence. I'm saying like, I know people yeah, have talked yeah. to people and I, I, I would vouch for the fact that Haitians, if there's any, well, they, they would probably say the same thing. They don't know anybody who's like, that's not really real there. They don't talk about that. Yeah, I, well, it's not that it's real. It's like, is it, that's not, okay. It doesn't, uh, it just, which is, yeah. But everybody in the first world, everybody in America, everybody in the West knows somebody who's killed themselves or threatens to kill yeah, themselves. So, People so Sneeko's chat is sharing suicide rates of Haitians. God bless them. Hold on, let me see. Who's, like, that's not really real there. They don't talk about that. Yeah, uh, it somebody put, um, according to who published in 2020, 
uh, unaliving rates in Haiti reached 1,085 or 1.2 point, 1.2 oh 1.2% of the population of total deaths. The age-adjusted death rate is 11.17 per 1,000. Population ranks. That's so funny. You know, it's again, it's like that. It's that association with why the thing is happening. Right. Like, why does something happen is kind of what I'm mostly interested in. Like, why do people want to unalive themselves? I think it's really rational to feel so burdened by life. You don't know what else to do, which is hopefully why you seek help, because they'll give you different tools to do something else. Right. Somebody said paying bills is hard. Making money is hard. Not paying bills. I don't know. Speak for yourself. Doing paperwork is exhausting. Getting online to pay my bills takes spoons. OK, so I don't know about you, but actually paying my bills is also exhausting to me. It's not that hard, but it's exhausting. It takes like definitely a spoon or two to pay my bills. But I pay them on time, girl. We ain't got no time for late fees. But also um, making money could be really easy for some people. Um, I think it's always default hard, though, uh, even when you have a great job, but easy and hard are subjective. So all of this is just like, um, like he said, semantics. I think we're just having different conversations. I think existing is difficult. Being alive is hard, especially when you're sick or especially when you're in a world that's like discriminating against you, right? So I think like life is just hard, but I also think like life can be beautiful and easy. Like I think I have, a, I'm, I have the easiest life I've ever had because I have stability, but I think life outside myself is very difficult. Because, like, look at the world. And I also think joy is very attainable because look at the world and look at yourself. So it's more like there's just so much nuance in this conversation about whether or not life should be suffering. It's more like life is what it is and you do your best with it. Doesn't it? Uh, which is, yeah. But everybody in the first world, everybody in America, everybody in the West knows somebody who's killed themselves or threatens to kill themselves. Yeah, so, People so, who cut the so wrists. It, it, and you're not, you're not wrong that... So I think there's a caveat there. It's not quite as black and white, but I, I would also agree that, and I think we sort of have evidence for this, that the better society becomes, the worse our mental health becomes. Mm -hmm. So the more that we become, the more that our physical needs get met, met the worse our mind will become. Strong that, men uh, make easy times, uh, hard times make strong men, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I think it's strong men make easy times, easy times make weak men, weak men make hard times. And hard we are times. in the easy times have made. Welcome, Charlie, to members. Hello. Welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Weak men, period. Yeah, so I, I don't, don't quite agree with that because I think that there's also like a level of evolution where the cha the, the difficulties that we face have changed, right? So the way that I see that is like, we had to fight for survival and now we have to fight for contentment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just the, 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 So that's the struggle. That's what Sneeko means when he said life is hard. Life is a struggle. So that's what he means. And then what Dr. K means is like your individual life doesn't have to be a struggle, which I agree with. So life as a species will always be difficult. Life as an individual doesn't have to be that hard. But you have to be able to have a relationship between you, the existing, and the existence. So you have to be able to like have the joy within yourself. Bunny says it might be unrelated, but having joy inside yourself also is important. Like realizing is you. I think joy inside the self is the purpose. So you're finding joy, whether you're, no matter how introspective you are, you're a two, you're a five, it doesn't matter on my on my level system. Joy is possible and you're finding that joy because joy is furthest from evil and evil being this like thing we've created to symbolize like destruction and ugliness within ourselves, right? So obviously Sneeko, that's a hilarious pause on Sneeko's face, but obviously Sneeko is agreeing with Dr. K that like, Life as a species is hard because we're always fighting for the survival. But as individuals, you're not always in survival mode. Sometimes you get to live, my bros. Enemy we're facing is different. So we used to die from things like infections, but like, thank God for antibiotics. And now the, the crisis that we're dealing with, because we've sort of fixed everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting because if you really look at it, every dimension of medicine has gotten better over the last 50 years, except for mental health. Mental health is the only one place where we're losing the war. And it's because we have so much time to think about it. We've never had more time to Maybe. focus on it. No, it's true. It is true because we have more time to think about it. Because now we can actually, we now 
we don't have to shove it down anymore. Now we don't have to ignore it. Now we can face ourselves. Now we can have a conversation with ourselves. And by the way, people in the in past places have absolutely had these conversations with themselves, right? Yeah, so I, I think that we have more idle minds than we've ever had. We, interestingly enough, if you look at our, our society, we have the least time to process that we've ever had in, in the history of humanity. How is that? So, because if you think about the way that people used to live, like we used to be like, let's say hunter gatherers or farmers. So we had a lot of rote activity with mental time that was free. So yes, maiden, it's the meaning crisis, exactly. Our minds were free most of the time. Now our minds are occupied most of the time. So for example, like let's say we went out and hunted, right? And I shoot an arrow and I miss the deer. And then you shoot an arrow and you hit the deer. And then I feel bad about it because man, Sneeko's such a better, he's so Chad and I'm so beta or whatever the fuck. And then what happens is we carry this deer for two hours back and then I have plenty of time to process on that two hours like my feeling of inferiority. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at like hunter gatherers and stuff like they've just got a lot of time to mentally work through whatever goes on. Now what's going on is we're so, our minds are so distracted usually by technology that we have no time left for processing. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So it's a combination of having enough time to like notice the problem or not enough time for processing. Remember we watched that neurodivergent girl who said once she realized like she definitely had autism and she got worse as she got older because she didn't realize how much she was masking and, and pushing herself down. I relate to that so much. It's like, I really made it through my my adolescence and my teens and my 20s, barely, but I made it through in the most like successful way I could have for somebody with my specific toolbox. And I, I will say I'm better than I've ever been, but I'm also dealing with a lot more. See, it's different. It's like, I understood what she meant where it was like, you deal with so much and then once you solve all those things, you just have a new set of problems that are interesting to solve about yourself if you're being introspective, if you're knowing the self, if you're like, so I'm realizing that about myself where I'm like, oh crap. So like, here's the new boss. Like I beat the old boss in the video game and now I'm onto the new boss and the new boss is more skilled and more, you know, intricate, but the graphics look better. I have more weapons. I've gone up a power level. So in some ways it's easier and in some ways it's more difficult, but in some ways it's a blessing because man, does it keep me busy? And now we have studies that show if you fucking go for a walk where there are trees, it's like good for your mental health. Like we know that. Is it some of it vitamin D? Sure. But some of it is just processing time. We don't have any time to process. This is why a lot of people like what happens is they're so technologically occupied. And then when they go to sleep at night, the thoughts come flooding back. All of the things that they've they built up, everything that they've suppressed, everything that they've shoved down comes flooding back and then they can't sleep. Then they've mm. got insomnia and then they'll use a CBD, whatever, or like drink or, you know, whatever. Or they'll wait till they're so fucking fatigued that they absolutely pass out mm -hmm. because they can't go to bed. Do we agree on, on, it seems like we agree. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's also that weird polemic that we're slipping into where it's like, do we agree or disagree? Which I, I don't know how we keep on getting here, but I think it's something about something about the way that you speak triggers that in me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I got it's a pretty like aggressive way of speaking. Yeah, but I, I don't think you're aggressive. So there's something subtle about it. I'm still trying to figure it out. Mm. What were you going to say earlier? You make... Remember you were going to uncover something like an hour ago and you laughed and said, I'll tell you later. What was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, so you actually got there pretty quick. This is this whole thing about like, so I, I don't know if this kind of makes sense to you, but being noticed is very important for you. Mm. That's why you like it. You like being seen. You love being seen. Right. And you, I mean, you kind of, you kind of jumped right into it because you said like, yeah, I felt invisible. Like, and, and so th this is where I, what I would encourage you to really think about is if you pay attention to yourself, you'll find, and I think God will help with this, by the way. So I, I totally see why. Um, I, I totally see, I, I think it fits with my understanding of you, why religion is so potent for you. Uh, but I, I think, you know, I think you really like to be noticed. And I, I think you actually like to play games with people and it makes you very happy when you're, when they're able to see through it. And then I would also venture that 
you don't like it when they see some things that you're not proud of. And the beautiful thing about God is that. Yes, maidens, Nico is legit going through his own meeting crisis. It's so beautiful. I love it. I love it. It's really great to see. I love watching people go through a meeting crisis because it means they're so much closer to finding themselves and being joyful. And it's so beautiful to see. And this is what I want to see. It's really hard, though, to know if he's going to go through the transformation. And that's what's difficult. It's like, let's go, bro. But I'm not, you know, whatever the journey is, I'm I'm just happy that he's having these moments. I also just think he's going to utilize the tools. I'm kind of banking on it. You know what I mean? I'm really excited about that. I just... It makes me so happy. He's just, he's only like 25, right? Like 25, 26. He's just a babes. And he's just at the beginning stages. And he's ADHD. They've been doing studies on people with neurodivergency. And they say that their brains don't even finish developing until they're a little older, maybe. So he's still at the beginnings of his life. He's not even fully developed, bro. It's okay for God to see those things. Right? Because there's no ego with God. But with other human beings, there's ego. Yes. And to which I would say, th this is a... I, my perspective, okay? I'm not saying I'm right here. I, I feel like I'm right about a lot of things about psychotherapy and whatnot, but this is my opinion. I believe it a lot, but... So here's the thing. So you're saying that the joy comes from God, right? And God is special because with God, you're egoless, and with, with without your ego, you can surrender to God, and then it feels amazing, right? Yes. So one thing I would encourage you to think about is what is responsible for all of that goodness? Is is the key thing the surrender of ego or is it God? Oh, it's God. So the cool thing, so I, I would disagree. I think God is really good at getting. Ooh. That is an interesting, I've never seen Dr. K. Huh, have we ever seen Dr. K? Have we seen Dr. K like full on disagree with the God mythos? Like, have we had that him? I don't know if he's had that interaction with people before. Ooh. Getting you to surrender your ego, but I would say that surrendering your ego is going to have the effect. God is just a really good way to do that. And if you can surrender your ego, even with another human being, it's fucking liberating, man. It feels amazing. Right, but that's it's uh, it's almost impossible to to do that. No, it isn't. Why? That's that's why people like therapy because they go that and they go there and it's a place where they can surrender their ego and they have someone who helps them see that. I'm not trying to convince you to go to therapy, but I I think that almost impossible is like it's like kind of saying like it's almost impossible to fly. Well, yeah, if you don't know how to build a plane, I agree. Mm -hmm. But there's a there there are literally techniques, and even even if you look at Islam and Mecca, he said, "Oh, that's so, oh, this is such a big moment." He just got given a tool by somebody. Like, oh, this was really good. I bet he gonna soak that up. That's so interesting, because he doesn't know, or maybe he does. This is oh, this is so good. Oh, this is so good. Confusion says, "What level do I think Dr. K is?" I don't know. I don't, but I want to say he's probably a five. And then on an actual like enlightenment scale, I don't know because I don't know the enlightenment scales, but I would probably say from all the work I've seen from Dr. K, he's probably a five. I can't imagine he's a two. He could be, he could be a three or a four, but I think he's a five. I could be wrong. Like I really could be wrong. I don't know, but oh man, this shit gets me so excited. Because again, I really do love when people like transform and they face themselves. I really think it's like the greatest thing to watch in a person is like them finding themselves. It's just, it's so good. And things like that. And you know, all these rituals they come up with are all physiologically and psychologically priming you for surrender, mm -hmm. to clean yourself, to wear white. They figured this stuff out, man, that ain't random. Mm -hmm. Someone sat down and realized, okay, when I wash myself before I go into a temple, my capacity for surrender increases. Mm -hmm. It becomes easier to surrender. Right. He is not literally a monk, Marina. Fun fact. I learned recently that Dr. K got rejected as a monk. He was training to be a monk, but he actually got rejected. 
And they said, it's not your calling. And they sent him back and he applied to medical school, took three years of applying and got rejected from like 150 plus medical schools for three years before he got accepted because he was flunking out of school. He was failing. His parents are like, you have to go to India. His dad's like, you have to go to India. He goes to India. He gets thrown into the circumstance that's totally like insane. You have to watch the iced coffee hour on it. It's so good. And then he's training to be a monk. And they ba- he doesn't make it, the cut. Which, by the way, you know, a good Catholic priesthood will do the same thing. My brother tried to be, two of my brothers tried to be priests. No, three of my brothers tried to be priests. And they all got rejected. They're like, nope, it's not your calling. It's not your calling. Nope, next. It's not your calling. Which is very interesting. Which I think is very interesting. And it's true. Like, I think the people who care about your joy will let you know it's not your calling in the best way possible. But they have to be very insightful and they have to be very unbiased, even though everyone is biased. But they like that's what I'm saying. I think one of my skills as a as a person who takes calls is if you're the even if you're different from me, I will do my best to lead you to your joy, even if I don't like I'll try my best to give you every tool at my disposal because it doesn't have to look like my joy. I'm it's not a requirement because I heavily believe it's never going to look like my joy. It's very much easier to do it unlike Sneeko He not only doesn't know how to dispel the ego, he doesn't know how to find his joy, but he thinks there's a universal answer, right? And there's something to that. Mm. Yaya says, um, Sneeko doesn't want to even think about letting God go because he can finally, he finally found something that makes him feel censored. Even though it's new, it's still scary to even question it. I wonder how censored it makes him feel, to be honest, but we'll see. I'm excited. I'm very excited. Like to see what happens. And so the interesting thing is in my experience, it's the surrender itself that leads to the awesomeness. And God is just very easy to surrender to because there's not an ego on the other side of the table. Right? It's hard to, uh, it's hard to surrender when there's an ego on the other side. Mm -hmm. Harder, completely agree. And the challenge is that not everyone can feel God the way that you can. Mm. Everyone, everyone can. I know you're saying that there's too many generalizations, but everyone can. And it's, it's where I also disagree is just saying that it's, it's all has to do with faith. I think there's a lot of logic that comes around God. It's not just, yeah. it's not just faith. It's, it's also scientific. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of logic when it comes to God, too. I don't think it's just faith. I think faith seems to be, for especially for the, the Abrahamic religions, faith seems to be the central piece of it. Mm. That's my understanding as an outsider. I would say that faith is more, it appears to be more important than logic. I, I don't know if you, I mean, you're the one who's Islamic, so you tell me. Or Muslim. Right, but I wouldn't be able to, well, this is my personal experience. I wouldn't be able to find faith without first logically coming to the fact that God created everything. First, I have to, I had to understand that there has to be one intelligent designer, that we can't exist without God, that we're all, uh, the concept of uh, Tawheed, of oneness, that there's one creator and we're all, he created the universe. So uh, arriving there logically then helped me find faith. Yeah. So I, I think that that's oftentimes many people's experience is that they have some kind of intellectual, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is like an intellectual comfort sounds too small, like an intellectual realization. And then that sort of forms faith. Yeah. Okay. I'll be there soon. You got to go? Uh, soon. I I think we're, I I usually talk to people for between an hour and two. And, and so we're, we're coming up on two hours. Do you have other thoughts or questions? No, I think this is a good discussion. I think, uh, I think this is an interesting conversation. Um, did I satisfy your, your uh, you had asked a question about what, what I understood about that it being invisible and being noticed and stuff. Did, 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 that, did I answer that? I know I was being playful about it earlier, but I, I don't want to leave you hanging there. I think it's less about being noticed, but also it, it's an innate desire to, I want to inspire and I like connecting with people. It's not really like a, a look at me, look at me thing. It's more that I want to be sure that I have a positive impact on the world, that there's something where, that. Where yeah. does that come from? I 
I don't know. I think that that's... Okay. <laughs> this is the stuff that I just like... My Again, I love problem solving. I love watching people problem solve, right? So it's not about being seen or validated. I just want to know that I'm making something that's like inspiring people, which is a form of validation. It's a form of validation that I want to problem solve your problems. So like I'm one, entertained, and two, I'm proving to myself that I can solve problems, right? It is a form of validation when you guys feel like I've given you tools. It's always a form of validation. It's always about being seen or at least being useful or at least being, it's always about something. You know what I mean? So it's kind of interesting. You know what I mean? Obviously, I think Islam is probably a placeholder for his journey and I don't think he's going to last. I've heard him say, even recently, back and forth about Islam being a joke and Muslims and all this stuff. I really can't wait till he's after 30. I am so stoked to see Sneeko after 30. It's going to be such a big change, right? Like, I think it's going to be a big deal. But I'm so excited for this conversation because I think this might have been, and maybe this is my bias because I love Dr. K's work, but I think this was the most tools and the greatest tools Sneeko has needed this whole journey that I wasn't able to give him fully that other people weren't able to give him fully. I think, I feel like I gave Sneeko partial tools, but I never felt the feeling like he really grasped onto what I gave him, but I know he internalized it because he's smart and capable. But whether or not he'll utilize it, maybe. He seems like he's so good in conversation. He's so good here. This Sneeko is the Sneeko that I talk to. So in it, like when I think of Sneeko, I think of this Sneeko. And it's hard not to like this Sneeko. Because he's very thoughtful and interesting. And yes, he doubles down on his ideas. But girls, I grew up in a conservative home. This is easy. This is a good, this is a nice person to talk to. Um, if you think Sneeko's harsh in this conversation, you would cry. With My parents would make you cry. My siblings would make you cry. But to be fair, I come from a bully family. Uh, it's, you know, a Middle Eastern bully family. We bully each other with love. But it is a, it's a big competition family. So I get it. But yeah, we're like, you know what I mean? It's just, it's so interesting to me, this version of him, you know? That's a, I think it's a universal, I think it's the masculine imperative. <sighs> so this is what's so interesting to me is why do you, why are you so quick? And it's not an accusation. I'm really curious. Like, why are you so quick to say your experience is universal. Because I don't think that I'm that, I don't think I'm different from most people. I think a lot of people are, I think men are all the same and women are all the same to an extent. Like we all have the same sort of wants and needs. We're all Can I tell you something about this? We had, I don't remember, was it on the Discord guys? We had conversations about this, about feeling normal. Yeah, I must have been on the Discord. And I feel normal. I feel like I'm a normal person. But I don't really believe in normal as a concept. I just think you're normal in your bubble and then you're a freak in someone else's. So like in in my bubble, like Sneeko's kind of like silly and kind of like a weirdo. But in my his bubble, I'm probably the weirdo and vice versa. Like we're all probably the weirdo to somebody. But I think it's also a defense mechanism of saying like, I don't feel that abnormal and I don't want people to think I'm abnormal when I know I'm normal. So everyone must be like me. It's like an it's a fear. I'm afraid that I'm not normal but everybody's their own consciousness. And then we share like this consciousness because we share like the universe. So everybody is their own version of normal. Everyone feels normal after they've battled not feeling normal, but everyone wants to feel like themselves. Let's say it like that. Everyone wants to feel like themselves. So we tell ourselves like, I'm the one who's normal. You're not normal. You're the freak. Okay. And it's really it's really about their ego saying like, I don't want to see myself as different. All of you are different. All of you are freaks. And all of you are normal. I just think people are people everywhere. And I think a lot of us are more similar than we think. And I just think we're amongst so much like diverse people. But if we put all of ourselves into bubbles with all of the categories we fit into, there would be a lot of people like me and a lot of people like you and a lot of people like Sneeko. We've, I've known like 17 Sneekos. I hate to say it, like he is normal. And yet he's not like every man I know. 
My husband is nothing like Sneeko. My husband has absolutely almost zero overlap with Sneeko's experience as a man because he's a different category of man. Everyone is having a completely different experience. You know what I mean? And so the idea that like I feel normal is like a cope, it's more of a defense mechanism to me. I feel normal. Of course you're normal. And of course you're a freak. You're a normal freak. Normal freaking. Well, I think deep down we're way more similar than people give us credit for. That's true. We are similar because we love and we hate and we go through ups and downs. We're not similar because we're men or women. Sometimes some men and some women are similar. I told my partner, like, if I was just in Croatia looking at people, I would think, like, all of a sudden they'd be speaking English. But they don't. They speak Croatian. And we can't understand each other. And though they look Croatian, they do look different here compared to Americans. And there's obviously no brown people, really. There's some brown people, but not a lot. Um, and different kinds of brown people. Oh, that's another thing. Well, I'm in Europe. I'm in a bubble where there's Croatians, Serbs, and brown people from other places that I don't know, but they're not the brown I see in America. They're a different kind of brown. And I'm like, oh, interesting, because I'm on a different part of the world. So I get a different, like, it's really cool. And it's like very awesome. And I'm like, oh, look at that. And like, oh, when I saw a, like black families here, I got, I don't know why I thought they'd be American. <laughs> I was like so excited to be like, where are you from? Oh, and then they were like speaking a language. That I was like, oh shit. Like I'm, I keep thinking I'm going to run into Americans. Every time I see people that I'm like, I recognize this color. Oh, no. And it's like, it's a really weird bubble pop to be like, oh, okay. So like, hmm. And it's like their normal is different than our normal. Like I keep thinking I'm going to have, but people are people everywhere. <clears throat> they were a family. They had kids. They were on vacation. They were just chilling. They're just a normal family. I, you know what I mean? They're just normal, but they're not the normal, meaning the common I expect. They're not my normal because they speak a different language and they're not from the States. And, but they're, they're still just people. People are people everywhere. They have families and kids and they, everyone is the same. It's just, everyone's have a different relationship with that sameness. When I say I love my family, I'm not saying the same thing someone else says when they say they love their family. We're having a different experience, right? Um, Augustine says, what made Dr. K as made you see Dr. K as a five? When did that change? What did I say he was before? I don't remember. Did I number him before? I don't remember. Um, I don't know. I've just been watching a lot of his work. I'm just guessing. I know he's not a one. I don't think he's a two. I doubt he's a three. He doesn't seem like a four. Must be a five. You know, but um, I've just been watching a ton of his work and the way he talks, the way he talks to different people, the way he shares his own ideas, his own lived experience. I mean, that's what I'm assuming, but I don't know him, right? Do you think he took it, anything in that he just heard Brit? Yeah, I think he took it all in. Sneeko, I think he heard every word. I think he's been repeating it back to Dr. K this whole time. Even though he's been tired, he has been properly replying to Dr. K the whole time. So yeah, I think he is taking it all in. But that doesn't mean what? He's going to take it in and boom, change presto. No, he's probably going to meditate on it for the next five to 10 years. And then he might change, you know? Okay. I think a lot of people like to feel as if they're unique. I think that's why people go to therapy to think that their individual experience is special. And I think we need to remove that idea that we're all special because we're not. We are not special or unique. And yet your consciousness is so unique. Your soul, whatever you want to name it, it is so unique. I will never know another you. I will never know another Yaya. I will never know another Fishy. I will never know another Ingrid. But there are plenty of people like you. And so you are not unique, but I will never meet you again. And so I'm so lucky to know you now. Right? But like ultimately, I, of course we're not unique, but who we are, our literal consciousness, I just don't think that can be replaced. Maybe transformed, maybe recontextualized, but even I don't believe that. I don't really believe in karma or reincarnation. Mean, I don't believe in reincarnation. But if I did, you know what I mean? But like, yeah, of course you're not unique. You think you're the only like autistic queer person who's existed in the world? No, not that any of you are autistic or queer, but you know who you are. But no, like literally, of course not. 
but the person, that consciousness that you are, there will never be another one like you, ever. And in that way, you are unique. You know, we're, we're, we're all God's creation and we're not that different. You know, there's nothing that really separates me from anybody, from, from you or anybody watching this right now. I don't think that, I, I don't think we're that different. And I think the, the best thing we can do with our time is to, is to create and inspire. Hmm. I think I figured out why, why this get, becomes polemic so quickly. So you do speak in very declarative statements that seem, uh, they, they don't offer a whole lot of wiggle room. So I think it invites other people to disagree with you because you, you don't have a statement that's like 95% in one direction. Everything is 100%. That's true. So, so and I, I think unless someone agrees with you 100%, it naturally invites the discrepancy. Right? So if I say like all people are X, it's very easy for people to come back and say, no, they aren't. But if I say some people are X, it doesn't invite it's it's less inviting for disagreement, but it's okay. I mean, I, it's really interesting. I mean, I, what I would encourage for you, if that's okay, can I offer you some sure things to think about? Sure. Um, the first is, do, do you like? I, I know you talk to a lot of people, and you seem actually quite open-minded to me. Is that our open-minded king? He is open-minded. That is who Sneaku is. I'd want to know if Dr. K thinks Steven's open-minded. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm tired. I'm out of spoons. I am both. I'm exhausted. But like... Um, mm. Is that fair? Yeah, I agree. Um, but what I'm kind of curious about is... I you don't, the way that you talk, so I'm a little bit confused because on the one hand, you seem quite open-minded. So even, it, not debating, but you know, at the very beginning, you're like, therapy doesn't work for anyone. And then like later on, you're able to see, okay, I can understand how it could be useful for some people, but I still think prayer is more effective, which is completely fair, right? But that, there's, you're not actually very rigid with your thinking. Either a lot of declarative statements, a lot of, I would say, inflammatory statements, a lot of like lack of like, uh, Sneeko's chat's like, Sneeko's a leaf in the wind. Declared here. Sneeko, a leaf in the wind. Confirmed. <laughs> Empathy. Yes. Which I think upsets a lot of people, right? Because you don't really, you're, what you believe is like universally true is what I am really getting a lot of from you. Mm -hmm. So what I'm kind of mm -hmm. curious about is, uh, you seem open-minded, but do you like listen to other people? I do, quite a bit. I think yeah. I listen to people more than most. Uh, I, and, and so, yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, I had an interview series in New York called The Woman to Podcast where I just would uh, set up a table in the subway station and talk to people and just look at them and listen. I think I've talked and listened to more people than 99.9% .9 of people. Obviously, you probably have done it extensively, but compared to how long I've been doing interviews and speaking to people, doing The Woman to Podcast, I think that I have a sample rate of speaking to people that's more than most by far. Yeah. So, so what I'm curious about is when someone shares something that is contrary to your worldview, what does your mind do with it? Probably um, immediately fight against it. Okay. Or, or no, not, not even just that, but also, no, I, I allow myself to, to see if it's true. I, I think about it. I think about it. Yeah, so that, that's also what's kind of confusing for me is like, I, I, I think I can see you thinking about it. And and part of the reason that I was uh, interested in speaking with you is because I've, I've seen a little bit of your stuff and you actually seem to think about stuff. Like, I don't get the sense that, I mean, I think you're quite inflammatory, but I don't think you're you're quite as rigid as, as, as you don't seem very rigid to me. You actually think about stuff. But what I would really encourage you to do um, is when someone says something that you think think about don't just critically analyze it try your hardest to understand how that could be true for this person that's a, another idea that i just disagree with philosophically i don't think that there's your truth or my truth as much as people like to give it i think that there is one 
universal truth. And that's what, I, that's what I've always been trying to get to, is what is the truth? Because everybody yeah. has this belief that there is my truth, my truth, and I, I think that's where people I, lead astray. I, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't think that, I'm not talking about my truth or your truth. I know it sounds weird because that's what I'm sort of asking you to do, but I, I'd actually say that, I know it's kind of bizarre, but to get to the one truth, I think this is a really good way to do it. Okay. So it's not your their truth or your truth. It, you don't know that your truth is closer to the truth than their truth. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to understand what the truth is, you have to try to approach it from all the different angles. It's like looking at, you know, have you heard this this tale of the, the blind men and the elephant? No. Oh, this is a good one, bro. This is like, this is a learning thing you learn about like, this is why I have a problem with the prescriptions and the generalizations. Because to get to objective truth, we have to be open that someone else has the truth other than us. Like, to get to um, objective truth, whatever that might mean, whether we have access to it or not, it has to start with us thinking someone else has an answer we don't have. So if we think like, no, that's not the answer, like the way you're living doesn't make sense. Yes, I agree. Like your truth, my truth, that comes down to like lifestyle and what we should do. But this objective truth that exists, most people aren't going to have access to it. The ego tells you you can have access to it, especially at 25 years old, right? The ego tells you you could know objective truth because, oh, you know, I looked up the studies and I'm like pretty logical. You know, I, I read like tons of articles and like, uh, you know, I really look things up and uh, I try really hard to like challenge my point of view. And like when someone says something, I try to integrate it and like think, oh, yeah, like how did they come to that conclusion? Uh, blah, 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 blah. You think you're 25 and you have objective truth? You think you're 30 and have objective truth? You think you're 50 and have objective truth? For what? The universe? Or just like if your farts smell? What are you talking about? Sorry, that was crude. That was such a boy, like, <laughs> but like literally what? I'm not even sure we're going to touch objective truth, like real objective, not perceived objective. Most of what we know about the world is perceived. Even science is recontextualizing their facts all the time, which is good and reasonable. That's what science is for. But like, I am so excited that, you know, people want the one truth. But the one truth you think is in a religion that we know the history and start of that involves a pretty shady start? Hello? You think you're connecting yourself to a relationship with God in which you hear voices? Like, maybe there's a God and maybe you're talking to one. But then you'd have to say out loud, I hear voices in my head. And I don't think Sneeko would ever say that. He'd just like, I know there's a God. Okay. But if a queer person told you or a gender fluid person told you, I, I, I know my gender is different. How, how do you know that? I just know it. That's not good enough. But I'm supposed to believe you can hear God. Hello? Hello? But I understand the desire to want the truth. That's the first and foremost, the most interesting thing. Because the truth is like we don't know. But the journey to finding out is going to last all of our lifetimes, which is kind of exciting. We'll never be bored again, you know? <sighs> so like four blind people touch different parts of the elephant and they make conclusions about what it is. Mm. So one person. So um, Shadowboxer says, I just wanted, I just watched something that was saying Sneeko was um, fucking with Dr. K deliberately saying what he thought Dr. K wanted to hear. I hope this isn't true. Uh, that's what Sneeko does though. Everyone Sneeko talks to that he somewhat like respects or wants to talk to, he does that with me too. Like I knew he was doing it with me sometimes too. And I always thought it was pretty funny. It's just what teenagers do. Teenagers always do that. That's what I mean. The assessment's still true. You can, f teenagers can fuck with their parents or adults around them all the time, but like it's still for attention. Fucking with adults is seeking attention. That's why it doesn't matter. Like, that's why I think it was funny when Sneeko would like fuck with me and he'd be like, I'm just get like, yeah, like I, I know he would tell me things he thought I wanted to hear, which I thought was funny. I was a kid too, bro. I know what it is. Like, it's just being a kid. Like, that's what I'm saying. He's a kid. Only other kids try to tell people what they want to hear. Adults don't do this. Adults play strategic social games at most, but they don't literally like Sneeko's a teenager. It is performative. That's what I'm saying. That makes sense. Him fucking with Dr. K is just cute. As if Dr. K doesn't know. 
Like as if Dr. K doesn't know he's like performing. He knows that. And he also knows when he's being sort of real, when he's not being sort of real. Right? I don't know why you have so much sympathy for Sneeko. What's my bias? I can I can understand and see certain people better than others. I can understand and see him in a way that makes sense to me. Everything he does makes sense to me. It's disappointing sometimes, but it also makes sense to me, right? And I could have probably predicted a lot of his actions. But yeah, I just see some people better than others. One person touches an ear and it's like, this is a leaf. Mm -hmm. So one of the really interesting things is that, and I, I think you're quite insightful and you're, you're quite a critical thinker. And it seems like you've accessed some dimension of spiritual knowledge, which is also quite potent. So I'm not trying to downplay anything that you've learned. Okay. And at the same time, knowing people as well as I know them, and maybe I don't know you. Selena says, is he questioning or just allowing for possibilities? Dr. K or Sneeko? Um, I, I think you will gain a lot if you really try to understand and set aside your own beliefs and really try to understand their perspective. Because I get the sense that you listen, but I do also get the sense that your mind is very automatic with like counter arguments. The thoughts pop up instantly. Yeah, that's normal. I think you're just going to get more. And it's not about, I'm not talking about woke, like, oh, everyone has their truth. Like, I think there's truth to that statement, but I'm, that's not what I'm alluding to. What I'm saying is this. Oh, Sneeko. I think he's, he's just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. Sneeko has no idea. He wants one truth. He wants the confidence of that one truth, which is, by the way, pretty normal. Sneeko is pretty normal. He's doing the normal religious journey, right? Um, but I think he's throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks and he's testing everyone and he's shit testing everyone and he's poking authority figures and he's saying, do you have the answer? 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 But he's obviously going to be wrong for a long time until he's right. And that takes a long time. And most of us are going to be wrong still for the, like, I'll be wrong a lot for the rest of my life. And it's just a matter of him figuring out. I think again, he will take him five to seven to eight years to really transform into a person that grows from all the information he's collecting. Neurodivergent people tend to be a little slower in development and he's a boy and men don't feel like men until about 35 in the US generally. So we'll see. Simply that you're a flawed human being and everybody else is a flawed human being. And if you try to understand, really try to sit in someone else's shoes and understand their perspective, that you will have an enriched understanding of the world. And my experience has been the more people whose perspectives I am. And by the way, you know how Sneeko says, I want to find the one truth. The reason four is so devastating is because like, you might find out that you don't have access to it. That it will be, that what if you don't have access to that objective truth? And then everything we believe is just all rooted in belief. Every bubble, every belief system we're having is just a play on perception and how we decide to engage with reality. Right? That's what's so freaky. That's why I'm wondering if he is actually a four who is pretending to be a two so he can like double down. Because I know a four who's doing that right now. Um, They're like trying to be a two and they're going kind of on similar -ish journeys a bit, but not really, but kind of, mm, sort of, not really, um, but kind of, uh, close enough. And it's interesting to see them double down on like certain bubbles. I'm like, why that bubble, bro? Like why the God bubble, you know? Why do they choose the God bubble? Who's the easiest thing that makes them feel sh sure that maybe if I go back to this bubble, it'll be objective. Or maybe he's a three who's going back to a bubble. Or maybe he's a four who's trying to double down on a bubble, but it's not working. But I think in like five to seven years, you know what I mean? Understand. We'll see a change. The closer I get to that common truth, because it's the part that everyone agrees about that is the closest to the truth. I hate that definition of objective. That's a logical assumption, but that's... I hate that definition of objective. That's the furthest from objective objective I've ever heard in my life. In my experience, so just something to think about. That's what people think objective is in a societal concept, but it's like so far from what I'm saying is object. I mean, objective, whether we think it is a real or not outside of us. But since everything is our perception, will we ever have access to the things that are outside of us? Do you ever go to therapy? 
do I ever go to therapy? I have done therapy for about 8 to 12 weeks in my life. A last thing I want to ask you, like a lot of people in the chat are asking, um, how do they get, how do they overcome porn addiction or masturbation addiction? It's a great question. Um, a couple of things. One is we've got a bunch of resources about that. If people are interested, like I'll do like lectures and stuff on porn addiction. So Gong, <laughs> Gong says the way you talk about most of the way you talk most of the time sounds like you think you know the truth. I know that I don't know. And I'm very confident about that. I'm very confident that I don't know. And I'm very confident that you don't either. Right? It's like the same way Sneeko talks. Like I talk very harshly and I'm very confident because it's very easy to be confident about not knowing something and still feel good about it. People don't believe me though because they're so insecure about not knowing that they would never believe I could be confident in not knowing. But finding out that I didn't know was the most like, relief I the most relief I felt in my whole life because I was like Sneeko thinking oh my god I have to find the answer but yeah I think there is an objective okay let's finish out the stream bros we have stuff on that on YouTube but I'll I'll answer now in kind of a quick way so here's what we have to understand about porn addiction any addiction exists because of two things when an activity gives us pleasure and takes away pain we have the capacity <laughs> The chat on Sneeko's chat is like, who asked that? Nobody asked that. Why is Sneeko asking that? <laughs> that he become addicted to it. Ooh. If you really look at addiction, there is a cycle. Okay, do we care about this part where he talks about masturbation and addiction? Because I don't really care. Any other thoughts or questions before we wrap Sneeko up for the day? Spoons. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. There's a good, good conversation. I need to like listen to... Oof. Yeah, yeah, your your energy has changed over the course of the conversation. I, I I appreciate everything that you put into it. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. I can see that you actually uh, appreciate your attention and focus on this. Yeah, take care, man. Good luck. All right. I hope to see you again and, soon. Yeah, man. Take care. Inshallah. All right. Salam alaikum. Literally, Sneeko's out of spoons, bro. I wish he had the language to be like, "Hey, I'm out of spoons." <clears throat> great video. Uh, just great video. Great interview, Dr. K, so fire, bro. Content's fire, bro. And I just, you know, I want people to have a space. I know it's not everyone. Listen, you don't have to have patience or grace for everybody. I certainly don't. But Sneeko, I have so much patience for him because he's not my competition. He's not fighting me. He's not making me out to be a, he's certainly not slandering me. Augustine says, I'm curious to see what the next phase is gonna be. Me too. Yeah, I'm really curious what the next phase will be. Um, we'll see. Cause I don't really watch Sneeko content. Like I don't watch, you know, I don't watch people unless I'm like, uh, more engaged with them. I think unless I like Sneeko content's not for me. So like, I, I don't watch it, but I'm glad I watched this. That's really exciting. I didn't know it had happened. So thanks for sending that guys. I really appreciate it. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Da 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 da